Welcome to conference on healthy longevity. I will first speak a few words about healthy longevity, just for a short introduction, and then I will introduce the conference. And after me, the first speaker, Ene Kuscher, um, will have Slovenian uh, lecture um, following me. So, briefly, what is healthy longevity? It doesn't mean to be um, suffering um, age-related diseases for a long time. It means to be healthy, to have energy, and to uh, overcome the biological process of aging with the help of rejuvenation and regeneration. So healthy life lifestyle, as we know it today, is surely a starting point. But we need the progress in science and technology to move the field forward to much bigger heights. Why is healthy longevity important? Firstly, it will give us much more healthy, energetic and vital life. It will help society um, in a broader sense to have uh, members of society who are healthy and can accumulate wisdom for a long period of time. It will help us fight suffering and tragedy of death. But it doesn't involve only academia, economy and politics, but in the end it involves every one of us. So here is the conference timeline. You can see in the first hour we have two Slovi le uh, lectures in Slovene language. And then um, at 3.30, um, Professor Steven Minger will continue in English. And then we have English lectures um, till 9 and 15. After that, we'll have one hour of roundtable in Slovene language. The conference in, is organized by um, Society for Vital Life Extension of Slovenia, a non-profit, non-governmental organization, and Longevity Forum, Czech organization, who also shares the same goals as Slovenian organization. We are thank thankful to the European Union, co who co-founded our conference and um, our work through Erasmus Plus program, and we are helpful Josef Stefan Institute for this venue and Information Society for support of this conference. And lastly, I wish to thank all the volunteers here. Here are the pictures of them. Um, and I kindly ask you for applause for all of them who worked hard to make this happen. Thank you very much. And then um, we have, uh, OK, uh, Victor. Uh, from Czech Republic, who will give you a few remarks um, in um, from Czech Republic. Just that I. Uh... Hello, can you hear me? Just one question. Uh, uh, Victor, Victor, we, we can, can hear you. you. We can Perfect. hear you. Perfect. Thank you very much. So, thank you, Martin, for uh, overall introduction. Details. Everything is okay with me. Can I go ahead? go ahead? Yes, yes now we can hear you. Yes. Perfect, perfect, perfect. So, uh, hello and uh, welcome to the conference on healthy longevity uh, in Ljubljana and also from online streaming. Uh, my name is Victor, Victor Holy, and uh, I am uh, one of the co-founders of longevityforum.eu, which is actually a platform that aims to erase or raise awareness uh, and educate the public about the science and practice of healthy life extension, uh, primarily in Czech Republic. And uh, I'm very, very honored and excited to be here today uh, together with our co-organizers from Society for Vital Life Extension of Slovenia and uh, also our distinguished speakers and guests uh, from various, various fields and countries. Uh, so we are now living in a time of unprecedented scientific and technological, technological progress, which offers us new possibilities and uh, challenges as well uh, for improving the quality and, and quantity of our lives. We are witnessing uh, breakthroughs in biotechnology, artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, regenerative medicine, and many other areas that have the potential to transfer our health, well-being, and healthy longevity. However, we also face many obstacles and uncertainties such as ethical, social, economical, or economic and environmental issues that require careful consideration and dialogue. 
That is actually why we have organized this conference to, to bring together experts, innovators, policymakers, and enthusiasts who share a common vision of, I would say, sustainable future, where aging uh, is no longer a burden, but an opportunity. A future where we can live longer and better with dignity and purpose. A future where we can enjoy the benefits of our extended lifespans without compromising the well-being of others or the planet. So we have prepared a rich and diverse program for you, covering topics such as biological and medical aspects of aging, longevity interventions and therapies, social ethical implications of uh, life extension, and the longevity economic, uh, economy and innovation, as well as uh, longevity education and more. We have invited some of the most prominent and influential figures in the field of health and longevity. And uh, we hope that this conference will inspire you to learn more about the fascinating topic of healthy longevity, to exchange ideas and opinions with other participants, to network and collaborate with potential partners, and to take action to make a positive difference uh, in your own life and in the world. So thank you for the attention and the interest. And if you have any questions or suggestions, uh, please feel free to contact us as a longevity forum that uh, you and uh, have a great day and stay healthy. Thank you very much, Victor, uh, for this introduction speech. Um, and now I'm very glad to invite uh, Enei Kuscher, a wonderful Slovenian uh, uh, entrepreneur and scientist, and he has a very good scientific education, and he will give us one very interesting lecture. Enei, the floor is yours. Okay, so half of the presentation will be broken because uh, the computer doesn't su support the fonts. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, I'll stay with English just because I saw there's quite a bit of people uh, um, that are not Slovenian native, so let's just give the whole presentation in English. Um, yeah, my talk was um, to kind of try to paint the picture a little bit in terms of where we are uh, in terms of this journey from um, you know the current state of health towards really the precision health and longevity, and what's the evidence based behind uh, you know the interventions to prolong health span and lifespan. Um, so. I'm not going to go into you know details about the stuff because we're all very familiar with this with, let's say the principles of of the aging it's been a, a big talk it's becoming a big part of the public awareness but just to kind of remind ourselves you know there is um, now a unified language that we start to use a terminology called hallmarks of aging whether you know we call these 12 hallmark 12 hallmarks or 14 hallmarks and so on doesn't really matter but they they really paint the picture of defining principles of the way the way cells tend to age through time and these are driven by either intrinsic drivers which are determined by your genetics your epigenetics your microbiome and so on as well as by e extrinsic drivers so what's actually happening around us so lifestyle environment diet stress and so on yeah and um, what is really fascinating is that um, the cells have really this innate ability to repair and recycle. And, and uh, a huge part of our genome is actually dedicated to, you know, protein refolding, repair, recycling, you know, the whole organelle repair, recycling. The whole cells then kind of, you know, have a program suicide and death if they, if they malfunction. Um, but the aging itself is kind of a progressive decline in this ability to repair. And that leads to kind of an accumulation of damage, uh, frailty, loss of function, and so on, yeah? What is also interesting is that the hallmarks of aging are quite universal across all range of, of, of species from, you know, uh, yeast cells onwards or even bacteria. Um, but they are um, at the same time very, very um, uniquely affected by, like I said, the intrinsic drivers, the extrinsic drivers and so on. So even within the same species as us humans, we tend to you know, kind of uh, decline in very different directions. So some people then eventually uh, lead to cancer, some go to, towards neurodegeneration, cardiovascular, dementia, and so on, yeah? Um, but maybe the important message of the last decade of research is that a lot of this decline is not just a one-way street, as we used to think. Uh, so a lot of these repair mechanisms can be restarted, can be, you know, reignited, senescent cells can be recycled, repaired, and so on. Yeah? So there's a, a big now 
let's say, push of, of the academic uh, space as well as the industry to figure out how to restart these this cellular mechanisms and help cells to kind of re, let's say, re-engage a lot of the intrinsic repair mechanisms that are already within us. Another term that is good to kind of be aware of as we go through these, uh, these discussions is the, the, you know, terms that are, again, now becoming a very big part of the public awareness is the chronological versus biological age, right? And so we all know that chronological age is basically the, you know, the how many times the Earth has gone around the sun since we were born, uh, whereas the biological age really is uh, sort of uh, a, you know, a physiological and, and, and uh, psychological um, state of our being. So in, let's say, the, let's say very, very clean definition, that's a level of age-dependent molecular and cellular damage. Uh, but in reality, it's sort of how you are compared to the average or the mean of the population that has the similar state of biology as you are. So you can be biologically much more fit and younger, or you can be biologically much more frail and older than your peers. Now, the whole story about this health span and lifespan is how we can potentially change this curve of biological age, right? So we all start, you know, at birth, very, you know, kind of equally, we are, you know, biological tends to be the same as chronological. And then very soon through time, we start accumulating damage. And so people start getting obese, people get chronic stress and so on. So their function starts declining, they get more and more frail. And then we try, we, we, with the current medicine, which we now tend to sometimes, you know, semi-joke about it as being the, the, the kind of the industry of sick care, we, we, we treat sick and we tend to keep sick people for in a chronic state for a very long. So we keep, we, we, we've done a lot to, to extend the lifespan, but not really that much to extend the health span, right? So what is happening is the, the CDC, so Center for Disease Control's last statistic is that the average onset of age-related chronic illness and disease in the Western world, so Europe and US mainly and so on, is 51, right? Whereas our expected lifespan at the moment is roughly 87, 89. Right, which means that we live, an average person in the Western world lives 30 to 40 years in a state of disease and illness. And it is just, this is, this is something that is, in, in, in my opinion, completely unacceptable. And of course, this is the journey, we, which is what we're trying to do with, with this uh, uh, whole movement of, you know, let's say longevity industry. It's not that much yet about living 150 or 180 and so on and so forth, right? But it's really about how can we live longer, younger. Right? So how can we extend that health span before we start that chronic illness? And this is really very nicely exemplified by, the, by that you know, graph below, is that you know, the expected total lifespan, whether we can go in a maximum from the current record of 120 something to maybe 130 something or whatever, it doesn't really matter that much. What we want to achieve is most people reaching their 90s or even centenarian stage in a very, very good healthy state. Yeah? Uh, so the health span is really not just about adding years to life, but adding life to years. That's really the, kind of the main message. Uh, but of course, it is important we're starting to kind of align on, on the messaging, on the language that we use, on the, on the uh, you know, uh, communication that is being adopted. Yeah? So what, what we're trying to do very heavily here is, is how can we convert health risks uh, and the loss of quality life years uh, to, you know, kind of uh, a, a, a some, some way of um, uh, a measurement system. Yeah? So there are now uh, numbers like qualis popping about, which is a quality adjusted life years and so on. So, and, of, and, and of course, then the, the, the biological age clocks, which are also trying to assess what is, uh, uh, what is you know, um, happening in terms of your biological function. Uh, also, the other part, which you know, here I've, I've just thrown a paper here, is what we, we just published recently. Um, you know, also in terms of personalization, this is a, you know a work done by our group that, that is trying to see how uh, we failed to look into the depth of evidence of you know different types of interventions that were used in the past that were either effective or ineffective, but were ne were not really looking into uh, personalization matters in terms of uh, you know genome. Uh, ethnicity or sex, yeah, and it's a huge impact in terms of 
uh, uh, impact on you know cancer longevity and so on. Yeah. So translating translating these uh, you know scoring systems, these uh, longevity markers and so on, from you know uh, looking into either uh, univariable and multivariable uh, uh, assessments, you know uh, health risks versus you know life years lost and so and so on, and looking into whether these are uh, you know, uh, independent or additive uh, aspects, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah? Uh, so what the field is now trying to do, and sorry for the long introduction, but I'm really trying to just establish like, you know, what, what is very important as we try as, as, as both the industry and academia and, uh, uh, you know, policymakers and so on, move into the kind of the next phase of, let's say, the future of health is really very important we, we align and agree on the terminology, right? So what are we actually measuring? What are we actually trying to achieve here, right? So there's been a huge amount of work done in terms of uh, determining what, what are biological age clocks. How can we validate uh, the approach to assessment of these biological age versus you know, chronological? How does that correlate to health risks and to kind of life expectancy and so on, right? And so what many people don't really realize and they, you know, they say, oh, my biological age is such and such, right? They've thrown a blood data into some AI engine on the internet and they got a, a, you know, a number. That really doesn't tell us anything. So what is really important is that you know, our systems are very, very complex, right? And so when we think about biological age, it is, it's a very, very complex mixture of things related to what is happening in our blood acutely, things that are happening in our blood chronically, things that are happening in our gut microbiome, things that are happening within our epigenome, things that are, that are happening to our skin that are happening. So, so there's all these sorts of things to our, our muscle composition, our bone mineral density and so on, right? So what we're trying to do is really understand the complexity and totality of the biological state of a human being and then kind of weigh and adjust and understand how each of these is contributing to your overall kind of health and wellness um, and, and, of course, overall the health risk as well. Um, so we try to really kind of, you know, this is uh, here to the right is a kind of an image from, from uh, let's say, a, a way of... of uh, you know, approaching the, the age clocks uh, in, a, in a platform that we developed uh, called New, uh, which is also trying to really use this kind of, you know, uh, um, uh, informative or, or explainable AI uh, learning models to, to really know what is driving, which biomarkers, which, you know, units are actually driving certain biological age to be either older or, or younger. Uh, now, we, we're, when I'm talking about biomarkers of aging, again, it's a terminology that we need to all align on and understand, right? Because there's so many different biomarkers. There's the mole molecular biomarkers of aging, which is, you know, we can call them like the epigenetic changes or the uh, glycan glycation, you know, or proteomics and so on, right? Uh, then there's the functional medicine, you know, the bone mineral density, the, the, uh, the muscle composition, the, the you know performance, physical, mental, and so on, right? Then there's the digital the, uh, uh, aspects of it. We have now all kinds of wearables, both invasive, non-invasive, you know, from Auras and Apple Watches to continuous glucose monitors and so on. So each each one of these is able to kind of analyze and understand where a body is compared to its peers, right? And so determine, let's say, in a sort of an assessment of biological age of that body. Now, there is also very important to be, to kind of appreciate that some biomarkers um, can be correlated, so they can be either predict predictive or prognostic, uh, they can be correlated with age, right, but they are not necessarily, the, you know, we don't really know always whether they are also causal or consequential, right, and so what is very important for us as we're thinking about interventions for longevity is that we know how to actually impact those biomarkers that can be, um, you know, of course, many, very often we try to address consequential items like we've been doing with Alzheimer, doing, you know, uh, trying to clean up the, the uh, amyloid plaques and so on, right? But what we really want to address is the causative agents, right? So, so to really address the biomarkers that are causative to aging processes and decline and then be able to find interventions that address them. And of course, a way to do that is to really, you know, understand the system's biology, right? So, again, a, a big problem of, of, of the health industry to date was that it was really uh, trying to, uh, to approach things in a very siloed way, right? So we were doing either single 
uh, you know, drug target interactions, single, single targets, single molecules, single pathways, and so on, right? Uh, we're looking, even in terms of the analysis, we're looking just at, you know, blood analysis and trying to kind of understand everything from that, or we're doing genome analysis and trying to paint the whole picture of, of tomorrow. But we know from identical twin studies, the genome is just a very small br blueprint of who you could be. Right, but you take a couch potato versus an athletic, uh, athletic, you know, uh, vegan, you know, uh, well-performing person. Both are identical twins, live 20, 30, 40 years. They will be completely different biologies by then, right? So we really need to try to address, uh, you know, health from a systemic perspective: genome, epigenome, microbiome, telomeres, but but also the physiome. So the entire aspect of our physiology. And lately, people are starting to become more and more aware of our exposome, and this is actually our environment, the diet, the water, the air, the mental state, the family, the, the office, the co-workers, the socials, you know, and then so on. So everything we're exposed to as a living being, right? Uh, interestingly, near Barzilai studies on centenarians show that a huge part of why centenarians have been so well lived in the blue zones was because their exposome is amazing. They are well appreciated part of the society. They are contributing. They are having, you know, uh, you know, the, 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 that that um, uh, you know, chronic stress, and then also kind of the, the rejection of the elderly and so on is is almost non-existent in in the areas of Okinawa or Sicily and so on, right? So the, that that's a really a very important part that we tend to very much neglect as a, as a medicine. Uh, or as a, you know, as, let's say a, a health study. And so where we try to go now again with this kind of longevity approaches is, you know, the current state of, of medical field or, or, or drug development has been to try to really treat diseases. So we first had to have a disease that develops that has a, a you know, an NIH, uh, uh, um, uh, oh no, sorry, the, an, an FDA uh, type classification and so on. So it's a disease of such and such. Then we can develop a drug for that that can be a, an approved and so on. We can have medicine, we can have reimbursements and so on, and we treat diseases, right? Now, it's been a, a, a significant shift over the last couple of decades, I would say, in trying to prevent diseases, right? So we try to do a lot of diagnostics. We try to do a lot of... So we're looking at things where, where eventually a patient starts showing symptoms, but he's not yet in a disease state, right? But what we really try to do with longevity approach is to delay the upstream effects of this onset of diseases, right? So something that reduces the chronic inflammation, that reduces the oxidative stress, that reduces the mitochondrial dysfunction and so on, and gets rid of the uh, cellular senescence. Um, and, and it's really been, you know, the field has been exploding over the last, like I said, the last decade or two, and it's really, you know, it's, it's, it's very important, but at the same time, I, I do think it's important also we are, we try to not get into a bubble, right? Because it might, hurt the, the industry in the long run. I, I do think that the, the, there is enough very, very fundamental and strong science uh, that probably there will be bubbles, but, but, but we are, as a humanity and society, are going in a very good direction towards preventive health, towards really healthcare being treating people healthy rather than, uh, uh, and, and so I think that, that, that we're in a very, a very good, uh, let's say, um, space. Uh, sorry for the broken fonts. So. You know, I'll, I'll say a few words about, you know, what we do at NU because I think, again, it's, it's trying to paint the picture of this holistic approach. But it's really, you know, what, what, what we believe is, um, you know, is that we are now entering an era where we start treating, you know, this, you know, where this chronic disease and loss of function and premature quality of life years, right, are no longer treated as inevitable part of aging, right? You just say, well, you know, I feel, uh, I'm just, you know, 60, 70, whatever, I'm just old. No, there's, you know, so much we can do to keep that from, you know, happening. So a paradigm shift in health and well-being from this, from, from sick care to what's really this preventive, personalized, and regenerative health and longevity, yeah? Um, and, and I think it's summarized in this slide is we go from kind of, you know, symptoms-based approach towards understanding really the root cause using, you know, system, uh, systems biology. From temporal and reactive, you know, so from waiting for somebody to, to get sick to being continuous and preventive. Uh, from this one-size-fits-all, generic, you know, let's give the first statin and see if it works, to really going towards personalized precision uh, medicine and intervention. Uh, and really to go from that normal, what is expected of an average 70-year-old, to going towards optimal. What can really we give the, the cell to perform at its optimal state in any phase of life? 
Uh, interestingly, again, the font is broken, but you know the X Prize, which was kind of the the, the trigger for eventual kind of you know space uh, exploration, you know from from uh, Jeff Bezos's uh, Blue Origin to Elon Musk's SpaceX, etc., started with an X Prize, right? And so many amazing things started with you know a, a crazy uh, uh, moonshot idea X Prize uh, uh, launch, right? And now X Prize Foundation has just announced they will be. Uh, uh, opening a hundred and something million uh, prize for the first, uh, you know, longevity intervention that shows, uh, you know, rejuvenating, et cetera, et cetera. So what I'm saying is, it, it, you know, the movement is really happening in a big, in a big way in terms of, of this, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, I would say paradigm shift in the way we, we think as a society on, on, on you know, where health, uh, healthcare is going. And at the same time, you know, this, this um, uh, field is, is come kind of being enabled by the combination of both, you know, AI, big data, machine learning that we've seen, the multi-omics becoming incredibly affordable, biological age clocks are, you know, becoming a term that we're starting to appreciate. Uh, just crazy amount of innovation in terms of wearables. So we, we now all wear, you know, our Aura rings, our Apple watches, our continuous glucose monitors. We're kind of continuously, you know, data uh, analyzed beings that we can see everything that happens way before anything serious uh, can start evolving, right? So with health and diagnostics and so on, we're really coming into a stage of regenerative medicine, yeah? And it's a kind of a, a continuous lifelong journey, right? So it's on one hand side, first, of course, it's, it's a deep analysis of ourselves. We really need to know, you know, what's going, going on with our bodies in terms of multi-omics testing, in terms of, you know, wearables, digital twins and so on. And then really starting to do, you know, habit changing that are, you know, encouraging uh, the body to go into, in towards uh, more, you know, uh, healthy, um, let's say, lifestyle, right? But then, you know, as we keep progressing, we keep monitoring, uh, you know, the trends, we keep monitoring the biomarkers, we keep monitoring the improvements, right? So it's really about a li lifelong journey on, on, on making sure that we catch any decline or any uh, inappropriate, uh, let's say, uh, development of, of our biology way before it actually becomes a disease. Yeah. Um, so again, just, you know, uh, it's a, 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 a slow uh, animation, but the, the idea here is really, you know, understanding as much as possible in terms of, of the uh, analysis of our body. So from, you know, uh, biological testing, wearables, uh, MRIs, you know, uh, DEXA scans and so on, and then really trying to understand holistically what's going on in order to make, you know, the right style kind of in, uh, recommendations, insights, uh, and habit changes. Um, you know, then, you know, whether this goes into towards optimization of your nutrition, diets, uh, you know, sleeping patterns and so on, reducing your you know, fatigue, inflammation, et cetera. So across the board, it's really about, you know, taking a systemic and informed approach towards health optimization. And um, here's a slide I, I put together that, you know, kind of, uh, to me is, you know, we have some, some, some politics here in the room as well. Um, I, th I think it's really trying to look into where a longevity nation could, could go in the future, right? So imagine, imagine in kind of a future nation that really looks into kind of an integrated health, uh, uh, you know, precision or, or preventive health approach to society. And so something that I've, I've actually, you know, uh, become aware as I attended a few of these conferences in the last year is that even the doctors themselves are saying like, you know, even our education currently is not yet suited for this type of, of, of direction because even us as a doctor, I'm not trained as a longevity doctor, right? Uh, and, and so how do I train to drive this preventive precision and so on care versus I'm, I'm actually, you know, doing my rounds as, as acute and, and uh, how do you say, uh, uh, um, you know, um, um, let's say more, more reactive care, yeah? Uh, so it's, it's anywhere from, from education towards workplace initiatives and so on, going towards, you know, precision health, medical care, you know, precision food and smart food deliveries, cognitive uh, performance and so on. But then of course, on the other side, of course, elderly care, lifestyle advice and so on, yeah? So it's really trying to kind of look systemically how we can envisage a nation state that really looks and takes care of, of health of its citizens in the best possible way 
um, that also I, I think at the end of the day, you know, uh, boosts the, the overall kind of productivity and wellness and so on, yeah. Um, so maybe the last, I think is the last uh, slide. Uh, this one is a little bit more futuristic, um, but I do, you know, I am excited, you know. So while we talk about health span, we are talking about the, the measurables and the biomarkers and the age clocks and so on. Everything I've said so far was very down to earth in reality, you know, eat well, monitor, be preventive, you know, take good care of yourself, etc. right? But at the same time, you know, there is just amazing amount of stuff now happening in the research and in the lab as well that is literally, you know, around the corner in terms of, you know, coming into also clinics and, and reality. So if we're, if we're thinking about, you know, more or less imminent technologies that are already kind of translating today is, you know, precision, precision personalized medicine, gerotherapeutics, stem cell therapies, cell replacement therapies and so on. This is already now adopted in the clinics in terms of, you know, individual kind of uh, 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 ther uh, therapies. But then, you know, near-term futures, you know, we're now doing reprogramming of mice using uh, Yamanaka factors, gene therapies, organ replacement, 3D organs. I mean, we've just recently printed a whole 3D heart from a skin de-differentiated cells and, and make it, uh, you know, a, a beating heart again in the lab, right? So it's really, you know, a, a very, very, uh, something that used to be, you know, Star Trek style material 20 years ago is now already in the labs reality on, on, on animal studies. So 20, 30 years into the future, that is really becoming a reality for the rest of us. So, so, so my last slide of the talk is as, 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 as crazy as it may sound, you know, we've, we've been thinking that that fountain of use for millennia since, you know, the ancient Chinese and Persians and so on, but so much interesting is now really happening in this, in this current day and age that right now I think the message is, you know, you have one body, one vehicle for life. And the better you maintain it, maintain it the longer it will serve you well, well that we know forever. But now with the longevity revolution really happening, I think this may be more relevant really than, than ever before. Yeah, so that's kind of, thank you so much. Thank you very much, and I, uh, this was a fantastic lecture. And now, um, for the audience, um, and I, if you can wait there, please, for the audience, if anyone has some questions, or also on the Zoom, if anyone can, has questions, uh, he or she can ask on the Zoom chat, and Patrick will read them. So first, uh, in the lecture hall, anyone has a question? Uh, no, in the Zoom? Um, All clear. Okay, so um, I You're will ask a question, uh, Ene. Um, how far is the technology of digital twin uh, already developed? Is it in the starting phase or is it already functioning and um, available? Yeah, I mean, uh, of course, these are these are different concepts, right? So, so at new we've developed a digital twin concept. Yeah, so it's basically a fully functional. You kind of you know zoom in and out depending on your organ systems. You're seeing all the contributing genes and the gut microbes and you know the the blood biomarkers and so on. Um, but this is an ever evolving, right? So you know, I, I just recently saw an interview between. Uh, uh, Lex Friedman and Ma Mark Zuckerberg in the metaverse, right? And it was just insane, right? So I, I imagine right now our digital twin is basically you're zooming in and out of your, you know, iPhone or iPad or whatever, and you're interacting with your bio biology data. Uh, but very soon you'll, you know, you'll be in the metaverse, zooming in and out of your body like that, and just, you know, in in engaging with your organs and, you know, like. I don't know, I mean, you know, is, is it maybe like a, an ayahuasca journey where somebody goes deep into himself and find the root cause of his stress and here you will go deep down into your biology and find really what's driving your chronic inflammation, right? So, I mean, right now the technology is already there. I mean, you know, uh, New has a, you know, has a digital twin platform. I'm sure there are other companies out there that, that have the same. Um, but it's, 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 it's a really an exploding, you know, field of research. I think that is, you know, maybe if I can comment in that way, you know, to us as we were kind of de developing this systems biology-based approach was really the challenge, how can vi we visualize data, right? And as scientists, we were always used to graphs and bars and charts and, you know, tables and so on, but that's really so, in a way, unfriendly, but also, again, very vertical-oriented, right? So to me, it was really, can we recreate something that I understand myself in 
almost as complex way as I am myself, right? So when I look into my, you know, liver, my liver is a contribution between, you know, my, my genetics in there, but also how I've been feeding it over the last, you know, several months and how I've been stressing it and have I been drinking alcohol or, you know, too much coffee and not enough hydration and so on. So it's really a very, you know, what are my gut microbes contributing to it? Is there a lot of, you know, short chain fatty acids coming from my, you know, blautias and so on, right? So it's a very, very complex story. And, and in a way, if I can envisage it through a, let's say, digital twins concept, it's almost like a biological uh, uh, copy, then it becomes a much more approachable data interpretation in my mind, yeah. That's great. Um, so looking forward to development and further development of digital twins. And thank you very much, Anay Kuscher. I appreciate it. Appreciate it. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. You mentioned um, measurements many times in your speech, and one of the first things we are taught in medicine is to never run a test if it doesn't change what we do regardless of the outcome. And with the prevalence of, or with the chances of getting a false positive or false negative, uh, what I mean to ask is that with individuals who already have a healthy or health-promoting lifestyle, is the measurements like continuous glucose monitors or aura rings also necessary? So, in my opinion, absolutely, right? So again, it depends on, on what you want to do and what do you want to achieve, right? Um, if you would just want to have that regular, steady, healthy life and steady, healthy decline, then it's fine, right? But if you really want to give your body its optimum, um, then, without knowing what's going in in your body you're really working on a blind partly placebo and part, partly generic recommendation right every person has a, a unique combination of its genetic fundamentals its gut microbiome composition its epigenetic alterations and so on right so even if i've been very mindful of my diet and you know of exercise and so on right i even try to meditate every now and then right when i wear a continuous glucose monitor and I go through a period of three weeks of just measuring of what I eat on a day-to-day -day ba basis, and I go you know, through an airport and pick up a, bo a box of sushi and my glucose spikes, right? Uh, it, it is also variable because it, my gut microbiome composition changes through time. So if I really want to optimize my glucose not to be spiking, my, you know, my HRV to be really steady state, right? So my nightly recovery cycles, my deep sleep to be long and deep and REM sleep to be kind of, you know, so if I really want to make sure that my body is recovered as effectively as possible every single day, right? And I'm not accumulating that chronic stress, then I need measurables. And again, I think that that is maybe, if I, if I may, one comment, right? That is, I think, the biggest problem of most of today's health approach is if you're not sick, why bother, right? Our bodies has huge, have huge amounts of buffer capacity to take damage, right? So we can have many sleepless nights. We have many nights of just poor, you know, uh, uh, poor hydration. Uh, stress and so on and you know maybe you say well I'll sleep over the weekend and so on years after years after years and I'm still fine I'm still not sick but that chronic damage accumulates I can tell you from my epigenome analysis I can see the periods of my life when I've been sleeping for five hours a night for years during my university and early startup years right I don't I hardly ever break the you know seven to eight hour rule uh, uh, you know uh, rule anymore because I've seen how much damage I've done to my epigenetic chain, uh, epigenome on the clock cycle genes. So, so measuring that, you know how your body responds to it, right? And also in terms of not just the wearables, but even the, the, the you know, the blood, the microbiome, so on. Even if, if you're happy, you're starting to watch your trends through time. And so when something does go wrong, you really know your history, your evolution of the bi biology that was within you, right? So even as a medical practitioner later, if you have a, 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 a patient coming to you with all that wealth of data, right? You know, oh, two years ago, something started to happen, right? So even though he was, he was healthy, I can now do a much smarter intervention because I see that data. So that's my position, but of course, different opinions. Thank you very much. Yep. There is one more question from yeah. Zoom. Yeah, let's be quick. 
Yep. So the questions go. The question goes: uh, What is the best method to test the bio age, according to you? <laughs> like I said earlier, th there are really so many. There are really so many. Yeah. So so right now, I think the most validated are kind of a combination of epigenome, blood and gut microbiome. These are really kind of three very solid markers. We're working very hard on, you know, different types of, you know, physiological uh, uh, and, and, and biomarker based, you know, glycan H is a very good one as well, et cetera, right? But I would say right now, you know, the most solid evidence, I mean, when Steve Horvath came with the epigenome age clock out, he, you know, the first papers were called the Grim age because the reality was when he looked at the epigenetic age of samples he got from a, a public hospital from decades ago, and he, calc he applied the, the epigenetic uh, age clock to them, he was able to predict roughly, give or take a few years, when that person is going to die, to die unless there were you know, adverse things or a bus would hit him. Yeah? Uh, and, and he was you know, precisely right with an error of a few years. So, you know, the, the Grim age, epigenetic age was if the person didn't change lifestyle and would continue to do the same damage to his body as he did up to the, to the, to the you know, moment of the analysis, the trajectory would be more or less set, right? So, so these are kind of the, but again, it's an evolving field, right? So the way we're trying to do it with NU is we try to analyze all different types of things and then do a kind of a weight adjusted understanding of the biological age. Thank you very much, Eli. Um, and now I wish to welcome our next speaker, Alesh Kenda. Um, he's from the Ministry of Solidary Future, and he will have speech in Slovene language. So, lepo um, zdrav, and in veselimo se vašega predavanja. Ja, kot ste slišali, jaz sem Aleš Kenda. Počeščen sem, da sem lahko na tej vaši konferenci. Jaz se zadnjih 20 let na različne načine ukvarjam z odzivi na demografske spremembe, s starenjem prebivalstva, z dolguživo družbo. Prej sem bil na Ministrstvu za delo, zdaj sem pa na tem novo ustanovljenem Ministrstvu za solidarno prihodnost. Tukaj med vami sem pa pravzaprav po pomoti Ta pomota se je zgodila letos po mladi, ko sem se prijavil na nekakšno izobraževanje, nekakšen seminar o dolgu živosti, kjer sem želel spoznati oziroma nekako nadgraditi moje znanja tudi iz recimo nekih drugih vidikov. Ko pa sem prišel na to izobraževanje, škoda, da ni gospoda Lipovško tukaj, ko sem pa prišel na to izobraževanje, sem pa videl, da se pod vsega, enakimi besedami, kot so staranje, dolguživo, zdrava dolguživost, nahajajo čist neke druge vsebine. In da so tukaj tudi čist neki drugi ljudje, ki jih jaz pravzaprav niti ne poznam. Tako da sem najprej rekel, kle pa nekaj ni v redu, mogoče pa sploh ne bi hodil sem, ampak seveda to bi bila napaka. Sej, kot sem ugotovil, v bistvu kamorkoli pridem, neko dodano vrednost potegnem. Tako da sem bil zelo zadovoljen, da sem potem na tem otečaju bil do konca, da sem dejansko izvedel morske noga, mislim pa, da sem tudi uspel že na tečaju mogoče malo odpreti učiti, kaj se vse dogaja po svetu na tem področju. Tako da je zdaj zame seveda izziv, kaj ne jaz predstavim v tej pol ure, ki mi je na razpolago. Mislim, da lahko predstavim te ključne aktivnosti na področju starjena prebivalstva, dolguživosti, skratka stvari, ki so del tudi politik Združenih narodov, držav in v bistvu tistega, s čimer se ukvarjam jaz. Jaz sem tukaj za začetek eno tako enostavno stran naredil. Zdaj, a gre to za iste stvari? Vprašaja sem dal na konc. Skratka, demografske spremembe so te sodobne demografske spremembe so nekako identično kot staranje prebivalstva. Dolgo smo govorili o staranju prebivalstva, zadnje čase to staranje prebivalstva, ki ni nekako najlepša, niti dovolj optimistična beseda, zamenjujemo z besedo dolguživost. 
In seveda, dolguživosti je blizu zdrava dolguživost. Te besede sicer pri nas ne uporabljamo toliko, ampak tukaj je to neka ključna beseda, tako da tukaj smo vsi nekje blizu. Zdaj, starjene prebivalstva. Eno je, kot smo v predhodnem govoru slišali, veliko staranje z vidika posameznika. Dobro je pa, da vemo tudi, da se nam dogaja zdaj starjene prebivalstva, torej staranje družbe. Vzroki so dva oziroma trije. Prvi je seveda daljše pričakovano trajanje življenja, po domače rečeno živimo dle, imamo več starejših, jaz počas prehajam v to obdobje. To je rezultat marsi česa, v to se jaz zdaj ne bi spuščal pa po nepotreben tratu časa. Mogoče sem na eno stvar se nekoliko zrem, to so boljši delovni pogoje. Verjetno se niti ne zavedamo tega, kako so se ti delovni pogoji neverjetno spremenili. Jaz se spomnim, ko sem bral en članek o tem, kako je v Ljubljano prišel tramvaj. In prva leta je bil še najbolj nekaj tist enostavn tramvaj, ki je imel zavoznika mesto od spredaj, torej od zunaj, ni bil niti pokrit gor in celo stati je mogel. Z današnjega vidika grozni delovni pogoji, tedaj pa je bil ta voznik presrečen, da je imel to delo, ker je bilo to visoko cenjeno in drugič dobil je redno plačo, ki je v tistem času marsikomu ni uspelo dobiti. In ko pogledamo recimo 50 let nazaj ali še manj, ko sem se jaz veliko z avtobusom vozil, pa sem zmeri opozoval šoferje, po leti pri 50 stopinjah se je potil in vozil, pa vsako predstavo mogel predstavljati z roko. Zdaj ima tisto kabinco, kjer je klima noter, v celem avtobusu klima in je skratka zgodba povsem drugačna. Skratka, za staranje prebivalstva, kakršno je, kakršnemu smo sedaj priča, je pomemben dejavnik daljše pričakovano trajanje življenja, ampak morda celo bolj, pa so to malo številne mlade generacije. Teh generacij je manj, so manjše, kot so bile nekoč in zato je seveda delež starejših v družbi toliko večji. Tudi migracije lahko igrajo pomembno vlogo, pri nas v Sloveniji do zdaj niti ne, ampak na Hrvaškem recimo pa že. Tam se v zadnjih desetih letih ljudje zelo izseljujejo ven, izseljujo se praviloma seveda mladi, ostajajo starejši in to še dodatno pospešuje staranje prebivalstva. Kar se malo številnih mladih generacij tiče, pred prvo vojno, 20-30 let prej, se je na ozemlju današnje Slovenije rojevalo po cirka 38 tisoč živorojenih otrok na leto. Na to je to nekoliko padlo, ampak še vedno do leta približno 70 so bile generacije živorojenih otrok v Sloveniji okrog 30 tisoč. Po 80. letu je pa to začelo strmo padati in je padlo celo na 15 tisoč v nekaj letih. Zdaj se je zgodba stabilizirala na okoli 30 tisoč živorojenih otrok na leto. Se bo dalo, tega se ne bo dalo. To je ena zanimiva piramida, ki v njih 60. letih prikazuje, kako se je v Sloveniji tista piramida, ki je bila taka, spreminjala in vidi se pa tudi ene dve v drtini, kako se je višata. To sta v drtini posledici prve in druge svetovne vojne. Kako neverjeten vpliv ima in sta imeli vojni na slovensko prebivalstvo. Tega nažalost ne bomo mogli videti, vam pa mogoče eno anegdoto svojo na to temu povem. Jaz pogosto gledam, koliko je stoletnikov v Sloveniji. In pred 15-20 leti jih je bilo po 200, potem so naraščali nad 200 in potem sem imel eno predstavitev, celo pred predsednikom države takrat, pa sem malo po domače rekel, ko nisem 
čistočnih podatkov imel. Zdaj, ko jih je bilo zadenkrat 270, pa glede na to, koliko let je prej so potrebovali za toliko, zdaj jih je nekaj 330 in sem na tistem predstavitvi bleknil v številko, zdaj jih je pa okrog 330. Seveda, sem noben ne ve detaljo, jaz sem šel domov in bilo vse v redu. Pa sem pa čez par mesecev pogledal neke podatke, ki so se mi pa točni pojavili. Je bilo pa stoletnik v Sloveniji bistveno manj, kot sem jaz še ta zadenkrat videl. Zakaj? Ker so se pojavile posledice prve svetovne vojne, skratka tisti moški, ki bi bili takrat stari sto let, jih ni bilo, predvsem pa ni bilo novih rojstev in una španska gripa po prvi svetovni vojni, to so naredili izjemen upad števila stoletnikov. Tako da smo kar nekaj časa rabili, da smo prišli nazaj na unih 260, kot jih je bilo nekoč, in zdaj smo pa naprej, kar bomo pa na naslednjih slajdih videli. A ja, je pa že na temu. Tukaj ste zdaj dva zanimiva podatka. V tej prvi vrstici s številkami gledamo bi rekel, nek individualen vidik staranja. Vidimo, kako je število stoletnikov naraslo od leta 91 do 2023. Če to pretvorimo v procente, je to neverjeten preskok. Zdaj vem, da vas polovica razmišlja, da sem se sigurno zmotil pri številki. Zdaj sem trikrat preveril, da jih je res 363. Ampak to je zdaj z vidika stoletnikov, kar je zame seveda nekaj neverjetnega. Mogoče bolj pomemben oziroma strokovno večjo težo pa ima v naspodno vrstica. To je pa delež starejših prebivalcev v celotne prebivalstvo. Se je pa v bistvu za 100% povečal. Zato, ker starejši živijo dle in te mlade generacije so malo številne. Zdaj Demografske spremembe so se v bistvu po drugi svetovni vojni začele v tem zahodnem svetu. Iznajdla so se nova zdravila, aspirin je velik naredil, antibiotiki so tudi veliko prispevali k temu. Tako da so v 60-ih, 70-ih letih demografi ugotavljali, da se obeta nek neobičajen scenarij, Na začetku smo so temu tudi govorili, da bo demografska katastrofa, da bo vsi v tsunami. Nemški častnik, ki je eno knjigo napisal za roto Metuzelenmov in otrk celo napisal, kakšen bo čez 50 let svet, kakšna bo naša zemlja čez 50 let, kot en velikanski dom starejših, ki se bo gibal po vesolju. Ampak tudi, Ta poimenovanja so potem počasi od negativnih prehajala v neko bolj pozitivno konotacijo, tako da danes ne govorimo več praviloma o demografskih problemih, ampak bolj o nekih izzivih priložnostih in tudi o staranju prebivalstva ne govorimo toliko, ker želimo seveda dati neko pozitivno konotacijo tem dogajanjem, ki se zdaj dogajajo in ki smo jim priča, ki se jih pa pogosto vsega niti ne zavedamo. Škoda, ker nisem dal gore ne slike, ki sem jo nekoč imel. Bilo je štiri leta nazaj, ko sem parkiral v garažni hiši City Park, ne v pritličju, ampak v prvi nadstropju. Jaz imam že kar problem malo parkirati, da točno not rovno, če poševno. V zmeri grem malo levo, desno. Zravno mene je pa tudi ravno istočasno prokiral starejši, kot jaz. Pocilal tako, kaj je treba. Pa se nekaj par besed si rečel, ampak se začnejo pogovarjati. Gospod je bil star 95 let. Je pa glih malo težje vhodil, ker je rekel, da je iz Češne padel. Se je pa strinjal, da sem ga slikal in škoda, da nisem dal noter slike. Je pa res dobro zgledal, tako da sem celo priveril, sem rekel, kjer ga leta ste bil rojen in je vse štimalo. 
Zdaj živimo dlje, ne? To so demografski, recimo, problemi tudi, velika obremenitev tudi gospodarstva, ker je vec starejši in tako se govori in tole. Sliš se marske, ampak kakorkoli obračamo, to je zgodba uspehu, ne? To je prva stvar in s tem moramo biti zadovoljni in srečni, da živimo v tem današnjem času. Predvsem pa tukaj so generirali dosežki današnjih starejših in tudi vseh preterkih generacij. Tako da razna taka poimenovanja starejših, kot pa so že to, pa ono, pa so hokejisti, ki spalco hodijo, pa to, sorry, imaš pač kratko pamet, tisti, ki to govori. Hvaležni moramo biti pač današnji starejši, da živimo tukaj. Nekdo mi je rekel, da so pač kakšno breme, je to pa to, pa sem mu rekel, si zadovoljen, ker živiš dle, kot so tvoji starši, pa tvoji prejšnji, pa stari starši živeli. Ja, ja, sem, ampak nis pa zadovoljen, da drugi živijo toliko dle, a ne? Pol je zakapiral, a ne? Sorry, živimo dle, temu si je zdaj treba prilagoditi na tak ali drugačen način. In kako se je svet na to prilagajal? Kot sem rekel, v 60-ih, 70-ih letih so se strokovnjaki začeli zavedati teh spremembk, ki se nam bodo začele dogajati in tukaj nekak štafetno palico vzela so vzeli Združeni narodi. Posebej ta zahodni svet je temu najbolj podvržen in zato je tukaj so aktivni oni Združeni narodi v Ženevi. To je UNECE, to je United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, Ekonomska komisija Združenih narodov za Evropo. Med drugem tukaj je bil generalni sekretar Janez Stanovnik v tem segmentu Združenih narodov več kot deset let. 82. leta, torej na Dunaju, je bila prva svetovna skupščina v staranju, kjer so se zbrali ministri, predsedniki držav, kjer so sprejeli pomembne sklepe, kako naj se države začnejo odzivati na te spremembe, ki se bližajo. Te sklepi so bili, bi rekel, zelo dobro napisani za tiste čase, jaz, ko sem jih zdaj gledal, sem rekel, vizionarji so bili tisti, ki so to pisali, vendar sklepom na vkljub Naslednjih 20 let se praktično ni nič dogajalo po državah. Čemu? Demografske spremembe še niso bile tako pereče, zato so bili, bi rekel, predsedniki vlad nekako paralizirani, niso šli v neke akcije, kar je bilo narejenega, so bile ponovat po večini neke reforme pokoninskih sistemov. Česa širšega pa ni bilo. Zato so čez 20 let, leta 2002, v Madridu organizirali drugo svetovno skupščino o staranju, kjer se je staranje prepoznalo kot nek globalni razvojni fenomen, kjer se je sprejelo madridski akcijski načrt o staranju in na to tudi njegovo izvedbeno strategijo, ki pa države že mnogo bolj zavezuje. Med drugem, Države zavezuje tudi na podlagi petletni. Vsakih pet let se potem dogajajo ministrske konference, kjer se pogleda, kaj so države naredile in kjer se po domač rečeno države spodbuja, da naj se bolj intenzivno lotijo teh izzivov, ki so že med nami, niso več pred nami. Zdaj, Slovenija je 97. leta nekako prvi nekako sprejela nekako prvi širši dokument na tem področju, to je bila strategija varstva starejših. Ime je z današnjega vidika grozno, ker starejši so nezadovoljni in jaz jih čist razumem, ko se govori o varstvu starejših. Jaz sem bil v vrtcu, ki sem ga končal 67. leta zadnjkrat v varstvu. Jaz si ne predstavljam tam zdaj ponovno v nekem varstvu. Tudi, če si v domu starejših, si stanovalec doma in nisi v varstvu, nudijo ti pomoč, varstvo je grozno. Ampak v tistih časih je bilo to običajno ime, še pol 2006 ga nismo mogli dati stran zaradi nekih formalnosti. 
značilnost oziroma zanimivost te prve strategije je, da je se je nanašalo zgolj na področje socialnega varstva, da pa je znotraj socialnega varstva razširila pogled, kot da so domovi za starejše edina rešitev, potem ko si je enkrat star. In je šlo to v širjanje zgodbe v pomoč na domu, skrbovana stanovanja in nekak širšo zgodbo. Da ne zamujemo preveč časa, grem na ta zadnjo strategijo, to je leta 2017, je bila sprijeta sedaj veljavna strategija dogožive družbe. To pa je že medresorski dokument, v bistvu vključuje vse, praktično vse resorje v Sloveniji. Nekot smo recimo še govorili, ja, se te demografske sprejembe zadevajo pa okolje, pa zadevajo zdravstvo, pa to pa to, kveč smo z vnanje ministrstvo, ne, to, to. In nasprotno, še celo z vnanje ministrstvo je zelo vključeno v te zgodbe in z vnanje ministrstvo je recimo zelo vključeno v zgodbo pravic starejših na tem mednarodnem nivoju. Zelo so aktivni, Slovenija je na tem področju aktivna. Ne bomo zgubljali časa na tej strategiji, ampak samo povem. Ta celotna spektr družbe je tukaj razdeljen na štiri stebre. Vsak je še v sami strategiji zelo detaljno razdelan. Če koga veseli, se lahko nam obrne, mu bom kasneje ali pa kdaj drugič, kaj bač razložil. Zdaj, Živimo pa v zahodni družbi, živimo v zahodni civilizaciji, za katero pa je značilno, da na starejše in na staranje ne gleda hudo prijazno. Starejši so neki betežni ljudje, odvisni od nečesa, to so bovni ljudje, v glavnem taki so pogledi. V tej zahodni družbi je tudi ubilo starizma, starizem sestavljen iz predsodkov, stereotipov in diskriminacije. Največ je stereotipov in predsodkov, to je tako, da z levo roko rečeš, ima se vna je pa stara, pa on je to, pa pa pozabljiv, pa tako naprej. To so predsodki, stereotipi, to so take mehke stvari, kjer se človek niti ne poglobi kaj dost. To je pač navajeno v življenju, da je to tako. Diskriminacija to je pa hujša stvar, kjer pa zavestno, kaj delaš. Tega je, sem pripričan, vseeno manj. Ena od napak v današnji družbi je pa tudi pogled na starejše kot na homogeno skupino. Zdaj so vsi isti, se to je tako, vse to je tako. Skratka, ampak starost, če je tako rečen, kdo so starejši, to so ljudje stari od 55 do 110 let. Ta meja 65 let je pač nek statistična odločitev, ampak recimo za poslovalci, te že, ko si star 50 let, že tako gledajo in tako naprej. Zato recimo lahko rečemo, da z določenih vidikov so starejši od 55 do 110 let. In to so, seveda, nikakor ni homogena skupina, ampak je hudo heterogena skupina z vidika, že samo z vidika starosti, potem z vidika zdravja, z vidika interesov, ki jih imajo tisočkrat bolj kot otroci, če je tako malo ponostavno. Ko si star eno leto shodiš, ko si star dve leti nehaš uporabljati pleničke, ko si star tri leta te pa starši vozijo na dve uni aktivnosti še po vrtico. Ampak pri starejših je pa to druga skodba. Ampak kakorkoli obračamo zgodbo, če nič ne gremo bolj v kakšne aktivnosti, bodo nam v tem svetu ostali v spominu starejši, kot so tukaj na sliki. To mislim, da je slika iz Anglije. Ampak seveda nikjer pa ne piše, da morajo biti pogledaj na starejše ravno taki, kot so tukaj, na staranje na starejše v tistem azijskem področju gledajo drugače. To smo že prej v prejšnjem predavanju slišali. Ameriška znanstvenica Beka Levi, ki proučuje staranje, je imela predavanje na kitajskem. Prosila je 
v deležence na listke napišejo pet misli, ki jim padajo na pamet o starejših. Naj nič ne razmišljajo, ampak naj na hitro napišejo tisto, kar jim pade v trenutku. In je potem pobrala listke. Čez čas je imela predavanje v Združenih državah Amerike, od tamo ona mislim, da tudi živi. Isto prošno jim je ponovila in je tudi tam pobrala listke in odgovore. Na to je pa primerjala, katero mnenje v starejših se ne več kot pojavilo na kitajskem in katero na v Združenih državah Amerike. In na kitajskem je bila najpogostejša beseda modrost, v Združenih državah Amerike pa pozabljivost. To seveda veliko pove o temu, v kakšni družbi živimo. In če bo men en cel dan govoril, da sem starostnik, pa da sem pozabljiv, pa to, pa on, pa drug, a veste, kako se bom zvečer počutil? In vprašam vas, ali bo to vplivalo na dolžino mojega življenja? Meni je jasno. Zdaj pa, Japonska je tudi v Aziji. In zračunal sem, koliko bi bilo stoletnikov na Japonskem, če bi imela toliko prejevalcev kot Slovenija. 4,7 krat več. In kje je zdaj vzrok za to? A imajo boljše delovne pogoje, ko delajo? Tam, ko ponoč zaspijo na delovnih mizah, smo videli v pisarnah, ali imajo več dopusta kot mi, imajo ga tretjino toliko kot mi, pa še tistega se ne upajo izkoristiti, ali so mogoče jejo boljšo hrano, bolj zdravo hrano, ribe, ribe imajo tudi veliko živega srebra. Ampak nesporno pa je, da živijo v družbi, ki jih bolj spoštuje. Jaz sem eno slovenko spraševal, ki živi na japonskem, poročila se je, kako je zdaj to tam? Ja, je rekla, tam se spoštuje drugače, kot tukaj. Mi je pa seveda povedala tudi en primer, ki pa kaže, da pa gre mogoče v enem trenutku celo preko meje. V avtobusu oziroma na metroju so tudi posebna mesta za starejše in se je ena nosečnica vsedla na on sedež in prišel starejši gospod, možakar, in jo je enostavno dol vrgu. Skratka, nikjer ni idealno, ampak lahko se učimo eni od drugih. Za našo družbo je značilen starizem, to sem prej povedal. Svetovna zdravstvena organizacija pravi, da krajša življenje je tudi do sedem let pa pol. Druga stvar je, ki si jo mogoče v tem trenutku še niti ne zavedamo tako, pa je osamljenost. Ta enako krajša življenje. In osamljenost je neka zgodba, ki je mogoče bolj prisotna med nami, pa si jo ne zavedamo toliko. Ljudje smo družbeno biti in smo navajeni biti en z drugim. In še sto let nazaj so bile te več generacijske družine, tako da ni bilo neke osamljenosti tam. Zdaj živijo, recimo, ko si enkrat star 60, 70, 80 let, mož pa žena, ampak prejaslej en umre. V službo ne hodeš več, nek sosed, s katerim si bil blizu, se odseli in tako naenkrat ostaneš zelo osamljen in če se zaradi tega začneš še notranje grist, da ti to povzroča velike težave, tudi notranje je ti to velik zdravstven problem. Zato Združeni narodi med vrsto usmeritev, ki so jih dali tam na onem madridskem dogodku leta 2002, pravijo tudi, spodbujajmo pozitivne podobe starejših in staranja. In v to pozitivno smer gre tudi to poimenovanje starejših. Starejši so nezadovoljni, če se jih poimenuje starostnik, oskrbovanec doma za starejše ali pa da je dom za starostnike ali pa da si v domu varovanec doma za starostnike. To je nekako nespoštljivo, kot bi bilo nespoštljivo, da me je ne reče, da sem star. Jaz mu bom rekel, glej, zamej to želitev, zakaj? Zato, ker je bil zate kriterij edino to, da si pogledal, da imam jaz sive lase, 
in da sem se rodil leta 1960. Imam pa jaz še vrsto drugih lasnosti, ki bistveno presegajo to, kdaj sem se jaz rodil. Imam hodom v službo, ukvarjam se z športom, berem to, to, to. Med drugem sem leta 2023 imel celo priložnost, da sem govoril na eni konferenci na inštitutu Jožefa Štefana. Skratka. A ni to pomembne, še kot to, da sem se takrat rodil. In če reče starejši, starejši človek, recimo, je to mnogo bolj mehko. Jaz sem pa starejši, kot si ti. Še par let nazaj je bil žil Boris Pahor, ki bi bil lahko v bistvu po letih celo moj star oče. To je predzaden pomemben dio pozitiv, ki pa kaže na to, da so starejši drugačni, kot so bili na koč. Jaz sem to večkrat kje povedal, ampak nisem imel nikoli nekih konkretnih podatkov. Starejši so drugačni, kot nekaj so bolj aktivni, bolj to, to. Švedi so pa naredili raziskavo 70-letnikov in so to raziskavo naredili prvič leta 1970, potem 1890 in tako naprej. Poročevali so pa te kriterije, izobrazba, občutek, ali si zdrav, fizična sposobnost, ravnoteži, depresija in tako naprej. In zanimivo, prav pri vseh, razen pri pitja alkohola, ampak pri vseh so se sposobnosti izboljševale. Pomeni, ljudje se staramo, ampak naša biološka starost pa je manjša. Vsemu na vklub, vsemu na vklub, tudi temu na vklub, da je Švedska tudi na tej zahodni polobli, kjer tudi do starejših ne gledajo ravno tako prijazno, kot bi lahko. To je zdaj pač ena misel, ne, Pred leti je bilo glavno, da se naredi domove za starejše, da se skrbi za varstvo, pa to zdaj pa seveda tudi starejši niso zadovoljni sam s tem, da živijo dle, kot so živeli nekoč, ampak da je tem dodanim letom v bistvu treba dodati življenje in tudi politike grejo počasi v to smer. To je pa res predzaden slajd. Kdor ponotranji to vprašanje in ta odgovor je na področju staranja naredil nek pomemben preskok. Pogosto o starejših se razmišlja, to so tam oni, ki so 20-30 let starejši, to je tudi neka druga zgodba, neka druga kasta, tam za devetimi gorami so, ampak to ni res, to so starejši, to smo mi jutri. In ko si vsak od nas predstavila, da je lahko jutri v domu za starejše, ali pa da je lahko že jutri na vozičku in da mu iz ust mogoče malo slina tako povzi, da daj bo zakapiral ta vseživljenski vidik zgodbe staranja. Staramo se vsi od začetka, od rojstva. Evo, in prišli smo na konc. To, kar sem napisal, je misel Ingemarja Bergmana. Staranje, kako je hojo na hrib, ko se uspenaš, imaš lahko nekaj in razdihne, nekaj, tako, tako. Mogoče lahko tukaj sem še dodam eno misel pa slovenskega strokovnjaka na področju staranja, to je pa dr. Jožo Ramovš, ki pa je dejal, da je na staranje možno tudi gledati tako kot na letne čase. Če spomladi lepo zorješ nivo, če posadiš v strezno seme, če ga potem neguješ tist pridel, pa da vlečeš ven v plevel, da zalivaš, potem boš imel jeseni dobre pridelke, ki bodo dolgo trajali, ki jih bo spravil vklet. Vendar moš pa od časa do časa iti vklet, da boš pogledal, če ti kakšni krompiri gnijejo in tiste moš dati stran, ker drugače se bodo še ostali okužili s tem. Tako, toliko z moje strani, najlepša hvala za pozornost. Lepa hvala, gospod Aleš Kenda, za zanimivo predavanje, ki je tudi zelo pomembno in si je nov pogled na tematiko zdrave dolgoživosti. Zdaj pa imamo čas za eno vprašanje, ali po Zoomu, ali vživo, kdor bo prvi. Prosim. Samo eno 
doživetje. Jaz sem stara 60 let in lansko leto sem tekla na pol maratonu v Koprivnici. Delam pa v Žitu in nas je podravka kupila, ni več podravka, podravka. In sem dobila nagrado za najstariju ženu. In direktorica, generalna direktorica podravke, Martina Dalič, je rekla, ma baš so bezobrazni. V bistvu nimam komentarja. Gre v kontekst tistega, kar sem tu zdaj govoril. Jaz ne podem na eni komentar. Eno zelo hitro vprašanje, kaj smo že dali. Najlepša hvala za lepo sliko, kaj se dogaja v svetu, kaj delajo v Združenih narodih. Ampak mene zanima, kaj boste vi naredili kot nosilec funkcije v vašem ministerstvu, da se bo nekateri stvari spremenile, pa prvenstveno ali bi lahko podprli z nekimi sredstvi taka prizadevanja, kot jih ima recimo doktor Enej Kuščar. Dejansko izboljšam kvaliteto dolgoživosti, vas pa mene pa, teh tisti, ki so vrši še mladi, da bojo več. To, kar je govoril Enej Kuščar, je neka stvar, ki je popolnoma nova. Jaz sem dovoljte, 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 če jaz ne bi prišel na tisto seminar, ki sem bil, ne bi bilo prav nobenega stika z nekom iz ministrstva, recimo. Na srečo sem jaz prišel in to čist privatno, celo sam sem si plačal tole, tako da nek stik je spostavljen. Jaz mislim, da je zgodba v temu, da se je potrebno spoznavati, da se iskati neke skupne točke in sodelovati. Do zdaj tega pač ni bilo. Jaz sem tukaj naredil nek korak, lahko gremo naprej. Ključna stvar v Sloveniji pa je, da je ta ključen dokument za odzivanje na izzive demografskih sprememb strategija dolgo žive družbe, v katerega v resničevanju pa vključeno vrsta ministrstev in ta dokument se ravno letos jeseni nekak spravila v pogon. Hvala lepa. Ja, tudi hvala. Super. Zdaj pa naslednjega govorca bom pa jaz, ker sem prej letekel po njega, tako da... All right, so we continue with the English language. And here our next speaker is Professor Stephen Minger, um, long time neuroscientist and researcher of stem cells. And I'm very happy to have him in the conference. Uh, Dan, everyone. I'm afraid I'll have to sit probably because I can't stand for a long time. Um, by way of background, uh, just so you kind of have an idea of who I am. Um, uh, I'm trained as a neurobiologist initially with a big interest in nervous system disease. Then we got interested in gene therapy and transplantation for nervous system disease. That led us to discover neural stem cells in the developing brain uh, back in the early 90s. That led us to actually moving from tissue-specific stem cells to pluripotent stem cells uh, in the early days derived from human embryos uh, created by in vitro fertilization. Uh, I moved to London in 1995, was in London for 25 years uh, before coming to Slovenia. So I was director of stem cell biology at King's College London for 12 years or so. We derived some of the first human embryonic stem cell lines in Europe. I think we were number eight in the world. In 2009, I was recruited to GE Healthcare, uh, initially to be global head of R&D. Um, GE, which is best known for making you know, jet engines and uh, gas and oil exploration stuff. They wanted to become a stem cell company, which I found quite amazing. And as my boss at that time said, look, I'm making you an offer that you can't refuse. I have $5 billion a year in R&D money, and uh, you don't have to write any grants. You just have to convince me that I should give you some or all of this. So it's quite an easy choice. Uh, I left GE in 2015, <clears throat> excuse me, but I was retained as a consultant to them. Uh, and on the back of that, I basically set up my own consultancy company. And the reason it's called Blue Skies is because for the last three years, I was chief scientist at GE Healthcare reporting into the uh, CEO of healthcare, John Deneen. And my job then was basically to scour the world looking for really cutting edge, early stage technology 
that we thought collectively would be transformative in healthcare in the next five, 10, 20 years. I had no budget except for travel, uh, and I had no people reporting to me. It was the best job in the world. It was just basically going around and looking at really, really cool technology. And so um, one of the reasons why um, we wanted to do that was because it's become increasingly aware, and I think this conference epitomizes that, that you know, as a society, we are aging, uh, ever increasingly living longer, whether you know, 120 or 150 is ever going to be really realized. But the downside of that is, is as we age, we become more and more susceptible to age-related disorders. And with an ever increasingly aged population, we have to come up with new technologies which will combat this increase in neurodegenerative conditions, cardiovascular disease, cancer, and other things. So what I hope to do today is kind of not maybe convince you, but just give you a glimpse of some of the things that we've been looking at, and particularly now as a, as a consultant. I mean, I sit on the boards of three or four different companies in the US and in Europe. Uh, I do a lot of due diligence for investors who are looking at really early stage technology. Uh, and so I'm seeing a lot of things. I mean, I probably have reviewed 300 projects, 300 uh, young spin outs in the last three years or so. And so there's a lot of excitement, but there's a lot of technology that's really nascent and trying to understand that and see how it's all going to fit together is, is, is you know, is quite mind boggling. Um, but let, anyway, let's get started. If nothing else, this will just be a tour of the things that I think are really exciting at the moment. So as I said, I started out as a, as a stem cell, well, as a neurobiologist, and then moved into more or less uh, a wide variety of different stem cell populations. So what's important about this slide is, let's see if I can figure this out. If you, it's not working here, is it? Oh yeah, there it is. Okay. So at the top, we have what are called pluripotent stem cells. Pluri meaning pretty much everything. That means from pluripotent stem cells, which, sorry, okay, can I go back? Yeah. Um, from pluripotent stem cells, in essence, we think that we can create any cell type, any tissue type in the body. And, you know, as I said, we were 20, 20 years, 21 years ago this year, um, we made embryonic stem cells from early embryos. And what we discovered was, you know, you could, you could end up with a huge variety of different cell types just by letting these cells grow in a dish and then and let them differentiate. And they would pretty much make up, you know, a, a mish of all sorts of different tissues. But over the intervening 20 years now, finally, we've now come up with protocols where we can push these cells to very, very defined cell types. Uh, and so, for example, currently there's, there's at least four phase one clinical trials making dopaminergic neurons that are being implanted into human Parkinson's patients. We had done this with fetal tissue maybe 35 years ago, but now we're doing this with cells that we create in the dish. Um, Vertex also has a program in type 1 diabetes, and they've treated at least uh, more than six or eight patients, some of whom have come off of insulin completely. So we've replaced their lost beta cells uh, that make functional insulin. Uh, they're under immunosuppression at the moment, but we're coming up with ways of hiding those cells in a kind of biocompatible um, cloaking system, which would allow us to not uh, have to put the patients on immunosuppression. And then, of course, you know, from, a, from tissues in our body, we have a whole bunch of what we call adult cells. Um, these are tissue-specific stem cells. If, you know, for example, you can go into the developing liver, pull out cells that will grow a huge number of liver cells in the dish, but they can't make anything other than liver. So they're really restricted into the tissue from which they're derived. Um, you know, the most characterized cell populations actually come from the bone marrow which are hematopoietic stem cells, which you see on the left, adult blood stem cells. And they give rise to all the blood in the vasculature on a daily basis. Um, it's estimated we make 3 million new red blood cells every second of our lives. Even if you live to be 120, you know, every second you're making 3 million just red blood cells. Think of all the other cells you're making. Um, so, it, you know, we're starting now to, in a number, you know, Bone marrow transplantation has been around for 50 years. That relies on somebody else's bone marrow being transplanted into the patient. Um, occasionally now, for example, for, for multiple sclerosis, we're taking the patient's own bone marrow out and then eradicating their, their T cells and presumably getting rid of the autoreactive T cells and then giving them back their own bone marrow 
uh, to replenish the T cells. And this seems to work. Um, it's, it's still in, in early phase, I think phase two now, but most patients who get this treatment, 95% of them, uh, their MS completely resolves and stops. Um, and, and also from the bone marrow or from cord blood or now even from adipose tissue, we're making mesenchymal stem cells, mesenchymal stromal cells. They have a whole bunch of different names, but essentially they're cells that normally give rise to cartilage and bone. Um, but occasionally, if they're cultured in a, in a certain way, you can use them in clinical conditions where we're not relying on cell transplant, cell replacement per se, but the cells are capable of going in and doing something in a regenerative uh, fashion or suppressing the immune system, in, for example, in chronic inflammatory diseases. So these are being trialed in things like Crohn's disease and, and IBS and, and other inflammatory diseases. So now we're, you know, we're really starting to push cellular transplantation and gene transplantation, sometimes combined, uh, for very specific indications in very specific individuals, and many times relying on their own cells. And I'll show you something that is, is very, it's not very new, but it's, it's really expanding rather rapidly that relies on this. So cell and gene therapy is becoming um, really huge, and particularly from pluripotent stem cells, because for example, you know, we can't generate new cardiac cells from, from the heart. It's just impossible. We have a difficult time taking cells from the adult liver and getting them to expand. Um, that's why people almost always have to have a almost complete liver transplantation, liver transplant rather. Um, but from pluripotent cells, we're starting to see a number of clinical trials. And this is just an example of something that we did when I was at, at GE. These are human adult cardiomyocytes that are derived from embryonic stem cells. So these things beat in synchrony without stimulation. They do this spontaneously. Uh, we basically had a differentiation protocol where we started with cells that could turn into everything, and we drove them using different cytokines and growth factors, we drove them to turn into cardiac cells. These are about 80% cardiac cells. They have cells from all three chambers of the heart, and they beat spontaneously. These cells have never been in anything except the dish. They were derived from about 70 cells from a six-day-old human blastocyst, expanded, and then differentiated. This is pretty amazing. I still want to see this. I found, find it incredible. You can take these cells apart with trypsin, dissociate them, freeze them, and five years later thaw them, put them back in the dish, and they spontaneously in three days start doing this again. So there's three groups now, Chuck Murray's the most prominent in Seattle, who are basically, they've completed all the primate studies, um, and what they've found is you have to grow these cells on kind of a patch of some sort, and in patients with heart failure, the cells go in the left ventricle uh, through the femoral artery, and basically they glue them to the region of infarction in the left ventricle, and at least in primates thus far, uh, the animals uh, recover. So, you know, this is just one example. You know, liver cells, cardiomyocytes, uh, insulin-producing beta cells, uh, nervous system, uh, neuro different sets of nervous system cells, uh, dopaminergic neurons, for example, in Parkinson's disease, et cetera, et cetera. So after 20 years of a lot of hard work, because how do you take a cell that wants to turn into everything and push it only to turn into a single cell type? It's really, really difficult, and it's taken a long time to do this. But I'm, you know, I'm pleased to say that this is happening. So this is kind of the shopping list of, you know, just a few things that basically cell-based therapies are being used for at the moment, mostly in clinical trials, but in some cases we have uh, some products. Um, most of this work has been done, as I said, with cells that are fairly easy to obtain, so from bone marrow, from adipose tissue, or from cord blood. Um, but for example, from Parkinson's disease, the only source is from pluripotent cells. Same thing for uh, macular degeneration. We can only make retinal pigment and epithelium, which we think is the replacement cell that we need. We can only make that from pluripotent cells. But this is really just a small list. If you go in, excuse me, into the leading uh, clinical trials website that lists all the clinical trials, at least in the US and in Europe, there are currently over 6,000 trials if you type in the word stem cells that are either in early phase or, or are pending or whatever, but you, you can basically find a clinical trial for almost anything you're looking for with stem cells or, and or gene therapy. 
shame. Whoops. Is that the slide? Oh, okay. Yeah, it is actually. Um, so this is relatively new. It's called CAR T for chimeric antigen receptor T cell. And we were instrumental when I was at GE in helping to develop this because um, we, had a, we had a bioreactor actually that's a disposable bag, sits on a, a rocker that's heated. And uh, basically, before we knew what was happening, the oncologists in the US were using it to grow cells and infusing them into patients, which was a bit scary. Um, but anyway, this is going to revolutionize cancer therapy. Um, the only quote unquote cure for cancer for leukemias, for example, is a bone marrow transplant. That's it. Um, but rarely do patients live really, really long term with, with a bone marrow transplant. It may get rid of their leukemia, but generally they have other problems. So what people, Michelle Sandlin and Carl June's group did uh, starting about 30 years ago now, was basically figure out how could they train the immune system to recognize uh, uh, a, a cancer. Because in essence, cancers have become very, very de-differentiated back into what appears to be more like an embryonic state. They turn on a lot of early developmentally regulated genes, which are only expressed in the, in the developing fetus and embryo, which then get shut off, certainly off, before birth. And many cancer cells turn these things back on as they become more and more primitive and malignant. And so you would think that the, the immune system would recognize these as foreign because they've never seen these antigens um, in adult life. But in many cases, and particularly solid tumors, it seems like the immune system is completely inept at, at seeing this. So what Carl and, and Michelle did was basically figure out a way to genetically engineer the patient's own T cells, their white blood subpopulation of white blood cells, um, by putting in basically a receptor for a target that is thought to be expressed either, on, either exclusively on cancer cells or to a greater extent on cancer cells than any other tissue in the body. Uh, so you harvest the patient's white blood cells, select for T cells, activate them because the cells when they come out of the body are basically you know pretty inert you activate them drive them to proliferate and once they're proliferating then you genetically engineer them usually with with lentiviruses now for this car this chimeric antigen receptor uh, once the cells have been activated and proliferate to a certain extent usually in culture for six to twelve days you harvest the cells and infuse them back into the patient in particularly uh, leukemias, both myeloid and lymphoid leukemias, um, about 50 to 60 percent of patients who have this procedure done, who are in stage patients who have failed numerous uh, arms of therapy, and in many cases have already failed a bone marrow transplant, completely resolve. So these are patients with in stage leukemia, and there are many patients now from the first studies that were published in 2010 and 11, about half those patients are still alive. And as far as we can tell, they are cured for life because uh, for a variety of reasons, every time the, the patients uh, try to make a new cell, their, their T cells, these CAR T cells, take it out. So for example, in the first trials, the patients had a B cell lymphoma. They have no functional B cells at all and never will. We thought the CARs would go away after a while, as all T cells do, but they appear to stay somehow uh, activated and proliferate, so there's always residual transplanted cells around, so if any new tumor cells were to arrive, they get taken out right away. So this is now being tried in a whole range of different tumor types. I'm on a board of a brand new company in the US, uh, and in six months we've acquired three phase one clinical trials. One has already started, one is midterm, and another one will start in February against both leukemias and solid tumors. People are also starting to make second and third generation uh, uh, products of these that are armored in the sense that they express other things other than just the car that we think will stimulate a, a longer lasting and more potent immune response and may require uh, fewer cells. So again, this is just another example of personalized cellular therapy. These are the patient's own white blood cells that we take out and we train them to attack uh, an oncogenic event. Um, and now people are beginning to test this, for example, in autoimmune disorders where we can maybe target the autoreactive T cells as well and say in, in you know, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, and other uh, autoimmune disorders. 
Okay. So that's the cell and gene side of things. One of the, one of the things we realized probably in the mid uh, 2010s, maybe around 2012 or so, was that there seemed to be a huge convergence of a whole bunch of different um, disciplines and different uh, technologies that were coming together uh, in, in, in basically trying to push healthcare to the next generation. So we started to see, for example, a lot of engineers working with biologists, a lot of electronic people, um, and, and obviously now there's been this huge, huge revolution here in, in what I call synthetic intelligence or AI or you know, chat, GBT, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, we're, the, we're now we're starting to see just a lot of really, really high tech but, but non-biological based systems impacting on biology and healthcare. And so these are, this is just a little bit of a shopping list of, of things. Um, I mean, all my friends now, except for me, have, a, have a, an Apple Watch that records everything they do every second of their lives. I don't know why anybody would want to know all this information. Um, and then, of course, there's issues around, uh, you know, who owns that information and where does it go? I don't think it stays in your watch, right? I think it, you know, Apple is hoovering up all this data. Um, and that's up to you if, you if you want to participate in that or not. I don't, so. Um, one of the big things that's happened <clears throat> that, again, I think will become hugely important for, for people much younger than, than myself is this idea of, you know, you have your own omics. And, you know, it's not just, um, let's see if I can do this, this will be easier. It's not just your own uh, genome data, because that really doesn't tell you anything. It's like a book you know, with no chapters, no punctuation, very little information and no interpretation. Your genome just tells you whether or not you have a mutation in a particular gene and not much more than that. It doesn't tell you if that mutation is even active. So a, a lot of people have gotten really involved in kind of multi-layering these omics. So you've got the genome, you've got the epigenome, you've got the proteome, you've got the metabolome, you've got microbiomics, which is, you know, what's the composition of bugs in your gut, in your lungs, in your mouth, in your skin, et cetera, et cetera. And trying to put all this data together, I mean, you know, the genome is enough. It's three billion plus or minus base pairs, you know, so that's a lot of data already. And then how you annotate that to look at, you know, what are genes, what are small interfering RNAs, what are microRNAs. Um, and then, you know, when you, when you go to the, when you go to the, um, uh, I can't see it on here, you, you go to the expression genome, which is basically which messenger RNAs are made from each gene and how are those alternatively spliced in different tissues. So, for example, the same gene in a liver could be expressed much differently in, in let's say, the heart. Uh, and then, of course, how that's all regulated is the epigenome. And then, you know, metabolomics, microbiomics, you start to layer all this stuff together and it's just a huge, huge amount of data. And now it's only with the advent of machine learning and neural networks and artificial intelligence that we can even make sense of this. But I think in the next 10 years, given the rate at which computing is going, I mean, if you rem this is now what, the, the 20th anniversary of the, uh, the Human Genome Project. And it took us 10 plus years to sequence Craig Ventner's genome. That was the only genome we did, we did one. Now we can do a genome in a day, okay? In 20 years, that's how fast the computing power is. And it costs about 100, 100 euros to, to sequence somebody's f complete genome now, 99.9% .9 sequence. So with, with computing power becoming ever more increasingly massive, you could see how all of this stuff can be built up on top of uh, uh, each other. And, you know, and in the end, you get down to where you can predict health and disease. This is the really important part. Because, you know, the years, I think, of us just throwing the same drug at everybody who walks in the door with, quote, unquote, prostate cancer is long gone. And we're starting to develop a lot of tools now to, to personalize, um, uh, you know, which drugs we give people or when we give them to them and in which sequence. Uh, a lot of people now are doing screening where they'll take a biopsy of a patient, grow the cells up in culture, and then screen it against 200 or 300 different drugs and predict which drugs will be the most effective based on those kind of in vitro assays. So this is becoming another really big deal. So the whole idea is not to just treat everybody in the same direction, but actually personalize treatment for each patient, and, and particularly at each, at each stage of a disease. Um, 
I'm quite interested in, in things like uh, genetic engineering of human embryos and creation of synthetic organisms. Um, as, as one of the first guys who used human embryos in research and the first actually in the world to be, have a government license to do this. Everybody else was doing this with private money and, and behind closed doors and we actually petitioned the British Parliament to allow us to do this. Um, you know, this is something now where, you know, my colleagues now who I worked with in, in the UK, you know, 20 years ago with human embryonic stem cells, they're now making what are called synthetic embryos. That is, they can basically, just from stem cells alone, no eggs or no sperm, they can get a 14-day embryo, they can grow it to 14 days, and it looks like, in all, except that it's a little bit disorganized, it basically resembles uh, an early-stage embryo. And we're now having a big debate about whether or not to allow people to go beyond the quote-unquote 14-day rule. Um, a lot of people think that they can take embryos to at least day 28, because now, People are starting to figure out how they can uh, create an artificial endometrium, which would allow basically for what happens with implantation and the, the very earliest stages of, um, of, of you know, of, of, for example, of a nervous system forming. And these are with human cells. Now, are these things embryos or are they synthetic embryos? So everybody is up in arms about this. The NIH has got a huge international task force, friends from London sit on this, and they're having huge debates about whether or not to allow this to be funded and whether or not to allow this work to go ahead. Uh, clinical use of artificial gametes. We can make eggs and sperm from embryonic stem cells, okay? And more importantly, I can make an embryonic-like stem cell line from everybody sitting in this room. I can make a cell line from you that I could make any tissue you want from. It costs a lot of money, but it's called induced pluripotency. And in every, any, any, every respect, these resemble quote unquote embryonic stem cells. But now you have your own stem cell line and you can make your own eggs and sperm. So guys, I can make eggs and sperm from you because you have an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. Ladies, unfortunately, I think you can only make eggs so, but you could have your own baby in principle. So again, everybody, you know, I don't dream this stuff up, guys. I mean, this is, people are doing this. We've already made mice from stem cells. We've made eggs and sperm from, you know, pluripotent stem cells from mice, put them together in a dish and made, and made viable mice after who have been implanted in surrogate mums. So, you know, all this technology is moving really, really quickly. And, you know, if, unless you're paying attention, you know, you don't know what's really going to happen with all of this. And that's why we're paying a lot of close attention to this. Okay. Um, and then the other things that I get really excited about is, uh, you know, this really integration of, of bioengineering and biology. And there was, these were projects, these were the six projects that we came up with in my Blue Skies team that we really wanted to pursue. Um, 3D tissue fabrication I'll talk a little bit about, and then I'll talk about machine brain interfaces, because those were the two that we were most excited about. And the, the tissues uh, manufacturing was, was moving very, very quickly when uh, healthcare all of a sudden imploded. And, uh, and as they say, the party was over, and uh, we all had to go. <laughs> so this is really, really pretty simple. Um, this is from Tony Italia's lab, and he just published a paper, I think, last week in Nature, showing that they can, they can print functional skin replacements. And they've tested this in a, in a pig model, uh, where they've made, from pig cells, obviously, they've made uh, functional skin that, when implanted into a wound, uh, basically restores completely uh, healing. And so, you know, the technology is now available. He's taking this to clinical trial. Uh, he's at Wake Forest in, in, in uh, North Carolina and has one of the biggest regenerative medicine labs I've ever seen. Uh, basically, what you do is, uh, you, for the tissue that you're interested in, if you start where it says medical imaging, you basically image the tissue, get the size specificity that you want. So again, this is per patient. You know, you just, if you want to make a heart construct or if you want to make a piece of skin, you just image or, or at least feed this kind of data into a computer-assisted design program, and it tells you how many cells there are, all this kind of stuff. That's the CAD model. And then Tony, this is Tony's printer. He just prints it. He's got inks, which are different cell types, 
and the computer, based on the CAD diagram, knows which cells to put in which spot. And then you basically put it in a reactor of some sort, you grow it up, and you have a functional ear in this case. But this could be, this could be any tissue you want. So this is progressing really, really rapidly because, again, we have all the computer stuff for this. We have the 3D printers. Um, we were really advanced with this at GE, and unfortunately that program, you know, as I said, got shut down, so we, we never actually got as far as Tony has. But uh, I think these guys, their phase one trial, I, I think, will be a big success. This is my last slide. You'll be happy to know. So um, this is amazing stuff. So this, this young chap in, in the scrubs, his name is Eddie Chang. He's a neurosurgeon at, at UCSF who we met numerous times. Um, he really wanted us to help him improve his, his neural arrays that he was using. So Eddie's a neurosurgeon with a, uh, with a clinical interest in patients who have left temporal lobe epilepsy. So they have seizures from their left temporal lobe. Almost all of us, you know, almost all the higher cortical functions that we have, at least in terms of language and cognition, are in the left temporal lobe. So what Eddie does in his patients is he's trying to map out where their seizures are coming from, but at the same time, he's got currently his, his electrode arrays are 1,000, but he's moving to 10,000 soon. Um, he can use only about, a, he only needs about 100 to map out where the seizure area is so that they can microsurgically dissect that area and hopefully get the patients uh, free of seizures or at least significantly reduce them. But the other 900 uh, electrodes, he's recording surrounding tissue. And basically here what he's done is he's figured out, based on the electrical activity which is shown in this big, uh, big uh, plot, uh, he's looking at how the brain is processing sound. So you can see in some regions, let's see if I can get this thing to work again without screwing it up. Where are we? Yeah. So here in, the, in this top bit, these are uh, parts of the brain that are, that are hearing really, really hard consonants like da, ka, ra, pa. And you can see most of the other electrodes are silent or with very, very little activity. And then here is a different place in the brain where the neurons are picking up soft vowel sounds like a, e, o, u. Okay? And so what, what he's done, sorry, folks, whoops. What he's done is basically, this was about, oh, 10 years ago, I guess. And what he's done very recently is they managed to translate this uh, from not, from basically hearing sounds. He's done something very similar in the speech center. And about two to four weeks ago, published a paper in Nature where he has a woman who's completely asphag aphagic. She has no ability to speak because she has advanced motor neuron disease. And basically, with uh, electrodes implanted into her speech area, she basically has learned to think what she wants to say. The computer, uh, the electrodes pick it up. Uh, the computer algorithms convert it into verbal speech. And she has an avatar that speaks in her voice-ish because they were able to kind of come back, film that they had, they managed to create something that sounds like her voice. She basically has an avatar, so she can talk through an external speaker, in, as it were. So what Eddie's you know, real long-term goal is, is, let's say you have a, a stroke and you, you're aphasic because of your stroke, he wants to be able to put a stimulator in a different part of your brain, but basically recreate your speech center in a different part of your brain. So I find, as a neurobiologist, I find this stuff really, really amazing. And the technology now is really advancing. You know, Eddie puts Elon Musk in his neural link to shame because what, what Eddie's doing is really based on 20 years of hard work. We, we were trying to help him build a bigger electrode array because GE does a lot of this micro electro fabrication. But I really think that this is going to revolutionize, you know, neurobiology and particularly nervous system disease. And, uh, another company that I, I consulted for or did the due diligence on is, if you really want to see another thing that's fascinating, there's a company called Onward, uh, which is based out of uh, the EPFL in Lausanne. Uh, and basically what they have is a stimulator that's implanted in the lower spinal cord in patients who ha are basically um, paraplegic below the waist. And even after 12 years of sitting in a chair, uh, a guy, not the only one, has learned how to stand unassisted, and he can walk after 12 years. You know, stem cells will never be able to do that. You know, if we put stem cells in the cord, maybe in the first 10 to 12 days at post-injury, we might get some recovery, 
but Gregoire and his team at EPFL figured out how to do this, and uh, they've published a whole range of papers showing that, you know, and there's, if you look on YouTube, the company's called Onward, and uh, it's, it's quite amazing. But when I saw this, uh, the people who were interested in investing in this, I said, this, if you invest in anything, invest in this. This is just incredibly cool. So, you know, now machines and brains together, um, we're starting to make some impact finally, because in many cases, stroke, uh, motor neuron disease, uh, a whole host of really debilitating nervous system disorders, we have almost nothing to offer patients. So again, this, you know, this is personalized. We're taking your, in this case, taking your particular brainwave activity and converting it into something that's sort of you externally. So with that, I'll stop. And thanks, Martin, again. Thank you very much, Stephen Minger. Um, we are off the time, so we will have just one quick question on Zoom, and then we have pause. Yeah. Uh, so the question goes: What of these these technologies are under prohibition in your EU? Um, I don't know if any. I mean, any any genetic engineering of individuals. I mean. This is, this is where it gets a little bit fuzzy because we used to talk about GMOs, genetically modified organisms, but now we have gene edited organisms or we have gene driver organisms. So the, the EU is having a really hard time deciding what's a, what's, what's a GMO and what's not a GMO, but is gene edited, for example. And this is particularly important in agriculture at the moment and in animals. Um, that's, uh, you can't use, Clinically, you cannot use artificial gametes. So gametes created from cells, that's not allowed. Um, in many cases in the EU, you can't do any embryo research at all. That was always a big problem, but we managed to convince the European uh, Commission that that work could be done in countries where it was permitted. 14-day um, law is pretty universal. It's definitely a law in the UK, but it's, it's pretty much been taken on by all, all the member countries that if they allow embryo research, you cannot go past 14 days. Uh, I think that's it, actually. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much again. We are slowly continuing the conference. So in uh, less than an hour and a half, we have another uh, pause. So we can uh, continue discussion later. Um, but now um, our next speaker is Lu Lucia Vidovicheva from Czech Republic, and he, she'll present us uh, longevity from a sociological point of view. So, Lucia, do we hear each other? Yeah, sorry, it was something. Uh, and I also apologize for not having camera on because my computer uh, is broke, so I'm using the different one, and that's about the role of technology in our uh, in our societies. And I am also um, apologize, and I cannot be with you in person in Ljubljana. I spent some of the best uh, years of my life in Podutik and, and I really, really miss you guys. So I'm uh, sorry to be so far from you. And I uh, want to continue uh, more in line of the arguments that were already presented by um, uh, Alesh and, and connect some of the dots um, that been already mentioned from the sociological point of view. Uh, just uh, briefly about myself, uh, I am a sociologist or social gerontologist at the Master's University in Czech Republic and uh, also have other engagements, but uh, here uh, I am at the Center for Research on Aging, which is a working group of the, the sociological department. So that kind of uh, draws um, or gives you an, an idea where I'm coming from and where my arguments are, are uh, built around. And uh, I'm a big fan of, of our today's topic. And um, I've been there, or I've been following um, anti-aging, longevity, healthy longevity from the beginning when Aubrey was still called a nut or, or uh, a fraud. Um, and now we are in times when uh, people working in the field are called visionaries. And maybe we will up, uh, live up to the time when we see that if they were right. But until then, uh, until these really do happen, I uh, would like to discuss with you or propose you a few really random notes uh, on uh, not so random facts that we live in in the social uh, arenas. And I will start with my actually final slide. 
uh, that I prepared for you because I really want to stop for a moment and think about ways we may need to change a lot of things around us, how they function, if we are up to these all wonderful medical uh, innovations that we also have been already presented here. And uh, I would argue with really, you know, brief and anecdotic evidences that we need to start to socialize or and educate from this very beginning uh, into longer, healthier life prospects. Um, and we need to change our educational system, but also the curricula and what we are teaching about. It was already mentioned in the context of the medical doctors, but not only them. Uh, we need to change how we train ourselves for the labor market that will be probably longer. And we see uh, this in all our societies in Czech Republic, in Slovenia, throughout the Europe and, and uh, global North society is that there is a push to working longer that is kind of also counting with this uh, healthy longevity prospect, but we do actually in, in reality very little to break down this three box model. And the by three box model, I'm referring to the old theory by uh, Matilda White Riley from the 60s of last century when she was you know, pointing out that we have this idea that we live in three box. Uh, first, we educate ourselves, then we work, and then we just retire and have a rest. And this is not longer sustainable model that we, um, again, kind of have in our minds. And one of the arguments I will be making that our minds and our norms and social structures are changing extremely slow. Maybe not even they are just rigid, they are not changing at all, despite the life itself is changing. And we also, therefore, need to kind of reconceptualize how we see the life and how we see um, the life course as such and what are the parts and how, for example, linear it is and how much that is gendered. And we need to uh, look at how we uh, build our attitudes and how uh, or what type of age norms uh, we have. And that goes in line with what I already said, especially the informal age norms. When is the best time things should happen how many times we have for some um, uh, events that should take place in our life, the kind of thing we, sh we should have, it's just rigid, it's not changing at all, despite our actual behavior is moving on. And uh, I would like to also show a little bit about how we have to deal with the normativity that I see so much in the discussions today. Uh, I mean, not today at the conference, but in general, when we talk about longevity, healthy longevity, uh, that goes into saying that one approach may be, you know, better or more quality than the other one, and how these also need to be kind of re-discussed. Re, uh, re and also, um, I, I'm talking about the fights, and I will be mentioning the concept of war on aging, um, and that also produces armies and different supporters and different groups that may work together, but also may work against each other. And they also may produce different type of supporters. And this is something, again, which is not in the society, um, randomly distributed. There are specific social and economic and socioeconomic characteristics that these supporters have. And this is, is this something that we can, kind of want to have? The underlying concept that brought me into this thinking is how complex and how broad our topics are. What type of inequalities there are present in all these different talks? How, what are the norms and the normativities and what divisions our noble goal is actually bringing with it? So let me start uh, again, as I said, very, uh, it's not scientific, it's, it's just what it is in life. And these are working sheets that I took from my kids, um, um, you know, schools, uh, and they are showing uh, the timelines of our life. And you can see that this is uh, the, the left bottom, it's ending in 80. And this this is my colleague kid. And she said, well, she has a grand grandmother that takes care of her very regularly, but she didn't have any place to put her, put her on this timeline uh, when she was 82. The other one, you know, showing how um, not only using this very unfortunate, um, I love the autumn, I love the fall, but you know, the falling leaves that are leaving our minds is something that is typical uh, picture of aging. And, and you can see this using um, these only four boxes, like there are two phases of, of younger age and then we work and there's just one phase in our aging. 
it, it keeps repeating in different variations how we are thinking about our life being quite short and being, you know, not very colorful and not having all these different aspects, resulting in that we are have very strong. Um, at least, and these are, of course, data. I should mention it that are coming from the surveys for uh, from um, uh, check, uh, representative samples in our uh, adult uh, population. And we ask, I'm sorry about the check labels there, but the, the blue line is showing when we ask people about average um, end of youth. And you can see a slight change uh, there depending on the age of respondents and the uh, defined beginning of old age. And this is, uh, despite these data being from 2012, I'm showing you either going backwards or forward uh, with these uh, questions in our uh, surveys, we get always the same uh, ideas. But also you can kind of see here that I'm playing with the timeline here. I'm showing the, these figures from 30 to 70. But if we look at it, then we have very kind of narrow, about 19 year uh, phase in life in our minds that something should be happening uh, other than that is just outside of it. And this is uh, again from the survey uh, looking at the age norms. We were asking respondents what they think would be the ideal um, uh, age for, for some things that are happening, like ending study, starting to work, get married, have a first child, have a last child, um, be on the top of uh, a working life and retire. And again, the first lines that are differentiated for uh, men and for women, uh, they are from 2007. The other ones are um, what, 12 or 13 years later, and they didn't change at all. And these very uh, you know, strong ideas that the, the life as it is, as we know it should be happening in this kind of narrow uh, area, what are we going to do with everything that's above that, right? What roles and what programs we have for the 60 plus or 100 plus, And what are we going to fill this time with? And this is not, uh, of course, it, we may discuss if this is a, a, a question for, for people working on longevity, uh, healthy longevity, but this is something that may go uh, in opposition uh, why we are not seeing more support because we just don't know what we are going to do with it. The next area I want to say that where the structures are extremely unprepared. And this also, I've already mentioned the labor market. Um, our uh, typical um, you know, working uh, life course would be starting right after school or maybe slightly combining with the school and then working until the uh, statutory retirement age, preferably some years before that and drop out from the labor market. And then they realize, oh, I, I wanted to go out from the labor market, but now I miss it. But this is not how we can go on if we will actually achieve longer lives and how var more variant there will be. Of course, some would argue that this um, straight line of uh, or also three boxes are something that again is typical for male's life and uh, female life courses are much more uh, colorful and much more uh, abrupt. And maybe this is something we should be thinking also in terms of uh, longevity how many, how are we going to embrace and welcome these career changes, uh, these career breaks, and maybe just, you know, even working shorter time, shorter, uh, shorter um, hours and or days. Um, and this is something that so far we don't see embraced at all. If you want to stop your career and, and, and do something else, this will not be welcomed and you will be treated with a huge amount of age discrimination when you want to re-enter the labor market. So that's something that has to change. And there are other systems in the society that are not prepared. You may have heard about this um, gentleman who was uh, trying to uh, go to the court, not try, he went to the court and he was asking to change his uh, age into 20 years younger because his biological age was already also mentioned, was and was expert, expertly proven to be younger than he, his chronological age. And his argument is if we have a system that could change our gender or sex based on uh, how we feel, we should have this opportunity also in terms of age. He didn't want this because um, that would be quite interesting precedent. But always with the students also, when I discuss that, we kind of go into, again, what are the complexities and problems, uh, quote unquote, 
can this change mean and how we are going to treat it? What are we in a position to, to uh, treat the biological age as more important than the chronological one? And if yes, what? how are we going to deal so, so uh, in the consequences? So the structures are not there to, to get us uh, into destination. Another important topic that I want to mention is the inequalities one. Um, and I am aware that I'm kind of, um, for the purpose of the presentation, treating healthy longevity, longevity, and anti-aging as kind of the same um, concept, which of course are not, but again, from the standpoint of lay actors within the societies, they are pretty close. And if you look at these figures, uh, you would find out that um, only, uh, despite 90% of um, clients of anti-aging uh, procedures, uh, especially within the uh, within the uh, cosmetic procedures or plus the plus um, sorry the, uh, surgical surgical anti-aging um 90 percent of clients are women but only 20 percent of the medical doctors who are doing these procedures are women and there's a huge discrepancy at least 17 under 17 is nothing to do with the forbes lips forbes lips but uh, there's a 17 percent of breast augmentation uh procedures done in girls uh, younger than 17. And this is something to do very much with the profound kind of combination of youthful and um, beauty um, norms that we that are uh, many times going together and are presented as something that actually kind of uh, coincides and how this is uh, affecting different uses. And I believe uh, I'm not the first one mentioning a female. I know the only audience was this mention about being the, the oldest uh, female marathon runner. And this, this is kind of, again, I was happy at least one, one time uh, uh, the, the gender was mentioned because it is important. If you look at the so-called pin text, this is something, again, from the gender studies showing that, uh, um, you know, many products for female are much uh, more expensive. And this is the same case, for example, from the for the um, uh, anti-aging uh, cosmetic uh, products, which use very different, more, you know, subtle names, uh, uh, and they have specific age brackets. While if you look at the same product uh, for men, they use very different uh, labels, and they are much, much cheaper. So uh, this, this, um, uh, and of course, people kind of may notice that and may wonder why this is happening, why this is so so different. And it also reflects in, in how people feel about it. And this uh, comes from, um, it's a big, uh, big uh, survey uh, in short share uh, on health and retirement in Europe, uh, specific um, uh, questions about you know, uh, anti-aging procedures. And um, if you look at, just, and these are 50 plus uh, the respondents, so that's important to know. You can again uh, see how big there's a difference in how women feel kind of obliged or or they go more for, or are more open, whatever you want to frame it, are more open for um, this anti-aging because they are targeted and because they are more required to look younger and youthful. And uh, in the um, and that kind of briefly to, to bridge to the next topic as well is if we ask them what um, if you were undergoing such procedure um, what would be the strongest influence and again in in gender differences you can see how much um, uh, more often uh, women are kind of um, influenced but by those around them so so the social social pressure also kind of this this uh quasi uh, inside feeling that i need to kind of reinvent. when this is something that is expected that we also know from other research that uh women that are perceived younger and more beautiful have higher um salaries so it really pays off in this case but also the power uh, of um medical uh, expertise and this is something, again, uh, the ethical questions we were mentioning. I'm sorry, I'm really um, going quite quickly through this, but I'm happy also to share the papers that, that we wrote about it. But um, I just want to also uh, uh, mention this kind of strange division there, or yeah, it's a division within the society, uh, which we call never right. Whatever you do, you will find an opposition. 
And if you don't take care of your stuff, there will be the storm. Wow, this, this is, these are excerpts from some of the uh, uh, materials that we were looking while researching this, this topic. And they would say, you know, she, she doesn't take care of herself. Um, she's really neglecting it. But on the other hand, if you uh, if the signs of anti-aging, of you using anti-aging, if you don't look your age as expected, you would be called fake. And the same goes for the medical pro profession. You know, on some uh, on one side, they are seen as as the celebrities, as somebody who is very rich and who is really uh, is is um, you know a very has a prominent uh, um, position within the societal structure. And on the other hand, there will be question that they may they are not even like doctors because they are doing something that is not saving life. I know this is more into anti aging and and the cosmetic field, but it's just showing how um you know how complex again the, the standpoint of the society is and if we are trying to break through with our message this may stand in the way the next uh topic that i wanna wanna show is uh again uh from the representative sample in the in the Czech society that there are very um kind of prominent two approaches to the aging and we know this also from Aubrey the Great is this uh, uh, pro-aging trend, and and I also uh, label this like anti-aging trends. On the opposite side, if we are so so much uh, inclined to accept aging and so much to go, um, you know, fighting the aging, this could be two sides of the of the same coin. Uh, but you could see in this in this table that you know people really would opt for um, defining aging as a natural thing that is just given and nothing to be messed with, or it's just, as, you know, it is there and, and it's nothing more, nothing less. And there uh, are very low support for this very positive approaches that this is crowned and, and reward for long life uh, and very little kind of um, uh, support for the statements that it's an enemy or is a disease that we should cure. And of course, it would be kind of nicely to see this uh, also uh, done long, uh, in, in the long uh, you know, to have a comparison. But interestingly, when I put these different um, labels together and, and uh, look at them, how they are distributed in different age groups, there is almost, I mean, there's no difference um, that, that would kind of say that it is a specific of uh, age. And that was quite intriguing. So if it's not a problem of age, what discriminates um, within these results? If it's um, you know, uh, there must be something that there are, um, that the groups are differentiated uh, uh, in the support. So we use this, and I'm sorry, it's a very complicated question, but the one uh, the, the one we were asking about uh, approvals, uh, the first post statement that scientists are currently discussing the possibility of extending human life beyond its normal limit in various ways that we could live more than 100 or 120 years in the future. Number of possible treatments and procedures are also currently being tested. To what extent do you approve of such efforts? And this is one of the variables I will be showing. And the other question that we were asking our respondents, regardless of the possibilities of actually extending life in the future, some people are already trying to use different ways to look and feel younger. To what extent do you approve of such efforts in, in people? And let me show the, the like broad results to, to these two questions. Um, the the green uh, uh, part of the chart are showing the approval. Uh, the um, yellow uh, part of the charts are showing disapproval, and the blue one are saying you know no approval, no disapproval. And these are the blue. Uh, it's not blue zones, but the blue parts of the chart are this more strong. There, there's very um, again, showing the complexities and less and, and not enough knowledge within the society about actually what to think about it. But if we compare just uh, the other parts that are left uh, again, you can see that there's a quite um, a number of approval for um, like individual efforts to, to keep younger and look younger. But there is a quite um, big disapprovement of these uh, expert um, approaches. But this may be saying more about our this belief in science that we also see on the rise within the society than in a in a life extension aspect. But again, these are not randomly distributed in the society. If people define their aging in some way, they will be more prone to choose 
um, to support, for example, the life extension uh, effort if they have these what I call uh, uh, anti-aging trends, if they are more into you know refusing to age, and if they will be more treating aging as something natural, they will of course go again, even go against uh, the the life extension um, by experts, even uh, also in the just um, uh, you know individual efforts. And this has also something to do with uh, with age. This uh, disapproval is more uh, pronounced in the older age groups while this um, uh, trying to look youthful has stronger support in the middle age group. There is a difference for um, between men and women. Men tend to kind of approve a little bit more um, the expert uh, efforts while uh, they are you know, a little bit careless about the individual efforts while female uh, uh, women will be more uh, supporting this um, trying to look uh, younger. And this will be especially women that are uh, single, that are divorced, that are cohabitating, that are not have not a kind of secure uh, partner, which is already showing how this is uh, pretty much uh, again not not random, but it has some uh, structures behind it. And uh, it is more um, approved with uh, in the people with a higher education and with higher income and also in some specific um, uh, um, employment uh, statuses, this, especially the ones that are kind of uh, in, on the front line, so to speak, and, and uh, engaging with other people. So to, to what, what these graphs are showing us that less educated people with lower income in smaller settlements, which are show in the graph, are more likely to reject life, uh, expert life extensions and that's, um, I would say these groups are typical suspects in debates on social exclusion, and that's something that we should uh, look more closely at. On the other hand, uh, people in higher and middle age, um, female, especially younger, without a partner, divorced, cohabitating, uh, with higher but not the highest income in larger cities, are more prone to attitudes that justify personal anti-aging strategies. And these are, again, common targets of marketing com campaigns. So we can see that the companies are actually probably effective, but they are very selective in what they do and who they approach. And the um, so uh, that, that leads me to the uh, issue of or question of who are actually supporters in many ways. And and I've seen uh, and I've already shown how how uh, what social economic and social demographic characteristics are related to that. But there's also uh, this very intriguing new paper. Uh, by uh, an author published in a journal of population aging, and um, she's uh, uh, proving that you know certain political stance can also kind of predetermine you to having support for um, you know anti-aging, uh, and um, she has variables, uh, different variables that she uses. So so um, again, we are not working with the random. Uh, um, um, effects and we should we should be uh, kind of debating what that leads us in. And to um, kind of coming to the closure of of the talk is is um, my question: If we are still at war with aging as such, is is this something that motivates us? And um, this again, very old paper right now by John Vincent, um, a very dear colleague of mine, a gerontologist, and he. He kind of uh, debates this that you know there are these four armies that are fighting the war um, uh, with aging, and, and I'm aware that you know using the war uh, imagery, uh, especially in these days with what's going on in countries around us, is uh, scary. Um, but this this is um, you know just showing that, or, or just I'm proposing is that fighting aging and what aging brings may uh, be kind of double this war than could be kind of dangerous in a way uh, because it, it's so borderline with ageism and ageism let me remind you is how we think feel and act towards others and ourselves based on age and and uh, despite you know people suffering from ageism in all ages it's much more pronounced in in later life and if you and it was already mentioned today this great name of becca levy and also others if we want to um live longer there's one way to do it as well that, that is fight ageism because 
Um, she has proven in her uh, research that having negative attitudes towards aging actually shortens your life. So um, this is uh, something also to kind of bear in mind that um, these um, may help us to, to fight this fight, so to speak, a bit more um, uh, in liberation. Uh, I, I'm uh, sure you are aware uh, of these pictures that kind of trying to provide um, the, the, the diversity of approaches and uh, how we should treat it. And I added also this little note um, about uh, humans doing the hard job on minimum wage while the robots write poetry and paint is not the future I wanted. So again, uh, to keep us going back to the arguments of, of um, how equal and or how, how liberate uh, the approaches or the result of our uh, attempts or how they are uh, available and how, if they will be uh, bringing the results that we would like to have in the, in the uh, uh, equal and uh, equity society. So I'm going back to the, my first questions. I've just really uh, showed some of the brief remarks, but uh, I want to you know, engage in, in the debate if it's, it would be enough to change the marketing and how we talk about health and longevity, if this, and again, Alex was talking about it, this, this, uh, a slightly change of dictionary and wording we are using, or we need a, a, a really paradigmatic change in how we approach research, teach, talk about, uh, or sell and support the, this, uh, so to speak, cause. And uh, it may not be easy task if we look at the complexity uh, that is uh, right now in uh, uh, going on in the field and how many players there are, and they should probably act more um, unisono on, on this field and being aware within which societal values they are operating. So uh, I'm happy uh, for any of your comments or questions and uh, uh, please you can also engage in you know, creation whatever is comfortable for you. Thank you. Thank you very much Lucia Vidovicheva. <laughs> so we are off the time so one really quick question is there is some otherwise uh, we continue. Yeah. Uh, do you do you think that this um, marketing uh, is actually hurting the scientists who are working uh, on actual <laughs> actual prolonging life? Uh, you know, these de aging uh, products are making these two camps even more divided. Yeah, I'm afraid they are bringing, they are one of the lines of division. They are not the only one, but we have still bigger, bigger and bigger polarization within the societies. And there are, uh, they may be seen as, as, as elitist, uh, as something that's only for the rich and something that will never be available to everybody, regardless of all the arguments you may use. Uh, so so um, this is something, they are being seen as something that's very on the top and unreachable. and. This is not for me. They are not talking by the language of, of my people, right? Uh, so if the if want to call is hurtful, I would. Um, but yeah, it could be a debate for you on. Thank you very much. So um, our next speaker um, is Peter Schramek. Yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, so let um, me share my screen. Yes. And Peter, um, we kindly ask you to maybe be a little faster because our next speaker who starts at uh, 15 minutes past um, uh, five, yeah, five uh, or little, he, he is not so flexible with time because he has some other things. So if you can please make it a little bit faster if this is possible. Sure, absolutely. Um, okay. So. Uh, Let's go in. So first of all, uh, let me quickly introduce myself. So I'm a managing partner of Longevity Tech Fund and um, CEO of a couple of companies, uh, including Health and Longevity Clinic. And uh, basically the mission, my mission, personal mission is to improve um, health and uh, what we call it, uh, expand health span. You know, I would like to, uh, spend a little bit of time on explanation what we mean by expansion of health span. Uh, you maybe heard uh, some other explanation already during this uh, uh, excellent conference, but uh, um, in, sim in simple, it's an expansion of the 
of the part of the life when we live in uh, health and, and uh, we are not limited by uh, in our activities by physical or mental limitations, right? So uh, that's this is why we call it expansion. It's not a prolongation of the lifespan, you know, at the end, because it's mostly uh, bad, uh, wrongly understood by the, you know, the, the, the public that uh, uh, we want people to live longer, you know, in, in, as they are old and, you know, limited, but this is what we don't want to do, right? We want to expand health span, which actually begins in, in a, you know, in a young age. So it's, it's relevant for even uh, at the time of, uh, you know, when we are born, because uh, the planning for, for children actually, actually influence heavily uh, how uh, fast we age. Uh, that's really the scientific, um, there is a scientific explanation for that. But uh, let me also uh, quickly address or maybe explain the magnitude of the problem and the opportunity here. So, you know, and you heard about the aging population, it's a global global problem. So number of 65 years old people exceeded the number of five years old uh, for the first time in the human history, uh, which eventually will lead into healthcare systems and pension systems collapse. Why? Well, because, you know, the, the expand, uh, you know, the expenses or the, expenditures of these systems um, are higher for persons when it's in a higher age you know when when they are if you are older or basically the healthcare costs are accumulated uh, during the last 10 or 15 years of our lives so that's a kind of an exponential curve uh, but if you consider demographic uh, development we are getting more older people so that means that there are there is a another curve, maybe not the exponential, but there are some like waves in population, uh, uh, population, it's, it's not linear, right? But these two curves are multiplying itself. So it will lead to multiplying the, the, the expen uh, expected cost of our healthcare and pension systems, not in the far future, but actually some somewhere within the next five to 10 years. So it's a very close, it's not, the, it's not just, just a danger, right? it's a fact. Uh, so we will not be able to sustain the current level of, of care. Uh, uh, we don't do anything with that. And this is why we are promoting this health span expansion. Um, and uh, I would remind you about the publication uh, from last year by David Sinclair and Professor Andrew Scott. Uh, they actually calculated the economical benefits uh, coming from expanding health span by 10 years just in the US population. And I, I, I want to mention that that's something actually possible already today. We can really expand the health plan by 10 years, you know, by various modification of lifestyle and all of that, all of that stuff, but that, that's reality. So if we manage to do that in an average population in the US, the economical benefits coming from savings and additional, you know, increasing the productivity and activity of, of the population will lead to 367, um, you know, the European billions of US, US dollars. So that's a tremendous number. Um, so the problem is, is, is framed and uh, there are many institutions talking about uh, uh, these problems, many renowned institutions like, you know, Deloitte and various uh, analytic groups. I, I, I like uh, McKinsey Health Institutes. I strongly recommend to read some of their analytic reports because they are clearly and very, very nicely explaining the, the problem um, of, uh, of uh, this aging. So we, uh, as a longevity tech group, and I would like to um, present that uh, the longevity tech fund originally started as a as an investment fund but uh, the group is actually much much broader we are really working on expanding health span um, and first of all this is thanks to our uh, support to number of uh, 40 more than 43 uh, startups uh, companies uh, mostly from the US and, and UK uh, with various solutions across diagnostics you know how to measure our aging therapeutics, how to influence and, and slow down the, the rate of aging, 
or even reverse in some aspects or other enabling technologies. And um, uh, I would like to give you a couple of examples of these companies so you will get a better understanding what's actually possible or will be possible within the next uh, two, maybe three years. So the first company um, I would like to uh, explain is a company called Genflow Bioscientists. They are from UK and Belgium. Um, and they are, uh, they have a, uh, they are working on a specific technology for uh, using a so-called certain six genes, which are secreting certain six proteins responsible for DNA repair. You know, DNA is undergoing constant damage. Uh, you know, there, there could be like a radiation damage, there could be a, a damage from infection disease, and it's all accumulating over the over the life, and there is a natural defense, the, the cell defense, how to repair this damage by using these certain six proteins. But obviously that capability goes down as we age and the accumulation of the damage goes up as we age. So at some point it's just not sustainable, right? So the company is working on a way how to use the specific variant of that certain six coming or found in the centenarians and uh, import that copies of the gene into our cells. It's not a gene modification. It's not going to be integrated with our genome. It's not replicated, but it's just improving the cell capability to repair. And uh, they're already starting clinical trials uh, early next year. So I know the, you know, on experiments, we see really tremendous effects on our health. The next company is uh, called Mitrix, um, and that company is working on a way how to improve our mitochondria function. You know, the mitochondria is responsible for energy and basically supplying by energy everything happening in our in our in our bodies. And so, if we even you know uh, deploy more certain things, uh, we still lack the energy because the mitochondria production activity is declining again as we age. Um, so we can do some small improvements or we can obviously we exercise, we are training our mitochondria uh, to boost or maybe divide. But again, there is a there is a damage and there are some other things uh, uh, in decline. So the company is working on a way how to uh, use compatible uh, haplotype mitochondria, grow them into uh, in, uh, in, a, in them in the bioreactor and infuse them uh, to individuals, which is specifically very important, especially in case some like a life threatening events like sepsis, or especially in the older, like a higher higher age. So it could boost the energy of the organism, which is in combination with some other treatments, can give us, you know, the, the expected is something like 20 years, right? So if you if you if you can do this in a repeat way, so that could really uh, boost our capability, both body capabilities to uh, to deal with uh, most of the problems uh, we are facing as we are age and give us back our activity and and uh, 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 disable our limitations. The next company, uh, the example is a company called Seniska. The company is from UK. Um, and this company actually, uh, they're looking at the uh, so-called senescent cells. You know, senescent cells are something, you know, understood like a bad cells, like cells who are not functioning anymore. And they are maybe source of the cancer cells in the future and, and so on. But uh, it turns out that the uh, simple way, you know, to get rid of all the senescent cells by some senolytic treatments is not maybe the best way because uh, uh, especially all the people, they have like a huge amount of senescent cells and they, some senescent cells actually have some function in our, in our bodies. So this company has a, has a different approach. So they are looking into specific stages of senescent cells so because they are not just one type. Uh, there are several stages, how these senescent cells are, are uh, you know, uh, behaving and they can reverse their state from the first two stages back to the normal cells. So there's an amazing technology. Again, they demonstrated that they can actually treat 
uh, several age-related diseases by this, this effect. So they use the specific oligonucleotide uh, you know, compound uh, to do to do that. So well, we may we are may we are may looking for like three years into the clinical trials, but uh, that could be like a super good uh, uh, message or uh, information for all the all the people. The next company, it's a US-based uh, 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 rejuvenation technologies. Uh, they are working on a way, uh, you know, how to ex extend all telomeres. I suppose that most of you know that telomeres are some like a, you know, this uh, security uh, uh, ends of or chromosomes. Uh, and uh, sometimes uh, it's believed that uh, it cannot be prolonged too much because it could, uh, uh, creates the, the possibility of cancer. But uh, this company is working on a way how to using the mRNA uh, technique, you know, like with uh, uh, in, in COVID vaccine uh, to uh, expand or extend these telomeres uh, to the right length for, in the right cells, right? So to make it, make it, make it better, make it like a little young. Um, and they already found that uh, it works pretty good. And they are, for example, able to reverse uh, pul pulmonary fibrosis uh, or several other problems. But the most important thing is that uh, the effect uh, is super quick. So they can reverse the, you know, the full length of telomeres within hours by application of that, that uh, their solution. So again, uh, extremely important technology which together with other technologies can lead into the, you know, really uh, uh, reversing the, the old uh, or old phenotype. The next company is, uh, that's a, it's, a, the, the, it's called, in, uh, the company name is Maxwell Biosciences. And this company is a little bit different than others because they are focusing on, on um, uh, or defense uh, from uh, infection disease. Um, and you may be surprised, but the infection disease like bac viral, bacterial, or fungi, uh, it's not without cost. So we, we may see, okay, we got this virus, then we, we treat the virus, and they are, we are like before. And that's not true because every infection is damaging our bodies and having some long-term consequences. You remember long COVID is like a, you know, the, the highlight, but we're actually uh, getting damage from every disease or every infection, even these we don't know about uh, because they are maybe, you know, not identified. And this company actually developed a special new technology supported by DARPA uh, based on something they called, uh, they called um, uh, uh, peptoid, uh, um, synthetic peptoid, which is a compound uh, packed into something like a vehicle uh, which can damage the membrane of uh, specific virus or bacteria or fungi, I mean, the class of viruses. So, for example, they are able to, dem to destroy all the coronaviruses at once or all the bacteria of specific kind or some fungi, right? So it's like a super duper replacement of antibiotics or antibiotics uh, they already demonstrated uh, a huge effect on various things, including Ebola on, and that stuff. You know, you may, if, you, if we are talking about fungi, you may you may uh, remember uh, the the movie or the series Last The Last of Us. So this company actually have a cure for that potential fungi infection, right? So that's amazing, amazing, uh, uh, and this is what we need really uh, for. Uh, or longevity because uh, we need to we want to prevent uh, this disease to damage or or bodies. So this uh, this was a couple of examples from our portfolio, but that uh, we are also not just investing, but they are also uh, building uh, new companies from scratch, where we see that they are missing on the you know in the in the overall overall solution. And what we found that uh, there is actually a missing ecosystem of companies supporting this uh, early scientific translation of these excellent technologies into uh, products 
eventually leading to uh, democratization to the of these products. You know, uh, you need to put that this you know to build this chain of of uh, starting with like a expensive uh, specialized technology going through. Uh, through through the path of of of, of uh, making it in, in a high volume and uh, making a, a cheaper and eventually you know uh, giving access to to the all population all worldwide population so it's why we we uh, started building uh, these companies uh, the first company is called Health Longevity Clinic it's actually already uh, working for three years and the clinic is responsible for you know, this uh, top of, I call it top of the pyramid solutions where we are working closely with all portfolio companies and other scientific groups on how to translate these technologies into personalized solutions. So we are really researching the ways how to combine diagnostics and solutions and uh, give it a maximum effect, uh, but uh, also efficient effect, you know, uh, the normal People will not undergo like you know expensive expensive uh, uh, procedures or therapies. They need simple solution. So we are we are really researching the ways how to do it very efficiently. And the clinic already got uh, four hundred clients. Uh, all of them are part of the clinical trials. We are working on more clinical trials, and we we have clinics in, in Europe, in one in Prague, one in Florida, and there is a clinical uh, uh, trial center in the. In the Bahamas, where we are actually speeding up this clinical translation, because the current issue of uh, or field is that aging is not recognized as a disease, so it is really hard to get something for aging approved. So you need to have a proxy disease, right? Something age-related, but then it's get approved for that disease, not for a, like a general aging. So we are working on various ways how to improve and maybe speed up that translation and provide or population with these solutions. Um, yeah, and the, the, the second company I would like to mention is called Health Synergy Cafe, which is exactly the way how we are trying to, to democratize uh, the access to these personalized solutions. It's not as, you know, cutting edge as in the clinic, but uh, still uh, the cafe is a, like a some uh, place it's actually in Prague. The first unit is in Prague, where you can come in, you can get get tested, you can get the personalized recommendations, and uh, we will test your obviously DNA, uh, biological age, DNA methylation, various blood biomarkers, some phys uh, uh, physical parameters, and you will get recommendations or solutions. How what you can do, you know, within like a limited budget. To improve your health or keep your health at some like a good, uh, good level, and we want to expand uh, these companies over the period of next five years. So, uh, especially with the clinic, uh, we are working on opening the maybe the largest integrated longevity center in the world uh, around the year twenty five. Uh, it's uh, will be, it will be in Miami, but obviously we want to expand uh, around the globe and make it available in other countries by working with partners. So we want to empower other clinics or other uh, medical groups uh, to use their technologies or solutions. And with the cafe, uh, the aim, you know, we are still at the, at the beginning with one place and you can see the picture on the top. This is the real place in Prague, uh, but uh, we want to expand uh, really to the significant size, again, using the franchise model, um, make these solutions available uh, to many people around the, around the world. So um, the last slide, uh, that's all maybe sound good, but uh, we still need a lot of uh, work to be done. Uh, we need more products and more solutions because the problem of the aging is, uh, is very complex. And uh, this is why Longevity Tech Fund is uh, continuously investing into new companies, uh, new solutions. So we expect to have uh, maybe 30 or 40 more companies in our, in our portfolio. Um, we are working on uh, the, the way how we, how we uh, have this research with uh, like a more uh, uh, 
advanced uh, biomarker evaluation uh, data platform because you know that's again it's extremely complex thing and uh, uh, that needs to be supported by different type of systems that the current healthcare systems are are uh, working with. Uh, there is a there is a, a lot of uh, problems with uh, you know the product log logistic because currently it's really hard from someone like from from Slovenia to get access to some products uh, for example on US market or uh, in the US for, for um, uh, to access to access some products from from Europe uh, because of regulation because some some other complications so we are working on solutions uh, again in the in the uh, in the in the target of targeting the the democratization of these products, and obviously we need more science breakthroughs uh, because there is a there is a tremendous amount of scientific knowledge and and actually some some uh, solutions uh, which are not uh, expanding over the labs. They are just uh, you know when they they are research. Uh, they are stay they stay in the labs that they are not translated into into real products and helping products. So we are working on some kind of an incubator uh, how to support this science translation. So this is what we do and a very short uh, overview of our of our portfolio. Obviously, forty three companies uh, contains a lot more, but the, my main message was that you know the 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 problem is huge. Uh, the opportunity is here and it lies in, in these solutions and we all need to work together. And the working together meaning the, the connection of the science, but obviously the awareness of the population because if we not get the awareness and knowledge that, that aging interventions are possible. And, you know, I'm not talking about the the visual aging, you know, the, the cosmetics, and that's I'm really uh, talking about the, the real uh, 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 processes in our, in our bodies and slowing the rate of our aging. So people need to know that that's possible and that's our goal. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter Shamek. And we have time for one question. So first from the audience, someone? No, um, on the Zoom, someone has a question? Yeah. There is a question on Zoom. It says, uh, happy hello to everyone. In the moment, we all have access to a large number of specific solutions to longevity problems. I believe we've reached full pool of decentralized answers. There are companies where they offer many solutions in one, but is there any entity, official or unofficial, that puts all the uh, absolute number of cases in a centralized solution applicable in practice and what this holistic approach in theory of longevity would be? Well, that's that's a good uh, question. And uh, actually, the answer is exactly what uh, the Health Synergy Clinic is responsible for. You know, that's exactly this holistic approach because every company uh, we know, not just the ones we invested in, is focused on something specific, you know, the senescent cells or certain six or whatever else. It's like a tense and or maybe hundreds of various aspects of aging, but nobody's uh, taking care about how to consolidate it together. And this is the this is why we we uh, established the Health and Longevity Clinic, you know, because the clinic can measure basically everything available, all the available biomarkers, and then combine various aspects on so-called longevity roadmap. You know, it's like a uh, plan what to do at what time and in what combination in order to achieve the best effects on improving our biomarkers. So the approach is to improve the biomarkers of aging, which eventually lead into that better state, right? So we see, actually the results we see for, for the past two years um, in terms of the, like a biological age, and we know that it's a very simplified biomarker, are something between five to 15 years of reduction. This is really what we see uh, based on these combined applications. And this is still 
before we can apply these more advanced therapies, which I've been showing uh, will be coming within the next two or three years. There is another short question. Uh, is the Longevity Cafe in Prague existing or is it just a project? No, it exists. Uh, it's, uh, it was open a year ago, one year ago. Um, and, uh, you know, you can, you can come and visit and uh, you can obviously get your diagnostics, but you can also get uh, uh, very fresh and healthy food and some educations. And we are tending to be a, the cafe tending to be a kind of a longevity hub or educational hub in Prague. Uh, including some small conferences and, and meetups and, and, and presentations. Okay, thank you very much, Peter Samek. Thank you for great lecture. And uh, now we move to the next speaker, uh, Didier Cornell. Okay, so yeah, I will speak about uh, how to better share and use health data and speak especially about uh, the situation in uh, Europe uh, and also a few uh, projects concerning uh, um, artificial uh, intelligence. But first, uh, a few facts uh, about longevity, even if most of you know about this uh, already. Also, always been good to remember that uh, today, like every day, about 120,000 people will die of old age, and uh, uh, it is the first cause of death in the world, about 70%, uh, even in the poorest countries and in countries like uh, Slovenia, Belgium, uh, my country. Uh, in uh, other European countries, it's 90% uh, of deaths uh, are caused by aging. These uh, are the main causes of uh, death uh, everywhere in the world, uh, so aging or not uh, aging. So, And the, ma the main causes of death uh, um, for people aging are the three uh, classical one, cardiovascular diseases, where the mortality is decreasing uh, about uh, 50 percent uh, uh, the last uh, uh, 30 years in countries like uh, uh, Belgium, France and uh, Euro other European countries uh, uh, for the same age. Uh, cancers is decreasing about 1% a year, and neurodegenerative diseases, there we uh, progress concerning what we understand, but we don't progress really concerning uh, curing. But the elephant in the room is the fact that when people uh, have diseases, the probability to die of it, or, um, or, even, or even if they fall, the probability to die of all causes of diseases, all accidents, is higher when you get old. So aging is killing us in many ways. Maximal lifespan is not uh, going up lately, uh, contrary to what many longevityists uh, will tell you, sadly. Uh, so, the first person who ever reached uh, the age of 100 years was uh, probably Terence Young, the window of uh, Cicero, and she died uh, more than 2,000 years ago. Today, the oldest woman in the world is only uh, 116 years, the oldest man in the world 114 years, and this is uh, quite a few years less than Jeanne Calment, who died uh, uh, already uh, more than 25 years ago, when she was 122 years old. There are reasons to be optimistic, but there are also reasons to be pessimistic uh, after the COVID times. So we had, for the first time uh, since World War II, a global decrease of life expectancy at uh, the world level in uh, 2020 and in 2021. And probably also, we don't know yet, uh, but probably also in 2022. So this is very worrying. Uh, for the first time, uh, I would say, maybe in human history, but at least for the first time since uh, more than 70 years, we have kind of a decoupling between a disconnection between technological progress and level of wellness and also life expectancy. 
I took a look at the situation of Slovenia because we are, well, I am virtually, but you are there in uh, Slovenia. So the, the decrease was uh, less bad than in other countries and, you, and it was increasing again uh, already in 2021. I don't have the uh, statistics concerning 2022. So, but uh, yeah, it is still not back to the level of two, uh, before uh, 2020. It is still not back to, to the situation in 2019. There are also reasons to be optimistic. Uh, uh, optimistic. So we learn to work online. Uh, we published more scientific articles than uh, ever, and probably one psychological aspect is with the COVID crisis, life, uh, especially life of old, older people, was uh, never so precious culturally uh, than, uh, than now. And AI is growing very fast, uh, and artificial general intelligence is probably approaching. So this is a hope. This is also a reason to be careful. But that's another story. I think that it is very probably possible to find a treatment against aging within 15 to 30 years, almost certainly, or very probably. But it will be complicated uh, and expensive, at least if we don't have uh, uh, rapidly progressing uh, um, artificial intelligence uh, uh, solving the problem. Now, I will speak about uh, the main theme of, uh, of today for me, facts about uh, big data for health. So big data first, where is the information? It, it has been said that 30% of all uh, data, big data, is health big data. So it's a huge part in the scientific literature, of course, uh, in your smartphone uh, detained by the tech giants and in all uh, institutions re related to uh, medicine, clinics and so on, but also at least in uh, in many European co countries related to social security, since healthcare is uh, uh, often reimbursed. We have in the world uh, something like 350,000 healthcare apps, but we have at the moment zero largely used public space to share personal health data to facilitate medical research. I will come back to this. Most people, uh, when you uh, when you propose them, you, when you propose to most people to uh, share their health data, they agree about that. But at the moment, it's almost not possible. So we have actually enough health data in the world. The problem is not to have uh, uh, health data. The problem is to share health data. We have enough health data to know which human clinical trials should be started immediately, which are the existing drugs who have probably positive effects, but also negative effects. And we have enough to, uh, to uh, have a small longevity progress and to prepare serious breakthroughs. However, the situation, the legal and also the de, the de facto situation in most countries, uh, you can summarize like this. Well, you have actually not the right, but the obligation to share your data with private companies and with public entities if you want to use their services. But these institu institutions will sell the data or make it available only to a few and with many restrictions. So it will slow, the, slow down uh, research. So there is no country uh, with the, tool, uh, the tools who are existing now where you are really allowed to share easily with scientists. And even if you were able to share with scientists, scientists will have problems uh, to use that because of so-called uh, ethical uh, questions and uh, and they will have uh, also prob problems uh, to have their finding uh, findings published because of yeah many uh, legal rules making it possible um, making it very difficult uh, once again to share the data so what could we do for a few open uh, solutions First, what I want to say is that, well, of course, your health data is sensitive, 
but it is less sensitive than your political life, than your sex life, than most of your private life uh, that your bank account. Uh, and it would be even less risky if the health system is public, it's already the case in many countries, uh, and uh, when health data uh, cannot be sold, and I will come back to this. So people are kind of too afraid uh, about their health data or more or even more paradoxic paradoxically they will not have a problem to speak about their disease on uh, facebook uh, TikTok, and i don't know what but they will have problems to share their health data with uh, scientists what i hope and i wish also is that there will be a uh, um, system where there are no not too much patterns not too many patterns and I think, I think that, that uh, it should be it should at be least a general, general principle for work, for scientific work, work when, it when it is made with public money. money. When it is made with public money, it is totally unlogical that it is, uh, after a while, used for private interest and not shared with other scientists. We need a, a world uh, with less patents and, let's say, less uh, privacy to have better sharing of data and also to have better publication of uh, what's sometimes called negative results, because uh, when societies are uh, trying to have a patent, when they have negative results, they have no incentive to, uh, to make uh, information about it, because they will not have a patent. And also, they will also have no incentive to uh, make research outside patentable, patentable fields. So, for example, uh, a drug like metformin. A drug like metformin has, for uh, many people say that metformin has a positive aspect for longevity. Not sure, but that's another discussion. But what is sure, it's very difficult to make um, a real large clinical trial because there is no big pharmaceutical company wanting to test metformin because metformin the patent is uh, already uh, there is no more patent let's say the, the patent is uh, more than uh, uh, 40 or 50 years old okay so we should also uh, constantly remind that like I said already, I say it a second time, that most people are willing to share health data for scientific and medical goals. They are only afraid to share. They are, they are, there is only a big part of the people who are afraid to share for commercial goals. And the famous, for Europeans here, GDPR, General Data Protection of Regulation, and other rules concerning privacy are not above fundamental human rights, but must be compatible with them. You know, there is something like uh, in the, the, the world today, like uh, GDPR, above all, that should not be the situation. Privacy is not above all. Privacy is a human right uh, among other human rights. To share health data, we could uh, ask to private uh, organizations, to international longevity organizations, uh, uh, for example, but I would say be careful because sometimes you have uh, um, people, organizations speaking about open, about sharing, but without real sharing. So, in my opinion, but okay, I suppose others have other opinions, the best thing would be a public organization, and the best public organization uh, that is existing. Uh, uh, at the global level for health is, of course, the WHO, the World Health Organization. But sadly, they don't have uh, projects at the moment uh, uh, to share health data. But there is one European organization who has uh, this uh, beautiful goal, that is the European Health Data Space. And there is even a proposal of regulation since uh, now uh, about 15 months already. So um, there are uh, not, not four, but three great principles uh, for this European health data space, interconnectivity, altruism, and sharing with scientists. And I will, uh, so interconnectivity, that's clear, I suppose. So the fact that uh, it would be possible for all uh, uh, citizens at the uh, Europe, in the European Union to 
have their data, their health data uh, shared with other organizations inside the union, it can be shared with scientists. Uh, it is also uh, clear, of course, it would be after anonymization or pseudonymization, but altruist databases, that's maybe not so clear. So it means that uh, only organizations that, that meet a set of transparency requirement with safeguards uh, are allowed to share their data, uh, are allowed to register to share their data. It means also that uh, uh, the, this kind of organization should be uh, independent of any entity that operates on a for-profit uh, basis, uh, and that they have to focus on the common goal, uh, common good. Uh, so not uh, seeking economic uh, benefits for their stakeholders. Uh, who are engaged in data sharing. Once again, these uh, rules uh, are for me almost, let's say, very good. The biggest problem at the moment is that the progress to make, it, make this a fact is uh, very, very slow. If some of you uh, are involved in some way or know more, so, know more about that, uh, for example, the situation in Slovenia, I'm uh, very interested. Then last uh, thing uh, I want to approach uh, uh, today is, uh, uh, no, 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 not last week. Uh, Okay, last thing before uh, speaking about uh, the trials themselves, uh, we should use uh, artificial intelligence, artificial uh, general intelligence, uh, because it is good for healthy longevity, but also because having a kind of an absolute priority for um, healthy longevity, for resilience, is also a way to diminish uh, risk related to artificial uh, intelligence and also because probably maybe probably AGI will not suffer from uh, what's the psychological reason number one for people not to be uh, enough in favor of research for longevity it is called the terror management theory or the death trance uh, or the mortality salience. The fact that uh, uh, since uh, we know that we are going to die, since uh, there is nothing to escape that uh, at the moment, since it is uh, at the same moment, same time, uh, uh, awful but inescapable, we try not to think about it and so we try not to fight again, against it. We could use uh, uh, open longevity, uh, GPT-like things, and there is already a project uh, um, with, uh, so the, the website uh, is there, so it's a uh, work in uh, progress. So open longevity in the sense of open source, but even more important in the sense of open results. So it should be a system where the uh, people searching uh, uh, accept to share their, uh, what they find. We could have so a chat GPT-like uh, tool with at least a million of scientific articles, but also with massive health data that is already available. And it would be, uh, AGI would be used, well, to, to make research in the data and also for creation of the data, that's a very important uh, problem. Very, uh, uh, and at the moment, curation is slow, intricate, and costly. A few words more about uh, AI for longevity. So for those of who, uh, uh, here who speak French, there is a first discussion about this well, uh, uh, Friday, October 13 at 6 p.m. So send me an email if you are interested. There will be an online conference in December, the date is not uh, sure yet, and there will be a workshop in Utrecht, and very probably uh, Utrecht, uh, Netherlands, and very probably Ibrit uh, during uh, uh, Transvision. It will be an event called Transvision. It will be Friday, January 19, in the afternoon. Now, a few words about what we should do once we have this data, when once we have IDs, uh, uh, so clinical trials for longevity, first I want to say that we have more scientists than ever in the history of humanity, but we have also more bureaucracy than ever. 
This makes uh, situations like uh, to test a new drug in Europe, it's one, or even there are people who say two billions the cost to do that. Uh, and it is primarily due to very heavy regulation. Of course, uh, we should test first on animals before testing on humans in uh, some cases. So these are the uh, most uh, uh, cute animals <laughs> that you can imagine the naked mole rats. Uh, um, yeah, not not really cute, uh, seriously, but okay. Um, the, the the rodent living the longest uh, life of all rodents, and on the uh, right side, uh, not a branchios fuzzeri, the fish living the shortest uh, life of all uh, all but one uh, fish. So we need a, a less bureaucratic and faster system of authorization at the European level or even at the world level or also, and also, of course, the, uh, in the USA. We need uh, uh, double-blind experiments, of course, but of course, but it's not always the case uh, uh, for many uh, clinical trials. So they would they would be. Uh, two or three or even more uh, groups, one group with the best already available treatment and one group with the best already available treatment and the new therapy. And it's important to say that uh, uh, both, that all groups will be in a better situation than uh, ordinary people because they will have a special, they, will, they, they would be uh, special, especially followed by uh, medical doctors to see what is happening and of course it is better for your health uh, to be especially followed in most cases. We need volunteers, old enough, that is uh, important at the moment uh, for many um, clinical trials, it's young people who are taken and not old people. So 70, 80, even 95 for men, even 99 for women well informed enough in good health, but it's relative, of course, when you are so old, interested for themselves and for the community to test uh, on the short uh, term, uh, probably uh, all the products who are there, uh, except the last uh, the gene therapy, because we don't have it uh, yet. And uh, yeah, there are things that we don't know yet and that we will know when we will have uh, enough energy and time and artificial intelligence and open source uh, knowledge. We need also good biomarkers and uh, once again, uh, public uh, results. You have there a short list of uh, biomarkers. At the moment, I don't know why, but it's kind of a fashion to speak about uh, biomarkers. I think that they are uh, yeah, yeah, there are yeah. already enough biomarkers, it's important to combine many of them and of course to measure before the treatment, during the treatment and after the treatment. We need a global uh, project like there was the, 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 the Manhattan Project, the uh, first man on the moon. So when there is really, let's say, a political or a scientific uh, common goal, uh, human beings can progress quite uh, uh, fast. We need, of course, uh, money, uh, money, money. Maybe, uh, maybe to be a bit provocative, we need less startups, less organizations, but more common work. Okay, and I come now to the uh, conclusion. So what we need is in a really a few words, reliable shared big health data, curated with fast clinical tests and with more research, a sense of urgency. And now to summarize it, really everything in one slide, we need to create a system that is trusted by citizens, managed by a public institution or a non-profit organization where by default so opt out it means people who don't want to participate they have to say that they don't want to participate but if they 
uh, it didn't say anything if they are in the system. All health data, all available health data, anonymized or pseudonymized, can be used for scientific, uh, scientific research and not for any other use. The goal is, of course, to start clinical tests, uh, and the, the technical, uh, the clinical tests are, of course, to enable everyone wishing it, wishing it, it's not going to be compulsory to live a radically longer and healthier life. So if you don't have uh, time for questions uh, now, you can write me an uh, email. Uh, if you want to make more for longevity, you can be a member of one of those organizations, but most of you are probably also uh, already members of organizations. And you can uh, read uh, the newsletter, The Dead of Debt, uh, in uh, five languages uh, with a free subscription for the two first centuries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Didier. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, we have time for one question. Do we have an audience one question? Or on Zoom? Um, <laughs> okay, so then I will ask one question. Um, um, Didier, how, how um, close we are to longevity um, uh, GPT? Does it mean like half a year, two years, five years? Um, sorry, I, I, you, you, uh, the, the sound was not perfect. You okay. said how, how long will it take, uh, you think, uh, if everything is going good? Yes, yeah, well, um, if everything is going good, actually, the, the tool that uh, I will put it again in the chat uh, is already existing. Uh, it's not, uh, and it's already, I think, with uh, 50,000 uh, articles. So, so I think it could be, um, it can be used already a bit. And uh, I think uh, if the meetings uh, the next months are successful, uh, it will be really uh, possible to use it uh, yeah, in maximum six months. Wow, that's a great news, Didier. Thank you for your work. Yeah, and I, so yeah. I put the link again in the uh, chat. All right. Okay, thank you again. Um, and now, um, we will have um, um, some posts in the conference, so we start 15 minutes past six. And I also wish, wish to say that we made the photos here, so if, if someone do not want to be on the picture, please let me know uh, about this. So thank you, everyone. Um, see you 15 minutes past six, or better, a few minutes earlier, because we will start on time. Thank you. OK. so. I wrote the book, The Case Against Death, uh, because I was tired of these arguments always in favor of why we have to age and why we have to die. Uh, and so uh, my argument is, is, is quite simple, that life is good and death is bad. And aging is also bad, of course, because apart from the suffering, it also leads to death. So I have always understood this uh, since I was a child. And most people realize that death is a bad thing when they are... Uh, children, but then they forget about it. They learn from society that, in fact, uh, uh, they should accept death. They should accept uh, everything that's natural and, and aging and death is, is, is a part of that. Now, um, some of my friends said, well, this is, a, is, a, is, a, is an obvious thesis. Obviously, death is bad, but it's, it's really not that obvious when you talk to people. They, they usually always try to say, well, death is, is, is bad in some way, but, but here's the reason for you to, to still think that it's okay. Now, so uh, in 2013, there was a, a study of, of 2,000 uh, adults, um, a representative sample, in, in the US uh, about what they think would be an ideal uh, length of their life. And most of them believed that dying before 100 would be ideal. So somewhere between 79 and 100 is where most people uh, 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 thought was the ideal uh, length of, of their life. Only 4% wanted to live longer than 120. And, and so, and, and only 8% wanted to live 
longer than, than 100. So this is supposed to be the ideal uh, length of a life, all right? Now, they asked another question, and that is uh, if they would or would not want medical treatments that slow the aging process and allow the average person to live decades longer to at least 120 years. And now people change their response, and now 38% would want treatments that could allow them to live to at least 120 years. Now, this is strange uh, in, in, in different ways. First of all, it's strange because uh, if 92% uh, in the earlier, at the earlier question said that they thought that the ideal lifespan is less than 100, then why would they all of a sudden want treatments that would allow them to live to at least 120? That doesn't make sense. Now, the explanation here is probably that when you ask people what the ideal lifespan for them would be, they think very much in terms of what's uh, possible now. They think that if they are 90, they're going to be very decrepit and, 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 and life quality would be so low that it's not worth adding more years to their life. So they think very much in terms of the possible now, what's possible now. They don't think really, as the question says, what the ideal would be, right? Now, this is quite strange because if you ask people um, how many traffic accidents should there ideally be in the world every year, uh, they would say zero, even though that is not possible, right? So when it comes to thinking of other things as ideal, people have no problem with that. But when it comes to thinking of life and how long life should be ideally, they think inside the box very much. Now, the second reason that this is a, a, a strange response, I think, is that why only 38%? Why would a majority in this study, 56%, why would they prefer to age and die within the natural lifespan rather than to have a longer youth and a longer life? more health and more life? Why would they want to have less youth, less health, and less life rather than more, right? Why are they in favor of death? That's very, very strange. So there are different studies uh, that have been made on this, and, and I know Martin has, has done studies, and, and they vary, uh, but um, you get a sizable proportion of people who, who really seem to uh, be afraid of the prospect of, of radical life extension. They have a, a resistance uh, to it. Now, uh, if you look at uh, what people think that other people would want, there, most people think that other people would want radical life extension treatments. That's also very, the reason for this uh, is that um, death acceptance is normative. That is, uh, we are supposed to say that we accept death. Uh, it's the standard view. And so I think there is a, it's a, there's an ideology of this. And, and it's an ideology that, that has a long tradition and it schools people into thinking that there is something morally off, that there's something wicked about wishing for extension of this earthly life. Um, and this, uh, this ideology then has been uh, 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 promulgated in, in philosophy, but also in, in, in various stories. Um, so some examples of that is uh, Marcus Aurelius here, who says there's the Stoic, and, and he speaks for all the Stoics here. He says, despise not death, but welcome it, for nature wills it like all else. So we should will it because it's natural, right? And, and of course, the naturalness is something that you always hear when, when you bring up this topic with people. They are afraid that it's not natural, it's against nature. Um, a, a, a contemporary, uh, Leon Cass, is a... a very prominent bioethicist is a 
blessing for every human individual, whether he knows it or not. And in stories, uh, you hear, and here is from uh, Star Wars, uh, the Yoda, who is a, a kind of archetype of, of the wise person, says that death. Excellent. So now, now I have to go really. Now I have to go really to the point. Uh, so, um, uh, so in so much art, and this is also true in 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 Narnia and Harry Potter and and Lord of the Rings and in in recent movies like uh, uh, Doctor Strange and and in in the the first ever recorded story, the Epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, the quest for uh, immortality in the natural world is doomed to failure, and it's something uh, wicked. That's normally the usually the story. There, there, are, there I, I don't know of any any film where where a quest for immortality ends well. Um, so, uh, this is uh, from uh, ChatGPT. Uh, I asked uh, for. Uh, chat gpt to generate a title for my book and i said my book is about the philosophy of death so uh the the, the question was uh the the prompt can you generate a book title uh, and i say a popular philosophy book about longevity and death and chat gpt says eternal reflections embracing mortality and expanding horizons so um even chat gpt of course but, but, but which is no surprise have 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 sucked in and expresses the standard view that we should embrace mortality. Now, I think we should embrace children and loved ones. So we should not embrace death. So many people think that uh, the radical life extension is immoral. There's a taboo surrounding this. And so there's a Norwegian study uh, where they asked, uh, if you compare your own values and cultural tra traditions with the idea of radically extending life beyond, beyond 122 years, to what extent do you agree, disagree, that a radical life extension is compatible with your own deeply held beliefs? And here, only 11% of the students in Norway asked this question, but thought that radical life extension was compatible with their deeply held beliefs right so they, there's a, a, a ideological and moral uh, objection or, or feeling that there's something uh, questionable with what people who are, who are into radical life extension is trying to accomplish now so the typical reasons they give is that radical life extension is unnatural that it's greedy and narcissistic that only the wealthy will have access to it, that there will be overpopulation, and that society would stagnate, and, and such reasons. Now, I think that these are intellectualizations, but it's interesting to see how quickly people are persuaded by them, and also how quickly they can recite them when you bring up the, the topic. Now, so it's it's good to have a, a kind of clear argument why death is bad, even though it might be be self-evident to, to us. So one of the ways of putting it is that it has an incredible opportunity cost. So when you're dead, you can't do any of the things that you value about being alive. So it has the greatest uh, imaginable opportunity cost, right? Another reason is that it threatens your self-determination. That is, you might have goals that are thwarted by death. The same goes for aging. So aging and death are imposed on you. They don't consider what you want to do. And so they are a form of unfreedom. And so for any kind of liberal mindset, it should be quite obvious that death is bad. Well, there is also harm to others. When you lose somebody you love, you know it, it hurts and you would do the same to people who you love when you die. And... Also, when you look at how we value, it seems that death avoidance is fundamental in that when we evolved our values, the things that we care about, very often, uh, if not always, they can be traced back to things that keep us alive. So shelter, love, nourishment, and so on. That is, it's implicit that death is to be avoided, that death is bad. 
And so you can make an ethical case for radical life extension. Death is bad, as I just argued. If death is bad, then this means that it ought to be avoided. That's logical. And therefore, we have the prima facie moral obligation to pursue radical life extension. Now, uh, does uh, uh, such an argument uh, rub up against uh, the typical, the standard, the pillars of, of bioethics? No, they don't. So the, the, the four kind of pillars, uh, as they usually conceived of in bioethics, or null malfeasance, that is, don't do do anything bad. And of course, you're not doing anything bad when you're extending somebody's life. Beneficence, uh, do good. And you're definitely doing something good uh, when you extend somebody's life. Autonomy, that is self-determination. Well, first of all, you're not forcing anyone to live longer than they want to. And secondly, you are extending uh, the autonomy of those who accept to extend their life because then they have uh, more time to express uh, what they want to do in, in their lives. And uh, the fourth is about justice and distribution. Well, here, uh, life extension doesn't have a, a special worry. It's the same worry as we have when we consider other uh, medical interventions. That is, we should try to strive for a just and equitable distribution. Um, so uh, embracing, uh, embracing death and aging, I would say, is immoral because it is embracing what is bad because of the reasons I, I just gave. So we can be a little bit more on, on the offensive here, I believe. Uh, uh, when you see what aging uh, can do to a person, uh, then to say that you, you, you think it's wonderful to age, as I, I heard recently, uh, at a, a birthday party, uh, a person said to me, you know, I think it's, it's, it's wonderful to age and say, well, is this wonderful, really? All the, the, the pain and harm it does uh, to people, right? So uh, I would say it's, 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 it's not a morally uh, sound position. Um, uh, Martin, uh, sh should, I, should I end with this slide here? Well, uh, so, so I have some yeah, thoughts about how to change hearts yeah, and minds. Uh, we have a little more than five minutes. So also for one question. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I have some ideas about uh, what we should do. We should inform about efforts to solve aging and present it as feasible. That's incredibly important because when people think of it as something that's a, a real possibility, they are much more positive towards it. Uh, we should inform about the positive social consequences and dispel anxieties. That is, uh, people are so quick to identify what they think are the negative consequences, but of course, there could also be a lot of positive con social consequences. Uh, we should always connect anti-aging to health uh, because that makes people more receptive. There is a taboo against saying that you don't accept uh, a death, but there is not a taboo in the same way of saying that you don't accept ill health. <laughs> that is being against ill health, that is being against illnesses and diseases, that's not, uh, there's no taboo against that in the same way as there's a taboo against being against dying and wanting to extend your life, right? So you should also try to work on that though. So make a case against death and for life to say, look, um, it's not just about health, it's also about the fact that we don't want to die if it's avoidable, right? And generally, uh, if what I am uh, saying is, is, is correct, that there is a, a, an ideology that holds people back from, from accepting this, then we need to create a counter ideology, a, a counter culture uh, that is vitalistic, that is that it's, it's for life and it's for prolonging life and it's against uh, aging uh, and, and death. And so uh, we need to also uh, take over the, the, the kind of cultural scene. And we need a Yoda, somebody like Yoda, who says life good is, death bad is, right? Uh, and for anyone who, who, who wants to be active, uh, they say forever, they can uh, contact and you can, you can immediately do something. And if you want to uh, know how to, for example, invest or how to plan your career uh, in longevity space, Vita Dao is a good place as well. 
And uh, finally, the, the struggle to cure uh, aging and, and, and death is, is like the struggle for world peace. It's difficult, but it's not impossible. And it's certainly heroic and noble. And uh, yeah, that's my, my book and my contact information. So I, I ran through that a bit, but... Uh... Thank you very much, Patrick, for this fantastic lecture. And now I open the floor to the audience in live or on Zoom. Uh, so uh, <laughs> they're still thinking. Anyone has a question in the audience? I have one. Yes? Uh, hello. Uh, you said that um, embracing um, aging and death is immoral, but isn't it kind of inevitable? Like you have to embrace it at least to some degree. Uh, well, uh, I think embrace it uh, is not what we should do. I think we should try to re resist it. Um, Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, yes, uh, but uh, we we shouldn't uh, uh, fall for some kind of a, a Stockholm syndrome where we fall in love with this captor, this this uh, this uh, limitation on 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 a freedom and this threat to to everything we value. So embrace. Uh, I think it's. Uh, it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a too strong world. We should embrace uh, children and loved ones, uh, not not aging and deaths. I think I think you know we might uh, you know reluctantly have to accept it in certain circumstances, um, but that shouldn't be our first uh, uh, our first reaction. Thank you. Um, I think I saw another hand. No. Uh, uh. No, just... Yeah, Patrick, can you please stop uh, screen sharing? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, no, I think that uh, <laughs> um, we got the answers. Thank okay. you, Patrick. Yeah. I have one question. Ah, here is one. Um, I think that um, aging is not immoral. I feel like one really important reason why people are against it is because we are now the ones who are still dying and then there will be a generation who won't be dying anymore and yes of course let's at least uh, afford them this possibility to live but it's not fair so it's a, a, an egoism that's driving this this thing, i feel it's hard to say but it's that's not an attitude we want to to encourage it's like if you you stand on a ship and and uh, you you're hesitant to to launch the lifeboats because you're afraid you won't be 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 uh, given a, a place in the lifeboat but um i i think uh, we we need to uh, uh accept and, and do all we can and and, and launch these lifeboats even even if we fear that we we might not uh, fit in them. Thank you. So last question, quickly. Um, Timush, uh, uh, start the microphone. Yes. Hello. Uh, it was a marvelous lecture, Patrick. I fully support you. I have an uh, an idea. Maybe you have uh, missed the von Goethe's Faust attitude towards death and eternal life, but I'm sure you have mentioned it in your book. Because in the Christian religion, the eternal life is somehow uh, connected to the devil's idea. And uh, so the Christian religion brought about the, the um, essence of this negative attitude towards longevity and eternal life. So being a, a proponent of Zen Buddhism myself and the Yoda also, so I fully share your opinion. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so Patrick, uh, uh, do we have an answer, a quick or response? Yeah. 
uh well i, I mean uh, the, the 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 attitude that there's something uh, wicked about wanting to to extend our, our life uh on, on earth is has has a lot of different roots in in in, in many different traditions um yeah so in the christian tradition i mean calvin wrote that we we should we should long for death right so uh, but of course it, it's a bit difficult too because uh, we get into the question of uh, what is death i mean um uh, in some sense their answer is that you don't die when you when we think you die but you actually continuing and and in that sense if they're right uh, then that's that's great i i, I think um, because I'm, a, I'm against death and they are also against death in their way. It's just I'm skeptical about the afterlife. So uh, my life extension is, is, is here and now, which they might think is a wicked proposition, although they are, they are for life in that way. Thank you very much, Patrick. And now we will move to our next speaker. Yeah. Uh, okay, now, thank you very much. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank, thank you. you. And now we move to Aubrey de Grey. Um, um, very famous, I mean, I don't need to lose words. I think that the best is to listen um, Aubrey himself. And I'm really honored, Aubrey, that you are here. So you can start the lecture. Oh, <clears throat> well, thank you very much, Martin. And um, yeah, I'm delighted to be here. Um, it's the first time I've spoken in Slovenia, even remotely. Uh, and uh, I'm delighted that there is such a good uh, uh, turnout here. Um, I um, uh, you know, One day I'm hoping to come to Slovenia in person, but I'm afraid not today. Um, so first of all, I'll share my screen. Give me a second. Um, let's see, it's that one, it's share, it's good. Um, uh, how's that looking? Is that yes, working? You can see, yes. Good. All right then. So, um, the, uh, the bulk of what I'm going to say consists of biology, though I'm going to, um, be, uh, reasonably non-technical and go through the specifics of, uh, what I and my group are doing right now and why. Um, but I thought I would start by commenting on a few things that Patrick said towards the end of his remarks. I'm afraid I missed all but the last few minutes of Patrick's talk. Sorry about that, Patrick. But um, some things that I did hear are particularly apposite to what I'm doing right now and what is going on right now. Um, the first thing I want to mention is, uh, let me get this working. There we go, is this. So uh, many of you will already have come across the Dublin Longevity Declaration, which was launched less than a week ago. Um, you can see the URL up at the top. And the relevance, uh, especially brought up by Patrick, is to the perception in the wider world of the feasibility of doing something serious about aging. For decades now, we have had not just advocates and enthusiasts and activists, but very, very credentialed mainstream people going out and saying, listen, you know, there is enormous benefit to doing something about aging. In particular, we have had for decades a phenomenon where economists, very, very credentialed economists have been doing this. People who are arguing even you know even if one doesn't really buy the humanitarian imperative of um going out and postponing the health problems of late life as much as possible there is a completely straightforward and cast iron mercenary economic imperative namely that in the modern world today the um you know the overwhelming majority of medical expenditure goes on health care for the elderly and it, that's increasingly true even in the poorest countries in the world um and of course that's just the direct costs if we think about the indirect costs associated with um uh, with, with aging then you know the numbers are even more astronomical and these numbers have been stated um you know people have been saying even if we were to postpone the 
um, the, the, the decline of aging by a few years, we would save literally trillions of dollars per year. So one might think this would be a persuasive argument to those in the corridors of power around the world. But of course, it has not been. If you want to look up the kind of things that people have been saying of this nature over the years, you should look up the, the phrase longevity dividend, which has become a bit of a moniker for this kind of thing. Um, it's been completely ineffective. So we have to ask, why has it been ineffective? And of course, the answer is exactly what Patrick said towards the end of his remarks, that people are still very much of the view that the whole thing is science fiction. And that, yes, absolutely, they may accept that if we were to succeed in even a modest postponement of aging, then fantastic. Um, but the ask is to invest, you know, to throw maybe a few billion dollars per year at the problem. And the scepticism arises from the idea that this few billion dollars per year would actually deliver any progress, any progress in the postponement of aging. So that is what the Dublin Longevity Declaration is all about. For the past literally 20 years, I have been going out and castigating and berating my colleagues within the biology of aging for failing to stand shoulder to shoulder with the economists and the advocates and so on. In other words, failing to come out and actually make predictions about how much we could postpone the, age, the decline of aging and how soon with how much money, how much investment. Now, of course, any such prediction would necessarily need to be um, probabilistic. And I have only ever made probabilistic predictions, but at least I've made those. And the problem is that I've been pretty much the only expert in this field doing so. That has now changed. Um, of course, it's been changing here and there in isolated ways for the past few years, but only the past few years. Now it's changed in a very big way. So if you go to the longevity um, declaration at the URL you can see on the screen, you will observe that we have already over 1,500 signatories. But the signatories that matter the most for present purposes are the top 70 or so because those are all really serious credentialed experts in this field. People who are professors and department leaders and such like around the world and who are known in a completely you know, irrefutable way to be people who know what they're talking about when it comes to the actual nuts and bolts of doing something about aging. So this declaration does not in and of itself try to you know give a call to action a um you know a, a, a demand that the world should get on and actually have a proper war on aging what it does instead is it gives kind of a substrate a fulcrum for other people to do that well not necessarily just other people because we're going to be doing it too but for other calls to action whether it's investing money whether it's just um you know changing public attitudes all of those kinds of things and we intend that this will be a real watershed moment in this. If you read the text of the declaration, some of you may think that it's a bit weak, you know, that we could have been more aggressive. Um, but it's a hell of a lot more aggressive than what most of the people here would have signed up to if, um, you know, you'd asked them even five years ago. So this is a huge breakthrough. That's all I'll say about it for the moment. Obviously, I'm happy to answer questions about it later on. All right, so um, back to science. And I'm going to go through this relatively quickly, largely because I know that a lot of you will be familiar with the arguments I'm going to present. I'm going to move on to uh, more um, you know, uh, new news uh, as soon as I can. So this is the question that, as a society, we should be trying to answer when we look at the feasibility of doing anything about aging. The question is, why is, why is this still a problem at all, given that we have pretty much entirely defeated infectious diseases? Of course, not completely entirely. We've just had COVID and there are a few other things. But compared to how things were a couple of hundred years ago, we're in a pretty good shape. We have almost no deaths in infancy anymore in the industrialized world. And the number of deaths in early life 
in the poorest countries in the world is plummeting such that the overall average life expectancy in the entire world added together is now in the region of 73 years, you know, around only about a decade lower than the record, uh, the, than the highest life expectancy in any country. So that's pretty good news. So what's the question? What's the answer? Why haven't we just been able to have the same level of success with the health problems that happen late in life? Most people think it's this. Most people think it's all about complexity, that, um, you know, just so many things go wrong late in life and they all go wrong at more or less the same time. So they exacerbate each other. You know, they interact, um, you know, and it's just been over. It's just overwhelmed the medical uh, research community. We just made no progress because we just kind of don't know where to start. And it's kind of whack-a-mole. Um, but actually, that's not really the main answer. And in order to explain the main answer, let me step, take one step back and um, give a summary of what most people get wrong when they think about what aging is. Most people think that aging is not a disease, that aging is in some way a separate thing from diseases. So if you ask people, how can somebody be sick? Then they will maybe give an answer that's more or less what you see on this table. They'll say, well, there are infections, that's column one. Then there's congenital diseases, things that a few of us inherit, that's column two. Then there's the big one, the chronic progressive diseases of late life, such as Alzheimer's and almost all cancers and so on. And then way out in the stratosphere, there's this fourth category called aging itself, which consists of these rather nebulous and you know poorly defined categories like um, frailty. And there's just like there's this huge big black line between the two um, that basically says that aging is kind of off limits to medicine. And you might as well just not think about doing anything about it because it's kind of woven into the fabric of the universe and it's um you know it's uh you know it's inevitable and universal and and uh, natural and so on and um that's not true it's completely not true here's the best way to explain that i know of why it's not true aging can can be defined as the combination of these two processes that you see at the bottom here one that goes on throughout life even starting before we're born and another one that kicks off late in life the lifelong one is that the body damages itself throughout life, literally starting before we're born. Metabolism is the word that biologists use to denote all of the, um, the processes that keep us alive from one day to the next. And damage <clears throat> is the um, changes that metabolism causes to the structure and composition of the body at the molecular and cellular level. Now, those changes are progressive that's the problem those changes accumulate over time and the body is set up to tolerate a lot of that damage but only a finite amount which means why we call it damage what eventually the changes progress beyond what the body is set up to tolerate and that's when the right hand process kicks off the decline in mental and physical function that occurs late in life when we've got more damage than what we're set up to tolerate fine so far all right so that means though that the definition we just gave of aging, that the popular definition, is wrong. The classification of ways to be sick that we ought to be using is here. Now, if you look closely, you will see that um, all the columns are exactly as they were in the previous version. The only difference is the location of that big black line. What that big black line now shows you is two things. First of all, it shows you why we haven't made progress against aging over the past couple of hundred years, the way we did against infectious diseases. Because now column three is no longer being presented as in any way similar to column one. And that's basically what we've been trying to do. We've tr been trying to pretend that it is similar and trying to you know, attack the diseases of late life as if we could eliminate them from the body um, you know, in the same way that we can eliminate an infection. And of course we can't. So that's one thing that this says. But the other thing that it says, which is even more important, is that there is no meaningful difference between column three and column four. The only difference is semantic. It is that the things in column three consist of the aspects of aging that we've chosen to give disease-like names to in order to vilify and demonize them. And therefore, in order to help us continue to defend and ignore the things in column four that we have not given disease-like names to. That is all it's about. So... As I said, the problem is that if you make that mistake, if you view column three as similar to column one, in other words, if you view the chronic progressive conditions of late life as similar to infections, 
you're going to try doing geriatric medicine, which means attacking the pathologies of late life as if they were infections. Now, it doesn't work. And you can see just from this really simple diagram why it doesn't work. The damage is continuing to accumulate because metabolism is continuing to happen. And therefore, the attempt to stop damage from causing pathology will become increasingly ineffective as the damage continues to accumulate as we get older. It's just a no-brainer that that's never going to work. And, um, you know, it's, it's astonish astonishing that so few people get that. But some people get it. And indeed, some people have been getting it for more than a century now. That's where the whole field of gerontology comes from. People started saying to themselves, well, look, this whole business of geriatric medicine is a non-starter. We've got to be more preventative. If we define the goal here in terms of these three words at the bottom, in other words, if we say, well, the goal is to separate metabolism from pathology, um, you know, to allow us to continue being alive without getting sick, then there are various ways we could do that. We've, all, we've just eliminated the possibility of separating metabolism from pathology by separating damage from pathology. Let's try instead separate metabolism from pathology by separating metabolism from damage. And that seemed like a really good idea at first, not least because we see in nature that the different species have very, very different rates of accumulation of damage. And that's why they have such different, different lifespans. Unfortunately, that hasn't worked either, and this is basically why. The problem is that metabolism is ridiculously complicated. And um, in particular, that the processes of generation of damage, the thing that we don't want metabolism to do, are inextricably intertwined with the processes of um, uh, keeping us alive, the things we need metabolism to do. Unpicking them just isn't going to happen. This is not even just a matter of complexity. This is a matter of technical feasibility. You just can't do it. It's not possible to stop metabolism from creating damage without having undesirable consequences. But that leaves a third approach. And, here, and the really shocking thing is that it wasn't until I came along 20 or so years ago that anyone really took this third approach seriously. The idea, as I said, is to separate metabolism from pathology. You can do that without interfering with either of the two processes, either the creation of damage from metabolism or the creation of pathology from damage. And the way you do it is preventative maintenance. You go in and periodically repair damage that has already occurred. Um, you don't even have to repair it completely. Just repair it fairly thoroughly so that you leave the overall amount of damage in the body within the threshold, within the amount that is not pathogenic, that does not kick off the right-hand process. That's all it's about. And of course, the reason why I don't think it's all that arrogant to call it the common sense approach is that we already do it. Here is, of course, a car that is more than 100 years old, and it got that way by preventative maintenance. It was not designed to last that long. It was probably designed to last 10 or 15 years. But here it is working every bit as well as when it was built. And if you ask the people who own this car now whether it's going to be working just as well in another 100 years, they'll say, of course, why not? So that's all very well, but that's all just um, you know theoretical and abstract. It only makes sense if one can um, you know can, can flesh it out into something that really applies specifically to the body, and that's what I did back in the year two thousand, published in O two. Um, the left hand side is the classification of types of damage that I <laughs> introduced back then, and as you can see, these are all concrete biological phenomena. Uh, and the key thing that matters here is that these class this classification is not just manageable, you know, seven is a nice small number. It's that for each category, we have a corresponding generic maintenance approach. In other words, an actual way to do the damage repair that we're talking about. For example, um, loss of cells, you know, that just means cells dying and not being automatically replaced by the division of other cells. <laughs> the natural way to fix that is to restore, replace those cells medically, to put in stem cells that are prepared into the right state so that they know what to do to divide and transform themselves into replacements for the cells that the body is not replacing on its own. And the same is true for the rest of the list. And as I say, I will not go through it now for, in the matter of um, interest of time. But uh, this is all very well established stuff now. 
Um, <clears throat> and the big thing I want to draw your attention to is the line at the bottom. This has now moved on rather well. Um, I think I can be quite proud that um, even the most difficult, the most challenging types of damage repair have now progressed far enough that we can actually bring in investors, people who are not just interested in philanthropy, but actually want to make money in the foreseeable future. Now, of course, some of these things are at a very early stage, so they're only attracting relatively small funding from you know, angel and seed investors, but that sure is how a start. So that's very important. All right, so um, of course, one thing we have to ask is, how well accepted is this concept? And for the first 10 years that I was um, propounding it, it was quite hard work because most of my colleagues within the biology of aging didn't understand a word that I was saying, or to the extent that they did understand it, they didn't think it made sense. Um, but that gradually changed. And really the end of that period was a decade ago now when the paper I'm um, describing here came out. This paper has become by a long way the most highly cited paper in the whole of the biology of aging this century. And it's basically just a root and branch restatement of what I had said a decade earlier. There are some problems with this paper, I'll, I'll, I'll say. Um, the classification is okay, um, though there are some problems with that. But the main problem with this paper was that they did not have that correspondence between categories and damage repair approaches, which to my mind kind of misses the point if you don't have that. There have been various um, follow-up papers to this, including one just last year by the same or this year, sorry, by the same authors, um, and they all have that same problem. They don't really do this correspondence. They therefore they they really amount to no more than surveys of promising in, promising approaches without really bringing them together into a unified, concrete, um, you know, project plan pro program. Um, but you know, that's a great deal better than nothing. What it does mean is that. I do not have to go into meetings with my colleagues in the research community and justify this approach anymore. Um, so I mentioned uh, that we've got into a uh, state where the private sector is getting involved, investors are getting involved. Uh, a large part of why is because the interventions that I listed a few slides ago, the ones that I put forward early on, are no longer the only ones available. Um, for every single one of these seven categories, we now have multiple ways in which we may actually be able to achieve the damage repair in question. And again, I won't have time to go through all this right now. I'm happy to answer questions about it, of course. But the point here is that, you know, these are things that I could not have predicted 20 years ago. In fact, in some cases, only 10 years ago. And that's fantastic, because we don't know what's going to work. This is research. I mean, it's not curiosity driven research but it is very much you know um uh pioneering technology and so the more alternatives we have the better um so finally coming to longevity escape velocity which is of course the name of my new organization um this is a concept again that i put forward 20 years ago which basically says that damage repair is different from this other you know, traditional gerontology concept of slowing down the creation of damage and the big reason it's different is it buys us time. It means that we can take people who are already in middle age or maybe even older, and we can um, you know, fix them up a bit with therapies that do damage repair but don't do it completely. And that allows people like myself, the research community, to improve the therapies so that we can um, that make them more comprehensive 20 years later or whatever, and thereby we can re-rejuvenate the same people even though they're chronologically older and the damage in their body is more biased towards difficult damage that would not have been repairable in the first generation rejuvenation therapy. And this leads to the concept that once we get the first 20 years or so of postponement of aging in, um, in humans, the hard part is done. And there should be no reason why anybody should get sick as a result of how long ago they were born thereafter, however long ago that ends up being. Um, we at um, LEV Foundation are pursuing this very aggressively right now. Uh, there's a big contrast, which I want to highlight, between the work that has historically been done at Sense Research Foundation, my previous organization, versus what we're doing now at LEV Foundation. At Sense, we were focused on the most difficult types of damage, on doing the early stage research to get them to a sufficient level of proof of concept that other people would run with them. And that's still very important. There are still some things that haven't really reached that point. 
However, um, we also need to now move on to the last stage of implementation of any divide and conquer strategy, which is the uh, reunification of the division, so to speak. In other words, combining things that already individually work reasonably well and seeing how to make them synergize, how to get more than the sum of the parts. Now, at this point, we are certainly not in the position to be able to do that with all of the damage repair approaches, especially not the ones that I was pursuing at Sands Research Foundation. But we very much are in the position to combine things that were already going so well that it sounds we never really needed to prioritize them because those things, at least a few of them, have now got to the point where in mice, even in middle-aged mice, we can substantially increase the mean and maximum lifespan and, of course, health span as well um, with these therapies. So we are now putting four of them together in the same mice at the same time. We started this experiment in February, so there's some way to go. The mice are only just a little bit over two years old at the moment. So we won't really have any definitive results for another um, six months or so. And of course, it'll get more definitive after that. Um, it's quite a complicated study. I'm running out of time, so I won't go through the details of this. But of course, it's on our website, levf.org. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, but yes, it's it, we have 10 treatment groups. We're talking about a 1,000 mice. So these experiments are pretty damned expensive. Um, we are measuring various things at various time points during the um, intervention, all the things that you would expect that we would measure, like how do they look, how old do they act, you know, we look at uh, things like memory and um, grip strength, you know, other things like that. We also take blood, um, you know, to do things like glucose tolerance tests, and we also sacrifice a few of the mice every so often, so as to do things that you can't ask, to ask questions that you can't ask unless you do that. Um, in particular, with regard to that last thing, I uh, very much want to emphasize that we are seeking collaborations from other, others in the community so as to get as much information out of this experiment as we can. Uh, we're also right now very much in the um, process of designing a follow-up experiment with different interventions, but with the same overall design. We are choosing different things. We are definitely not going to wait until RMR1, the first experiment, is over because the, uh, there's plenty more we can learn already. Um, I've got a list here of the current front runners for what we were what we're going to include there. As I say at the bottom, it's very expensive. Um, and I want to close by just repeating the highlight of this week, which is the Dublin Longevity De Declaration. I strongly urge all of you not only to go and sign it, but also to get the word out to as many people as you can. Because at the end of the day, what matters here is two things. Number one, the prominence and mainstream credibility and credentials of the top 100 people on the list, but very much also the sheer number of people on the list in total, which is over 1,500 already, and we want to carry on growing it as fast as we can, as much as we can. Thank you very much. And I hope I've left a few minutes for questions. Thank you very much, Aubrey. So uh, we have time for questions. Um, yeah. Uh, there are already some questions on Zoom. The first one says, uh, how many in absolute numbers are there of all of the hallmark the degradations and where can an absolute list of hallmarks and or contribute to neutralization be found? Like the degradation of cells, membrane is nowhere to be found when it comes to big sites like lifespan uh, EIO or rejuvenation roadmap. Um, yeah, I actually, I'm looking at the chat and I can't see that question. So I'm having to just listen to what you're saying. Um, but let me just briefly say, so the number of hallmarks is the wrong number to be looking at because the classification is done for many different reasons and with many different you know, things in mind. My classification happens to have seven categories. Um, so what matters is what the basis of that classification is. And as I mentioned, the key thing is that it should correspond one-to-one -one with generic approaches to doing the damage repair. Um, so the, uh, so the, it, it, w when you identify something that you think ought to be in the list and it's not, <laughs> Almost always, I will be able, well, I hope always, I will be able to explain why it's not in the list. 
like uh, it's actually in the list, but it's been subsumed into some other categories, or it's not a primary type of damage in the sense that it would, uh, we can be very sure that it would be repaired by existing damage repair processes that already naturally exist in the body if we simply um, fix all the other things. Uh, you know, those are the kinds of answers. Thank you. My next question. There is another question on Zoom. Uh, good evening, Aubrey. May I ask what do you do for your personal longevity? I actually am very lucky. I am, first of all, I'm only 60 years old. So uh, so that's good. But also, I am a lot biologically younger than my chronological age. I've been tested over the past 20 years, maybe half a dozen times. And um, I haven't actually done any of the fashionable epigenetic tests yet, because they are um, still really, you know, not ready for prime time, in my view. Um, but all of the standard things, you know, metabolic and cognitive and physiological and measuring 150 different things in my blood and all that, I always come out really young, which means that for me, the right thing to do, the rational thing to do is to be very conservative and just to stick to what I know. I'm just one of those repulsively lucky people who can eat and drink what I like and nothing happens and, you know, I'm, I don't even need to exercise. Uh, but maybe in the future I will have to. Thank you. Um, we have more with another on Zoom. Uh, the car analogy was interesting. If we had a uh, 100% effective strategy for keeping old cars on the road for longer or even forever that were implemented years ago, would we have prevented a considerable amount of progress in the automotive industry, uh, i.e., interfering with selective pressures? And can this be applied to natural selection in terms of natural human evolution? I.e., yeah. we are only preserving what is optimal now. Yeah, so this is a great question because I think it, you, know, you kind of answered yourself. Um, you know, what we have seen is that despite knowing that we had the ability to keep old cars on the road if we felt like it, we have had no difficulty at all also prioritizing the improvement in in automotive functionality um, and of course this applies not only to cars but to other industries as well so i think absolutely the opposite is the, tr is the case and we can see this from these um these prior examples that the more we can preserve what the body is able to do right now the body and the mind of course uh, the more motivation we will have to pursue ways to do even better with other technologies we're seeing this right now with um, focus on uh, things like brain-computer interfaces and improvements in in functionality of all manner of types. Indeed, some people often highlight the ethical problem that's kind of the other side of the coin that you raise, namely that it's too difficult to distinguish between what's a therapy, in other words, what's maintaining existing functionality, versus what's an enhancement. And of course, it is fairly difficult because the same kinds of technologies, or at least very much overlapping technologies, are relevant to the two. Okay. Um, we have questions uh, in person, in the hall. Yeah. I think that people are shy and also, um, Uberi, I don't know how much time do we do have. Um, yeah, I have a little longer. Um, I actually would like yeah. to respond to a comment from Patrick in the yes. uh, thing. Patrick says, death is a very brutal and primitive engine of progress, and we need to find more humane alternatives. Uh, yeah, so people do often raise this. They'll say, you know, both at the biological level and at the societal level, uh, we need turnover of individuals, which is provided, of course, by death. Um, in order to make progress. And uh, there are a couple of reasons why that's not really the case. Um, first reason, if we look at simple evolution, um, evolution doesn't really seem to work like that anymore. What we are seeing now is that technology is accelerating evolution, far from slowing it down. Indeed, this is no surprise, because evolution is driven by one's environment, by the selective pressures that arise from the circumstances one is in, and so a classic example is what's happened with the immune system of humanity over the past century. We've seen a very definitely a decline in how strong people's immune systems are. And that's simply because we could. 
it's because medicine is good enough that people with weak immune systems are no longer at a selective disadvantage. And in fact, women with a weaker immune system are more fertile. So this is no surprise, but it's also no problem because modern medicine isn't going away. Um, and, uh, you know, similarly at the societal level, we can say, well, okay, wouldn't, uh, isn't there this problem that science advances funeral by funeral and, um, you know, we need turnover in order to bring new ideas to the fore. You know, there are quite a lot of other ways to address that problem, like, you know, putting, you know, tax incentives to change careers every 20 years, things like that. You know, this is really, really not a hard problem. And the fact that it's raised is one example of what I've called the pro-aging trance, the desperation that people have to find some kind of excuse for aging so as to put it out of their minds and pretend that it's a blessing in disguise, even when it obviously isn't. Great, great, and really, um, yeah, on the topic. Um, so, um, thank you, Aubrey, for your speech, and we wish you further uh, fighting against aging. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you, and yeah, we also hope in uh, future we will invite you to Slovenia. So, yes. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Yes. Goodbye. Bye for now. Но по моему предлагание, мы должны снимать, а могу ли я технически на пакка по крпон, по плану, как знаете, по моему шеду, профессор Рожна, на его прощание. По тут, как сейчас на комнате по плану, по плану. Zdravljamo. Najprej pač, da uredite o prehrano, spanje, gibanje, ker pač večino lih taki ljudje, ki me vprašajo, ponova tudi, kaj dijo, premalo skijo, hvijajo ali kukol, tako da jaz bi takrat rekla, da je naprej se uredijo osnove, potem pa pač lahko ugremo naprej za kakšne dodatki še za povrt vsega tega. Kaj se pa tiče razvoja tega področja, da se mi zdi tudi pomemba na aktivica, v bistvu, kot smo se mi začeli družiti, da je to, ni samo nek tak tih interes, ki ga mi govorimo sam vsak zase, ali pa da se pač smo razmisljali, če se mi že dobimo na kavah in govorimo o tej temi, tega obstaja še nekdo, ki ga enako to zanima in je v bistvu doma, pa ne ve, da so tam še ostali somišljeniki. Tako da jaz pozivam ljudi, da če vas zanima ta tema, da se nam lahko pač družite in v tem skupi več, ko nas je nakupil, tudi bolj bomo opazni in več lahko naredimo glede tega. Super, hvala. Ja, naslednjo vprašanje imam za profesora Primoža Rožmana, se tikam od pade Primož. V svojem rezistualnem delu si razvijal metode, kako lahko bi se lahko mladi ljudi spremljali svoje matečne celice, ki bi se lahko pomladili, kaj se postarajo. In me zanima, a bi se stilno storičilo, da bi se mogli mladi bolj zavedati problematiki staranja in se bolj aktivno govoriti o ti temu? Skupaj, dober večer. Upam, da me dobro slišite. Ja? Ja. Se slišimo? Ja. Torej, če smem... Najprej pozdraviti vse vdeležence, okrogle mize, vse nekakšne sodelovce, partnerje v projektu Dolgoživost. Pa najprej čestitati vam, mladim organizatorjem, 
tega dogodka. Zelo se vam zahvaljujem, da ste zbrali energijo nadosno, ustvarjalno in sem navdušen nad tem konceptom. Ne bom vas imenoval po imensko, pač pa vredno se tudi ostali strinjajo, da je to velik, velik dosežek za Slovenijo. Z staranjem in podob staranjem odvisnimi težavami se ukvarjam znanstveno raziskovano že približno, recimo tem 15. Pred tem se ukvarjam intenzivno z matičnimi celicami kot sredstvom za zdravljenje in tako dalje. No, seveda je, bi rekel, splošna javnost prvič premalo seznanje nas temi problemi. Zato toliko bolj pozdravljam to društvo, ki se s tem ukvarja. Filozofsko fakulteto, ki je k temu ogromno prispevala, Na žalost je medicinska fakulteta k temu prispevala mnogo manj, kot bi mogla ali pa morala in ostaja velik dožnik na tem področju. Ravno tako ostaja velik dožnik na tem področju tudi raziskovalna skupnost v Sloveniji, konkretno bivši RRS in tako dalje, ki očitno ni spoznal tega problema kot enega osrednjih problemov v Sloveniji v smislu sociološkega in demografskega vprašanja. Slovenci izumiramo, če zali smo starejši in zato je to vprašanje izjemno pomembno za Slovenijo, ampak ni razpoznano, bilo saj do sedaj, kot tisto centralno, ki bi moralo biti. Zdaj že posegam čisto na politična področja, ampak je pač tako, da je to konec konca tudi politično vprašanje. Ne samo sociološko, ne samo filozofsko in ne samo medicinsko. Gre za vsodo Slovenije, njenega zdravstva, njene zdrave populacije in tako dalje. Tako da tvoje vprašanje, če se mali mladi premalo zavedajo, tega je seveda jasno, da se premalo, ampak tega niso oni sami krivi, pač pa je krivo to okolje in mi smo dolžni to okolje spodbuditi in ta vaša konferenca, ki je bila odlično organizirana, je en bistven doprinos k temu. Obstaja še nekaj drugih društv, ki so se ustanovila v zadnjem času in sinergija teh sodelovanj in recimo večja akademska razpoznavnost bo seveda pripomogla k temu, da se bomo bolj zavedali po omenosti tega vprašanja. Hvala. Hvala za odgovor. Super. Zdaj pa nam sledno vprašanja, da prvi bila sta bila za Lauro in za Primožo, ker so se pač zdaj predružili. Naslednje vprašanje so pa naslovljene na enega, ampak lahko pa vsi štirje odgovorite, če imate kar poljšen razlog. Torej, naslovil bom Eneja. Zasebna inicijativa pri dolguživosti je, kot kar smo tudi danes slišali, nekako bolj avantgarna. So zasebna podjetja tista, ki razvijajo tehnologije tako naprej in so zelo držna. Zanima me naj, kako vidite prihodnost zasebnega sektorja na tem področju v Sloveniji? In še drugo vprašanje, kako vidite upoštevanje principov socialne pravičnosti v smislu dostopnosti čim vseh ali pa čim večjim ljudem teh tehnologij? Hmm. Ja, za prvi del zasebnega sektorja v Sloveniji ne bi bil zelo optimistični, ker ni to področje, kjer je ta ekspertiza ima in kjer je ta izsrčena. Tudi recimo, mislim, meni ta področje strastno zanima, ampak recimo 
a cije si se ukvarja z mikrobno biotehnologijo, smo postavili v Sloveniji zelo uspešno bila podjetje, medtem, ki moje prejšnje podjetje, ki je bila razvijala zdravila za redke bolezni in mitohondrijo, se mogo pa še postaviti na nizozemsko, pa potem pa Ameriko. In tudi mi smo postavili v bistvu na nizozemsko. In preprosto ful ekspertize, ki urabaš, da postaviš tako v bistvu data and science heavy team, In tako, kot je profesor Ožman rekel, naša medicinska fakulteta, recimo in biotehnička fakulteta, trenutno ni usmerjena recimo v to vrstno raziskave. Zdaj, ne bi dajo nobenih ne pozitivnih, ne negativnih predelnikov zraba, ampak to pač ni podloče, ki je recimo predmet interesa trenutno tukaj. Zdaj, kaj se tiče po dostopnosti, pa sigurno, in tako tudi recimo mi to razvijamo v nuju, je ravno to, to so to prednedavni in bile relativno nedostopne in zelo drage raziskave. Brian Johnson, ki je zdaj malo popularizirati zvodbe, on vlaga, sam prizna, dobrih 2-3 milijone dolarjev letno, v ekipo zdravnikov, ki se samo z njim ukvarjajo. Dela pa bolj ima niste raziskave, ki delamo mi v nuju, s tem, da pač pri nas lahko v bistvu se celotno ta, recimo, testiranje pa analiza so podprte v bistvu z machine learning, AI in tako naprej vzadi, kar pomeni, da lahko v bistvu postane dostopno bolj ima vsakemu, se pravi, to postane nekaj sto evrov, potem na mesto nekaj milijonov. In pa še to je v bistvu spet niči vsakemu dostopno, ne, to je že v bistvu, ko se zdravstvo ukvarja, kam plasirati nekaj sto evrov, ni vedno zelo enostavno vprašanje. Tako da je pač zelo fajn tukaj, da imamo pač tudi prisotnost pač slovenske politike, to je, v bistvu kaže, da začenjamo razmišljati o to smer, nekako tako povezati po eni strani dolguživost kot kot in ne vidi bolj del tega, kam družba gre, ampak staranje mora biti tudi zdravo staranje. In se hkrati, ko se s tem uparjamo, razmišljamo, mi, ko pa delamo na drugi strani, recimo neke vrste longevity, pa razmišljamo o tem, kako ohranjati in preprečevati ta decline. In jaz mislim, da to bilo zelo sinetistično skupaj, ker s tem v bistvu stvarjamo družbo, ki vsaj je dlje časa bolj produktivna, dlje časa bolj v bistvu sodrojoča. In v bistvu tudi starejši del community, jaz prej smo se pogovarjali Blue Zones. Del, zakaj so tam uspešni Blue Zones, je kjer starejši del community aktivnič manj družbo. Tako da, Ko se pogovarjamo o tej demokratizaciji, to vrstih tehnologij in znanja, je namen recimo tega, kar mi delamo kot nu in tudi malo si katere druge inicijative v privatnem sektoru, ki jih poznam, da je ravno to namen, da to ne bo domena elite, da to ne bo domena, ki si jo samo hollywoodski nega zvezda, ki jo tako preloši. In tem, da ga če bomo propadili kot družba. Hvala. Ja, jaz imam mogoče en komentar, kar se tiče biotehničke fakultete. Mislim, vse strinjam, da pač predmetnik ni narejen tako, da bi mi lahko pridobivali tako znanje, ampak pač predmetnik je narejen v skladu z industrijo, ki je trenutno prisadna v Sloveniji. In se pravi, če takih podjetij ni potem prijetno ne izobražuje ljudi v to smer, ker ne bi mogli kje zaposliti, ampak potem smo zacikljeni, ker jih ne izobražujemo potem kdo pa bo ustanovil to podjetje, razen, če se bo dobrno izkline. Tako da, ja, malo smo ujeti. Se pravi čujem, bodo vprašanja, kaj zakročimo, da en krok. To bi bil dober krok. Ja, ne bo če pa je. Branka dela dolik na temu, da se to vrste inicijative dvignejo na biotehnički, to mora pa priznati, ampak to je čisto zadnje leto dve, da se res to začenja intenzivno podvikati. To pa moramo v bistvu zaposti od Branki. Moram zaposti od Branki. Ja, dobrovečer sem, sem vas spremljala bolj ali manj intenzivno, zelo super si organiziral, Martin, to perfektno. Je treba o tem čim več govoriti, o dolgoživosti, o vitalni dolgoživosti, kar mi tudi delamo, tako da perfektno tudi ta mednarodna odeležba, posebno obri, ki je bil, tako da smo imeli vse zvezde svetatlele v Ljubljani na platnu, kar je zelo dobrodošlo. 
Zdaj pa, če bi lahko sam en par stvari povedala, kolegica je govorila o biotehnički fakulteti, da tam ni, se ne razvija. Jo stvari, jaz lahko povem, da smo lani uvedli nov izbirni predmet in sicer molekularni mehanizmi staranja, ki obravnava ravno to problematiko, to se pravi dolguživost in staranje, ampak ker so biotehnologi to morajo pa znati na molekularnem nivoju, morajo razumeti te mehanizme. Odziv je bil izjemen, študenti so bili zelo zadovoljni, ene je tudi predavil tam, hvala, ene je letos gremo spet, ne? Ja, tako da je bilo zelo v redu in bomo pač širili to idejo še naprej. Poleg tega smo uvedli, tudi se začel zdaj izvajati nov predmet celovit pristop k dolguživosti na zdravstveni fakulteti na magisterski stopni za zdravstveno nego. To smo zdaj začeli izvajati, tle imam malo tako, mislim, se moramo malo znajče, ker so to pač različni nevoji, ampak mi je tudi to spodbudno. Poleg tega imamo še preko gerontološkega društva, imamo eno sekcijo Vitalna dolguživost, kjer smo zdaj organizirali že dva posveta, znanstvena posveta na temo dolguživosti, ki sta bila relativno dobro obiskana in pritegnili smo tudi ogledne predavatelje, ampak je bilo strogo domače, ker je bilo to v sklopu mestne občine Ljubljana, ki nam je to ta posvet finansirala. Tako da tukaj se dogajajo določene dodeve, enih par nas je, ki smo angažirani tukaj, V prihodnosti zdaj probamo zorganizirati en, kako se že reče, na univerzi je nek centr za razvoj in raziskave, tak, interdisciplinarni centr za razvoj in raziskave, ki je že ustanovljen za področje staranja. In tukaj noc so združeni tako FDV, to se pravi sociologi, politologi, ekonomisti in tudi neki zdravniki in tudi neki pa tele biologini. Zdaj, kako se bo to razvijalo, je še v nas pa Jože Štefan je zravno širša druščina. Kako se bo to razvijalo? Namen je ta, da se poveže ta sfera staranja, oziroma karkoli je na tem področju, in da se poveže, to se pravi, različne vede, predvsem pa to, da se vzpodbudijo raziskave, ker mi imamo sicer kar nekaj raziskav na področju staranja, ampak so fragmentirane in so v drugih sklopih. Bi bilo pa fajn, če bi se to lahko malo povezalo, združilo in bi lahko to tudi bolj promovirali. Zdaj, kar pa saj jaz tudi pogrešam in sem zelo vesela, da je bil udeleženc oziroma da je udeleženc okrogle mize gospod Kenda z ministrstva in je imel zelo fajn predstavitev v njegovo, mi je bila zelo všeč, ker je z tega se zelo strinjam, kar je povedal. Predvsem pa me je spodbudilo to, da sem zdaj sploh se oglasila, da je napovedal, da bomo razpravljali v jeseni o strategiji dolgožive družbe. Ta strategija je že od leta 2017, se sicer ne vem, če se kaj izvaja, ampak če se bo to razpravljalo, in bi bilo zelo dobro, da se razpravlja, je not en segment, en steber, štirje stebri so ono, en steber, se okvarja z zdravim življenjem in z aktivnim in zdravim staranjem. In v ta steber, ne, v ta steber menim, da bi lahko ta koncept dolguživosti uvedli. Ampak to moramo seveda prediskutirati širše, ker bi bilo to zelo smiselno. In se veselim te razprave, in bomo vsaj z teh strani, kjer jaz delujem, bomo aktivno, aktivno participirali.
ker jaz menim, da ta vrsta dolgoživosti oziroma promocija te vrste dolgoživosti, to mora biti širše, to mora biti za vse ljudi, ne samo za izbrane in je treba postopoma ovajati te koncepte preventive v širšo družbo oziroma medicina mora malo se spremeniti na tem področju in iti več v preventivo, da ne bomo bolani 30 let ali ne pravi 40. 20 let smo v Slovenci, veš, bolani. Ok, no, toliko za zdaj. Hvala lepa. Hvala lepa. Ja, v bistvu smo zelo na začetku še, ne. Jaz se kot predstavnik politike, ki bi me enaj prej pomenoval, niti nekaj kot predstavnik politike, tukaj, ker sem v bistvu kot Aleš Kemba tukaj, ne. Sedi pač kot Aleš Kemba pripravljam povedati, kaj se šporedno za to dolgo živostjo dogaja tudi na drugih področjih, ne. Ko pa sem tukaj sedel, sem pa razmišljal, da seveda, recimo, to je tema za zgodbo zdravja, zdravstva, tukaj je ministrstvo za zdravstvo, recimo. Kar se strategije tiče, ta strategija je zdaj šest let v življenju, je bolj napisano, prav organizirano se ne izvaja, Je pa zanimivo seveda, da ta strategija ima zanimivo ime in to je strategija dolgoživosti, dolgožive družbe, kar pa nas dokaj nekaj dodružuje v teh pogledih. Zdaj, pred nas na našem ministrstvu so zdaj resni nameni, da nekaj zagrabimo to strategijo in da z te akcijske načrte, ki so že nekoč bili napisani, nekaj zopet zaležemo v nek snoteč in na to preko vlade spravimo v reševanju. Stvar ni prav enostavna, ter tukaj je treba zagnati in cel mehanizem. Mogoče kot zanimivost povem, da un kljubni dokument... Lahko malo bolj v mikrofon, kje je nekaj pere se? Mogoče kot zanimivost povem, da izključni dokument Združenih narodov, ki je zdaj v rejavi, to je ta operativni dokument, regionalna izjednjena strategija iz leta 2002, ima deset usmeritev, guidelancev, in prvi je mainstreaming aging into all spheres, tako naprej. Skratka, treba je ne parcijalno delovati, ampak nekako umestiti to zgodbo staranja v en najširši kontekst, da se zadeva lahko začne odpredite. Hvala. Izjemno izjemem komentarji in se strinjam, to so zelo, zelo kompleksne inicijative. Ta dolgoživa družba mi je tudi zelo všeč ime, lahko povem čist kot mogoče eno zanimivost, pa z veseljem kdaj na to kakšno debato. Jaz sem dost bil zdrla v tudi v interakciji z Združenimi Emirati. Tam je zdrla zelo velika, recimo, pobuda inicijativa tako v Abu Dhabi, kot v Dubaju. Imajo veliko ambicijo, hoče biti prvi longevity nation on the planet. Ampak to nisem tako, da to deklarirajo, v bistvu delajo zelo velike premike v to smer, recimo Abu Dhabi je lan spred objavil, da bojo sekvencirali celotno populacijo, se pravi vsi njihovi prebivalci bojo imeli sekvenciran svoj človeški genom, z idejo, da grejo v preventivno medicino, se pravi, da bojo in zdaj naslednji del te strategije je, da vzkušajo ugotavljati, kako njihovo zdravstveno infrastrukturo preusmeriti v to, da gre v preventivno, proaktivno in personalizirano. Hkrati pa potem še vse ostalo, kar je s tem povezano, vključno z zavarovalniškim sistemom, kje so v bistvu, kako se probava spodbujati preprečevanje bolezenskega stanja in ohranjanja zdrave itd. Tako da niso, oni delajo že veliko korakov, pa se hkrati zavedajo, da ne morajo se še deklarirati kot longevity nation, ampak želijo pa, da vzpostavijo toliko in toliko nekih infrastruktur, da se bojo lahko čez nekaj let pohvaljali, mi pa smo zdaj 
true longevity nation. Ne? Se prav ohranjamo neko to dolgoživost našega prebivalstva in se ohran, ukvarjamo s tem, kako jih ohranjamo zdrave in produktivne. Ne? Um, tako, mislim, se mi zdi zelo zanimivo razmišljanje, pa je tako, kaj ste rekel, to so blazno komplekse in zelo mnogo let trajajoče v bistvu inicijative, ne? predvsem so se to nekako poklopi skupaj. Motorje pomembno. Ja, ampak uh, motorje pomembno, ampak uh, ena stvar zdaj v zvezi s temi preventivnimi zgodbami, kot ste jih pomembno. Ne? Naša strategija ima resnično že v bistvu šest let, ampak je dobra. Kakorkoli obereš, je strategija, ki je sodobna. Uh, pisali so strokovnjaki pri nas, pa tudi uh, iz tujne. In eden od uh, temeljev te strategije je vse življenjski pristop. Uh-huh. In vse življenjski pristop, pre kaj, pravno to, kar ste rekel, to je v bistvu preventiva. Uh-huh. Ker največja napaka, uh, je rekel, zelo raba, starost je, da se ukvarjaš z starostjo, ne pa se staranje. Mm-hmm. Upam, da sem bil jasen. Absolutno. Absolutno. Staramo se toč, kot smo dan slišali od odrostva. Ne? Mm-hmm. Vse uh, investicije, vsa vlaganja base uh, tokom življenja se praviloma uh, izkažijo uh, v, v starosti kot uh, bolj ali slaba ali manj kvalitetna starost, oziroma z vrčem manj bolezni. Statistiki je tako nesporno drži pri posamezni, pač nič izpomino, ker so tudi seveda druga zgodbe. Ne? In drugo, kaj smo se v šoli učili? Jaz sem se učil o ulomkih, odvodih, priredju, podredju, kdaj se je ta rodil, kdaj se je on rodil o nekem življenju, o razmerju do starosti, o staranju, o vlaganjih vase, to se zdaj še le sam učimo, ne, tokom življenja. Prasimo. Sem si tukaj prisolil. <laughs> ja, hvala. Um, no, ampak z načinjem vprašanjem v vas spetno slujil, pa leš, um, če si zamislimo prihodnost, ko bojo te te tehnologije do goživosti in na voljo, Katere stereotipe bi mogli preseči so naši družbi, da bi vključali neko to novo generacijo biološko mlajših ali kronološko starejših? Vprašanje je predvsem terko, ne, ampak stereotipi se mi prej omenjajo. Ne, stereotipi o starejših in o staranih, o staranju pa so taki, da je to kot obdobje upada, obdobje bolezni in uh, v tem kontekstu so te stereotipi, uh, ki so seveda hudo krivični. Ne? Starost, kot sem rekel, traja kaj od 55, ga recimo 50 pa do 110 leta, to je obdobje izjemno heterogeno, to je obdobje, kjer lahko razvoj človek začne nekaj, nekaj na novo. Ne? To dokazuje tudi tista raziskava Švedska, ki sem prej pokazal, ki kaže, da Vsaka nova generacija 70-letnikov je bolj zdrava, bolj sposobna. Ne? In v bistvu, kdor razmišlja, da je starost obdobje upada, pač ne ve tega. Ne? Dejansko narava, kaj naredi narava? Narava človeku pomaga tudi z mišicem, z izgledom, ki je nekak pri vrhu, pri 20-25 letih, tako da si uh, človeško bitje poišče partnerja lažje, potem pač nič ne delaš na sebi, tako je drugače dejansko prihaja do upada. Ampak če si uh, v življenju aktiven, tako fizično, kot misleno, je lahko ta upad izjemno počasen. Ne? To dokazuje neskončno veliko ljudi še danes tukaj, še z nekaterimi govorov, ki so prot, prototipi aktivnega stanovanja. Tako da, upam, da smo približno odgovorili na, na vprašanje. Hvala. Um, naslednje vprašanje imam, da ima še kdo drugi vrhika, da več pa... Mogoče, mogoče se v tem sicer ne razmišljam, jaz se v bistvu na bolj mehanistično, biološko ukvarjam, ampak zdaj da mi je kapel, ne, ker smo imeli isto te debate danes, še tekom pogovorov, 
se týka politike, vlade, ne, infrastruktura, stereotipo, ne, uh, Niki kar, kar znano zelo močno podprejem pokaže, ko človek zgubi namen, ne, funkcijo, uh, purpose, se, se rapidno začne proces staranja. In to pokažemo celo biološko. Ne, lahko na, na, na age klokih, o katerih smo danes govorili, se lahko pokaže, da se pospešeno začne biološka starost večati, ko človek zgubi svoj namen. Ne. In to je delno tudi stvar, recimo, raznih teh gruzovno in tudi tudi. Ne. Zdaj se zmišljam čist, ko zvedika, res se postavljam 30-40 let v prihodnost. Ne. Mi zdaj lahko hočemo podaljšati čas delovne dobe za eno leto, pa imamo tako po celi Evropi ustaje, pa štrajke, pa tako naprej. Ne. Ampak po drugi strani pa jaz razmišljam, jaz resno prijamam, da bomo lahko prej ali slej produktivno živeli vsaj 120 let. Kje bo končna meja, bomo videli, ampak to pomeni, da, da nekdo pre 40 ima ma pred sabo še eno karjero do 80-90-ih in potem še eno karjero do 110-ih. Se pravi, imaš ti še dve, tri karjere pred sabo. Ne? In Slovenija že zdaj dela kar velik na temu, jaz poznam kar nekaj ljudi, ki so na ta drugi univerzi oziroma pač na kasnejšem zadržavanju, kar je krasno. Ampak to, to, če jaz prav razumem, za enkrat delaš bolj zase. Ne? Kaj mene zanima, bomo znali kot družba iti prek to, da mogoče ne bomo ljudi prsile, da zdaj delaš, ne vem, na vem, ne vem, na mes 65, na 67, tako da potem bomo imeli spet štrajke v svetu sod, ne, ampak da mogočeš produktivno delo, ker če pa hkrati rečeš, ne, ti si zdaj za pokoj, kakor zaslužeš na strani, da itak upalimo po glavi, se prav brez veze, se prav najbolj, da se vsedeš na kauč, čuvaš svojo vnučko in v bistvu začneš propadati. Ne. Če bi znal kot družba motivirati, da ljudje vstopijo v naslednjo fazo in kreativno prispevali in s tem v bistvu mogoče razbijamo stereotipe, ker bo lahko ustvarjali neko dodano vrednost kot senjori, ki pa hkrati so izjemno bogati z izkušnjami, ne, bi znal, bi to zanimiv koncept. Mislim, zdaj nam je razmišljamo o temu, to ni, da je to neka mogoče čist neumravna razmišljanja. Mi se so v strokinjak za te področje, ampak kot vem, vse pametne politike za poslovanja starejših gre v smer onda spodbujanja, da bi delali tle ne na silo, ampak za takmi ali drugačnim spodbujam in bi delali naprej. Je pa seveda ena stvar, ki jo delodajalci tu pogosto pozabljajo, da a, starejši delavci niso enaki mlajši, in obratno, mlajši niso enaki starejši. Starejši imajo določene prednosti in tudi slabosti in obratno. Kdor ob delodajalci misle, da se bo nekega starejšega delavca veliko z nekim istim delom obremenjovalo in veliko privijalo kot pri 20-ih letih, to ni uspešno. V primeru, da pa so delodajalci pametni, da delovna mesta prilagodijo starejšim delavcem in na ta način lahko omogočijo dejansko neko bolj kreativno delo naprej. In da ne boste rekli, da govorim na pamet, nekaj te se to celo pri meni zgodilo. Jaz sem še do pred par let bil na uh, delu, ki me je v bistvu utrujalo. Um, Jaz nisem se ni prav izpolnil nekaj na tistem. Uh, stvari so se malo zavrtele, tako da sem zdaj na nekoliko uh, drugačnih temah, na temah, za katere sem morda rojena. Ne? In tukaj lahko dam od sebe mnogo več tako ministrstvu, kot tudi državi. Ne? Kot je rekel uh, Albert Einstein, uh, če pošliš ribo na tekmovanje v plezanju po prilesu, bo imelo do smrti počutek, da je nesposobno. Ja. Hvala lahko. Uh, Jaz sem ja. eno pripombo. Ja. Uh, Lete, treba je reči, da bo v popis. Mislim, Slovenija je ne, uh, neprijetna držela za privatne pobude, za tuje investicije, pa tudi za... Uh, projekte longevity-ja. To je golo dejstvo. Mi, upošt, mi razvijamo koncepte um, obra, v obratni smeri. Recimo, 
Mi razvijamo koncepte proti longevitiju, pač pa razvijamo koncepte za eutanazijo. In tako dalje, in tako dalje. To je en fakt. Drug fakt je sledeč. Poglejte, vse metode za podaljševanje življenja morajo reči skozi klinične eksperimente. Te klinične eksperimente morajo izvesti vedno kvalificirani strokovnjaki in to so samo zdravniki oziroma raziskovalci v medicini. Medicina je tista panoga, ki je usrednja za povečanje dolgoživosti in za izboljšanje in tako dalje. Zdaj pa se vprašajmo, kje pa je slovenska medicina? Slovenska medicina je v nekem upadajočem ciklusu, ki se je slabša vsak dan in je to zadeva pač politike. To ponovno ponavljam. Slovenska politika nikos temu vprašanjem. In to je tudi razlog, zakaj je enej v Lajdnu in ne v Šiški. To je tudi razlog, zakaj nimamo projektov iz tega dolgoživosti, zakaj tega ne financiramo in tako dalje. Sicer financiramo neke vesolske raziskave, sem slišal, na katere se ne razumem, ampak lahko vam povem neko dejstvo iz moje skromne zgodovine raziskovalne. Obri de Grey je pred 20 leti kot ste videli postavu sedem elementov vzrokov staranja. Te elemente so španci leta 2013 nadgradili, pa so jih najdeli devet. On je malo jezen na to, da so jih najdeli dva več kot on, ampak mi smo jih leta 2015 identificirali petnaest. Teh elementov je namreč več kot sedem in devet in verjetno še več kot petnaest. No in po teh petnaestih letih je danes obri de Grey prvič upeljev tudi eno metodo, da se mlade krvotvorne matične celice lahko uporabljajo za preventivo staranja. Ne vem, če veste, ampak to je rezultat naše raziskovalne skupine in naših objavov. Tega dolgo ni hotel upoštevati in postaviti na, bi rekel, na svoj meni, ampak danes sem jo zelo vesel, ker je končno prvič postavil tudi to metodo, ki se reče heterohrona avtologna transplantacija krvotvornih matičnih celic v svoj diapazon in to je doprinos, skromni doprinos Slovenije k temu projektu Longevitya. Je pa seveda žalostno to, da so nam ta projekt popolnoma nehali financirati, da smo zaprli živalsko stajo, da smo nehali vse eksperimente in je tega projekta v Sloveniji konec. Upam, da ga bojo nadaljevali saj njegovi kompanjoni, kot kar je nakazal v svojem predavanju. Torej, žal mi je, ampak takali so dejstva in z njimi se je treba spoprijeti. Kako? To bo pa reševala naslednja generacija mladih entuzijastov in hvala Bogu, da so med nami in jih še enkrat čestitam za tole organizacijo in bomo se mi starejši potrudili, da jim bomo pomagali po vseh svojih močeh. Tako da čestitam in aplaudiram temu sestanku. Hvala lepa. Hvala. Zdaj pa naslednjem vprašanju imam pa za Lavro. Tudi med samimi govorci na konferenciji smo videli, da so pač večinoma to moški in me zanima, če imate kakšno misel, kako pritegati bolj mešano zasedbo na to področje raziskovanja. Kako pritegati ali tudi zakaj jih je manj? Mogoče oboje. Ženske tako tako živijo od leja. Ja. No, mislim, Jaz oseb nikoli nisem sicer razmišljala, da to sploh, da bi spal imel kakršno kol vezo v mojem življenju, tako da v bistvu do tega vprašanja, ko sem vedela, da bo prišlo, niti nisem pretirano razmišljala, da bi me to kako uviral, razen, če sem pač jaz imela to srečo, da sem bila v dobrih krogih ljudi, ampak meni se zdi, da v znanosti nasplošno je tega, kako bi rekel, 
сексизма мал мън, озирам, така и бол примитивни ствари за тях, кръсма тук и рационални люди и са и аз особено могу, че съм пач рез мила срещу, не съм мила тех тежал. Ампак съм размишляла, кай би лахко били разлоги, да е женск ман. Здай, еден би лахко бил могу, че пач наравно, да би било интереса мън. Тук и нимам кей за припомън. Проблем па е, да тън кер интерес е, па могу, че е кашен страх озади, Ker tudi pač statistično smo ženske malo bolj risk-a vrst in se rajši, tudi to se vidi recimo pri investiranju, da tega počnemo manj ali pa se tega bojimo. To ne pomeni, da to zdaj velja za vsazka, ampak recimo se mi zdi, da če se pa delamo, da razlik ni, ne vem, če je to tudi koristno, ampak lahko pa se opominjamo, da mogoče če obstaja strah ali pa kaj tazga, da se opominjaš, da mogoče pa ni racionalen ali pa da vprašaš za zunani feedback, pa se spomneš, da mogoče ni nujno, da se tako počudeš. Mislim, se mi zdi, da če se take stvari zavedaš, lahko veliko narediš glede tega, da take stvari zminimiziraš. Še ena stvar pa, ki sem pa lih tudi poslušala, zakaj recimo kot founderjev ali pa kot CEO je tudi žensk men, oziroma če so, so ponovato zgodi deset let v karjeri kasnej, spet samo pač lahko je veliko več razlogov v tom, ampak en, ki sem ga jaz našla, lahko, da bi bil materinstvo, da tisti lih deset let razlike, ki se zgodi, je mogoče zaradi tega, ampak spet tukaj se lahko to naredi, da lahko to preprečeš, če nekako planiraš vnaprej, veš, kakšni so tvoji cilji, tudi pa izbiri partnerja ali pa če imaš širši podporni krok, tudi lahko nekaj narediš glede tega. Tako da, zdaj, jaz ne moram odgovoriti za druge, kaj bi lahko bil vzrok, ampak če je kakšno od teh stvari vzrok, mislim, da se tudi veliko da narediti. Hvala. Jaz bi celo kontriral temu statementu, ker če gledamo dejansko to naše področje, mogoče zdaj izbira tega le, teh naših predavateljev tukaj le donas, to je bolj na teb, koga si povabil, ampak če pogledaš Jennifer Dodna, Chris Prakas Nine Nobelova, največja, bolj ali manj največji izum tega stoletja, Elizabeth Blackburn, odkriteljca telomerov, Nobelova nagrada. Ene par najpomembnejših raziskalk na področju matičnih celic, ki jih profesor Rozman sigurno boljš pozna, ki jaz tam pak vem, da tam, ki sem jaz prebiral ta glavne revolucionarne članke na matičnih, je bilo kar nekaj imenitnih ženskih raziskovalk. Ne vem, če je kakšna Nobelova nagrada zraven, ampak skratka, mislim, naša recimo Chief Medical Officer Andrija Majer, ena izmed ta glavnih recimo zdravnic oziroma medicink na področju longevity. Tako da, mislim, da je to področje kar močno z izjemnimi ženskimi liderkami raziskovalkami. Jaz mislim, da so kar izjemni role model tudi za mlade. Tako da, mislim, da tukaj recimo z razliko mogoče od fizike smo kar v redu. Ja, hvala. To je tudi naloga pa za naslednjo konferenco, da je... Ja, hvala. Ja, lahko se bolj potrudimo, da bo več pozitivnih, ko se reče, role modelov tudi obstajali. No, naslednje vprašanje bi tudi za Lavro. Prvo pa pa še ostale, tudi če imate še za dopolnit. Kako kar smo slišali, področja dolgoživosti nekako prepleta več nekih podciljeva. Imamo ljudi, ki si želijo samo kvalitetno živeti in jih ne zanima tako zelo dolžina, ampak bolj kvaliteta samo. Imamo ljudi, ki si želijo ostati estetsko lepi ali pa lepe. Imamo ljudi, ki si želijo biohackati, skratka biti bolj pametni, pametne in sposobni, sposobni in tako naprej. Pa imamo naprimer transhumaniste, ki si želijo nadgraditi človeka, biti tako biološko in tako naprej. Ali pa naprimer imamo neke ideje, da bi to poenotali naprimer kot oberi, da bi preprosto se ciljali na ustavljanje staranja. Tako da me zanima, a bi bilo boljši imeti več ciljev na tem področju ali bo boljši, če bi se nekako vsi usmeralo v en sam cilj? Ja, ne vem, tukaj sta dva vidika. Pač najprej se mi zdi, da je bi bilo pomembno tudi, da v bistvu dojamemo, da imamo skupni cilj, ker vsi te, ki si naštev, imajo nekaj skupnega. Tudi, če pogledamo reklame za kakršen kol izdelk, večinoma v njih nastopajo mladi ljudje, ker pač lepota oziroma beauty cells in beauty, lepota je tudi mladost nekako, vsaj tako pač ljudje to dojemamo. 
Um, in se mi zdi, da če bi ljudje v bistvu dojeli, da te cilji imamo v bistvu veliko skupnega, bi bilo lahko skupaj močnejši, ampak po drugi strani pa tudi kaž, kažni ljudje imajo pač bolj nišne interese in če je takih več, se tudi lažje najdejo kot v neki splošni temi, ki pa jih mogoče ne pritegne tako močno. Um, uh-huh. Tako da dve poti, tako v ena enkrat. Ja, hvala. Ja, uh, Branka. Uh, ja, uh, ne, na, na prejšnje zadeve, da je žen skvajn v tem, na tem področju uh, um, dolgoživosti. Uh, jaz se tle ne morem čist strinjati, ker mislim, da je kar veliko. Uh, in, so tudi, in so tudi zelo izstopajoče, kot je že enej rekel Andreja Majer, uh, potem imamo uh, Linda Petrič, uh, potem imamo Bishop, uh, Emily Bishop in tako dalje. Precej izstopajoče ženske, ki vodijo tudi, daje veliko inicijativ, na primer za longevity medicine, ta bishopova, bishop, tako da je pač stvar, mislim, to je stvar izbora. Drugič moraš Martin pač malo poiskati, če kake ženske, <laughs> da bojo participirale, ne? Mogoče niso toliko v spredju, ampak to je, to je življenje, to je pol so. To glavno imamo pač moške bolj v spredju, potem ženske pa vzad delajo. No. Hvala. Mal, mal krivično, ja, ok. Ja, se, se upravim čel, ampak skratka. Jaz se, ja. jaz se, Branka, ne morem s tabo strinjati, to ni pri meni, je zadeva razmerje ženske raziskovalke z doktorati proti moškim, štiri proti ena približno, v korist žensk, zdaj ne vem, kako je druge na svetu, ampak je, mi se tru, jaz se očitno trudim v feministično smer. Uh, in, tako je tudi v medicini nesplošno. Ja, hvala. Um, no, um, uh, profesor Ožman, če ker ste vi uh, na zelo sobrašanje. Uh, Uparali ste se tudi tekam svojega študnja s tradicionalno kitajsko medicino. Pa me zanima, uh, če se bi mogoče lahko iz teh uh, uh, nezahodnih medicinskih pogledov, ki več naučimo, na primer, to, da se osredotočimo bolj na, zdrav, na zdravje, ne pa na bolesen. Ja, v moji prejšnji reinkarnaciji sem pa dejansko uh, tudi na kitajskem in japonskem in tako dalje, nekako do leta 1990 in sem tam pač bil v neredkih slovencev, ki ti je šole naredil in tako dalje. No, potem sem se vrnil v Slovenijo, ki pa ni bila naklonjena nobeni noviteti. <laughs> tako kot sedaj ni pritirano naklonjena tudi temu gibanju lođeviti, ampak mislim, da in ima to gibanje močnejše znanstveno turišče, močnejše tudi igralce, tudi vsi prisotni, ste zdraven. Te tradicionalni kitajski medicinski sistemi, ki so popolni, recimo tradicionalna kitajska medicina, pa tudi ajurveda, ki je dosti več pa takih celostnih ni, s uporab smatrajo uh, na splošno zdravje malce drugače kot pri nas. In sicer so mnenja, da ali razlika od naše medicine je predvsem v tem, da zaznajo motnje v uh, zdravju prej kot pri nas. Uh, mi zaznamo motnje v zdravju, ko jih lahko potrdimo z uh, biokemičnimi ali pa drugimi preiskavami, Vsak, kdo pa ve, da vsak bolnik ali pa recimo še posebej starostni, ki gre k splošnjemu zdravniku, navaja vrsto problemov, ki jih ima, pa ne more spati, pa ga boli glava, pa ima te bolečine in une in ne najdejo nobenih nekih kemično-fizikalnih dokazov njegovih bolesti in potem reče zdravnik, ja, morate malo potrpeti, veste, to je starost in tako dalje. No, tisti tradicionalni sistemi priznavajo bolezen, 
da če se je slabo počutiš, če to že bolezen. In imajo ne samo to kot uh, izhodišče, pač pa tudi poznajo načine, kako to um, diagnosticirati in na predlagi tega tudi zdraviti. Oni prej začnejo zdraviti slabo počutje kot našati zahodna medicina. Seveda so pa potem v te akutni medicini mnogo bolj uh, neuspešni, ker je to uh, stara medicina, tako da treba bi bilo seveda naučiti tudi našo, naše zdravnike njihovih teh izhodišč, ampak to je praktično uh, zelo težko zahtevati. Uh, ne moraš današnjih zdravnikov stiliti še v ne vem, petletni študij kitajske medicine, seveda, ki bi, bili, ki bi bili pa zelo koristni, seveda, za nekega bolnika v splošni praksi, ki pride z, z osnovnimi težavami k splošnemu zdravniku. No, ampak to je zdaj že čisto druga tema, In uh, <laughs> mislim, da ne sodi sam ne. Hvala. Zdaj pa bi rekel prvo vprašanje za publiko, tako na Zoomu, kot tudi v dvorani. Tako da kdor ima vprašanje za enega ali pa za vse, ste le povabljeni. Prosim, ja, mikrofon. Vse bom kričal. Rabimo za Zoom. Ja, najprej čestitke, Martin in ekipa. Moje vprašanje je zelo specifično in tako da ga lahko odgovori vsakdo, ki se čuti kompetenten na tem področju. Um, kolega dr. Kuščer je nekje na začetku omenil danes tudi uh, Jamanaka faktorje. Uh, to je bila zelo pomembna objava letos. Um, mislim, da je bil science članek. Uh, miši ne samo, da so uspeli, da so ustavili staranje, ampak so se tudi začeli pomlajevati. Zdaj me zanima, a kdo slučajno ve, kakšna je situacija tu, ker če pride do uspešnega prenosa na više sesavce, bo to kar dokaj revolucija. Ne? In um, mislim, da tudi potem neke debate o dolgoživosti in uh, o holističnih pristopih skoro odpadejo čez če pride do tega dosežka. Mislim, če, če, če se loten tega, uh, se prav pre, prenos definitivno bo, to splohni vprašanje, ne? se miš ni toliko drugačno od človeka, ne? po osnovni biologiji. Bolje vprašanje, kdaj pa kako, ne? Uh, kok, in pa še vedno to ne pomeni, da ti ta drug del, ne, da potem pa ostale, vse ostale stvari pa niso več važne. Ne. Prvič, če, če miš mi futramo z slabo hrano, jo držimo v kroničnem stresu, bo začela umirati od bolezenskih stan, ne glede na to, koliko je stara. Tako da staran je samo po sebi še ne pomin, to je bil prej tukaj le, ta prvi odgovor. Ne? Se prav kaj je osnova? osnova? Osnova je najprej, da je tvoj organizem čim bolj fajn z osnovnimi zgodbami. Ne? Um, prehrana, okolje, stres itd. Ne? Uh, kar se tiče, se pravi, jamanaka je vezan samo na epigenetiko. Ne? Se pravi, jamanaka faktori, to so, to so v bistvu so šterje geni, od katerih je Sinclair uporabil, mislim, da tri plus enega, ne, um, enega selektivno, zaradi tega, ker čim se peti uporab, je do zdaj vedno prišlo v bistvu do raka s tih obolen, ne, ampak v bistvu prihajamo kaj, ne. Za enkrat je še vedno problem sistemskega deliverja je kakšen vektor, ne, uh, se pravi, kako lahko mi v bistvu vnesemo neke genske terapije. Moderna je v zadnjih parih letih pokazala, da je mRNA, ne, se pravi messaging RNA na mest DNA, izjemno zanimiv način dostave informacije v celico. Ne. Se pravi, da zdaj je bil problem, da se DNA so probavali z različnimi citomegolovirusi pa adenovirusi pa tako naprej. Ne. Zdaj moderna je pokazala s covidom, ne, da v bistvu pa mi lahko informacijo kot mRNA vnesemo dosti enostavno. Ne. 
Problem bo se seveda, bo seveda sistemski, ne, kako sistemsko kontrolirano vsad, ki va ravno prav regenerirati, ker če mi gledamo recimo biološko starost izključno na epigenetiki, če mi vzamemo biopsijo tkiva iz mišice, pa jeter, pa kože, pa las, pa tako naprej, pa zmermo epigenetski age, nazoroma starost, bo čist drugačna. Se prav organi tkiva in tako naprej se starajo na različni načine, z različnimi hitrostmi in tako naprej. Tako da ni to enostavno, da bomo zdaj samo špricen uh, ne, messenger RNA je za štirimi amanaka faktori noter, pa bomo vse skupaj naredili wipe clean. Ne? Ampak tehnološko smo pokazali, da je možno. Ne? In ko enkrat tehnološko pokažeš, da je možno, pomeni, da to ni več domena science fiction. Pomeni, da samo še stvar časa. Ne? Ko so prvič pokazali kvantno recimo, da je kvantni računalnik možnje samo stvar časa. Ko so prvič pokazali, kaj lahko je, samo še stvar časa. Ne? Se pravi, da zdaj je bilo to res science fiction. Ne? Zdaj pa vemo, da je možno. Uh, še vedno pa ne, ne pomeni to, da to stvar, v, 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 v stavi staranje. Ne? Tukaj je spet treba paziti malo to, da ni celotno staranje samo epigenetika. Ne? Epigenetika je v bistvu ta loss of information, ko se, jaz to, naredi, jaz to doskrat razložim z analogijo, recimo vzemo, da ne, vsaka celica ima isto kopijo DNA-ja, ne, ki jo je dobila od ne, staršev, se pravi, spermi pa jajčice, sta se združila, sta se malo pomešala in je pač nastala ena, via, ena kombinacija. Ne. In ta kombinacija se potem replicirala po vseh tvojih celicah. Ne. In se prav jetrna celica, možganska celica, kostna celica, vsaka celica ima enak DNA v sebi. Ne? In zdaj, glede na funkcijo celice, se del teh genov konstantno izraža, izraža se prav se izraža, izklapla, vklapla, izklapla, glede na to, da ali dobiva hrano, ali spi, ali se s čim bori, ali se raznožuje. Ne? Istočasno hkrati ima glede na svojo funkcijo, še določene druge gene izraža. A sem jetra, a sem možgani, a sem tisa, a sem ono. Določeni geni so housekeeping itd. No in s tem pisanjem, se prav iz tem vklapanjem, izklapanjem, pa si lahko predstavljamo, kot da je, da je recimo ta genom je kot neke vrste knjiga receptov. Ne? Vsaka celica ima isto knjigo receptov. In zdaj, ko celica piše, briše, piše, briše, si recimo da bookmark na en recept, pa bookmark na drug recept, pa bookmark na tret recept. Pa pa pol, ko skuha recepte, pa bookmarke omakne. Ampak s časom, vsake tog časa, ni čisto procentno učinkovita, da bookmarke omakne, sem pa kaj kakšnega pozabi. Ne? In ustane pol ta metilacija, recimo tam na unem uh, CPG mestu, uh, prlepljena. Ne? In s tem, ko se skozi leta te bookmarki nabirajo, začenja prihajati do zmede. Ne? Ampak to je samo eden izmed elementov procesa staranja. Ne? Tako da izjemen rezultat, absolutno, ne? pokaže, da to ni več science fiction, ne popomeni, da, da v bistvu vsi ostali pristopi do staranja postanejo nepo, nepomembni, uh, in pa hkrati, da v bistvu je to be all end all. Ne? To je samo first step in one of the pillars. Ne? Tudi v bistvu, če poslušaš obri de greja, ali pa če poslušaš, če grejaš recimo tistih 13 od, od Lopez Otin, ali pa kakor je profesor Ozman rekel, lahko jih je 15. Jaz sem tudi rekel v svojem govoru, v bistvu to je samo semantika. To, mislim, to je veliko poenostavljeno, da obstajajo te hallmarks of aging. Ne? Človeška biokemija je bistveno bolj komplicirana. Ampak je fajn zato, da imamo skupen jezik, da se lahko o tem pogovarjamo. Ne? Ker ko rečemo Hallmarks, ja, pa jih je 10 ali pa 12, se ne scenca. Ne? Imamo jezik, s katerim se lahko tudi z vsakdanim človekom, recimo, ne? se pravi, to je bistvo bilo teh, te, tega članka, zakaj je bil toliko pomemben. To super pomembno odkritje, ne? Uh, tudi zelo pomembno, da bo to prišlo v uporabo in bo. Ne? Zdaj je to 20 let ali 30 ali 10, who knows, jaz se tega veselim. Ne? in bom dočakal, sigurno, če me na avtobus zbil, ne. Ampak ni pa to še vse, ne. Hvala. Ja. Uh, ja, še enkrat hvala uh, društvu in celi ekipi društva za to odlično organizacijo, 
Ne, moje vprašanje bi bilo pa uh, iz drugega področja in sicer uh, v življenju uh, delamo odločitve ponovadi uh, bolj nezavedno glede na naše prepričanja. Uh, potem uh, glede na naš značaj. Uh, in tudi vse dosežke v življenju kreirajo predvsem uh, tisto, kar smo se v življenju naučili, kakšne izkušnje smo imeli. Zdaj, če pred, predpostavimo nek scenarij, da živimo uh, lahko 150 let ali pa še dlje, Zdaj, uh, v tem primeru bo uh, tudi naš značaj, pa naša prepričanja, uh, tudi naša podzavest bo ostala pa ista. Uh, potem mogoče tudi uh, nataliteta upada, ne bo toliko mladih ljudi, ne bo toliko nove vzgoje, novega, uh, bi rekel, um, svežega duha. Ostali bomo z, uh, ljudje z istimi prepričani nazori, ali so to politični, ali so to sociološki. No in tukaj so lahko tudi še problemi, ker če vsem ljudem podaljšamo življenje, bomo tudi tistim, ki so, bi rekel, bad guys, ne? nekim uh, sociopatom, s krajnim primeru, ne? ali pa uh, nekim rasistom, nekim poleg tisti, ki so altruisti, humanisti in tako naprej. Ne? Te tukaj se pojavijo pa take problemi, da ni več, uh, bi rekel, uh, uh, kakšne humanistične vzgoje možne, take razen, če se res nekdo preobrazi čisto, ne? kompletno. Ja, z veselem se dotaknem teme, pa ne bom dolg, pa potem predam drugim, ne. Ampak, recimo, to mene doskrat vprašajo, recimo, odkar sem se začel ukvarjati s tem področjem, ne. A nas ne bo pol kar naenkrat preveč, že zdaj nas je preveč, ne. Um, in moj, moj osebni pogled na to je, da ravno obratno, ne. Mi trenutno živimo tako, da najprej prvih 25 let se izobražujemo, potem naslednjih 15-20 let garamo ko zmešani, skrbimo za družino, skrbimo za karjero. Potem imamo pa en kratek čas življenja, ko recimo, da imamo dobro službo plačo, otroco v šolah in mi lahko si kaj prvošmo, ker pol bomo pa itak glih kar v pokoju, pa se mu sedli na kauč, skrbili za vnučke in se umakali iz zgodbe. Ne? Kar pomeni, mi, imamo, mi smo blazno potrošni škad potrošniško usmerjena družba v tistem času. Ne? Ko maš, kupi, kuri, uh, uničuj, ker itak je brez veze, ker itak imaš samo zdaj s svojih 10-20 let, ko lahko, ker pol si pa itak konc. Ne? Zdaj pa, če jaz mislim, pišu ka 150 let, dve, tri karijere, cel uh, ogromen uh, lep življenje še pred mano, postanem jaz mečkem bolj osveščeno svojemu okolju in svojemu footprintu. Ne? Se prav jaz mislim, ker zelo en drug del, ko se veliko pogovarjamo, je seveda sustainability. Ne? Ampak jaz osebno resnično mislim, da če se začenjamo pogovarjati o dolgoživosti posameznika, dolgoživosti družbe, skoraj po defoltu pride v, v zavest tudi dolgoživost planeta oziroma sustainability. To je moje mnenje. Uni outlieri, bad guysi, vedno bojo, ali živijo kratko ali pa dolgo, je čisto vse en. Mislim, večino najhujšega se je zgodi v resnicu v mladih letih, ko imajo ljudje, fant je predvsem preveč testosterona. Ne? Ampak um, to je pa druga debata. No. Hvala. Hvala. Um, še gospod Branka je imela roka dvigljeno, tako da uh, ja, jaz sem imela naprej, ker sem bolj genetik, ne, uh, ampak je enež vse razložil, jaz bi samo rekla, da to reprogramiranje celic, to se pravi spremenba spomina celic, kaj je nej celica dela v življenju, uh, to se zdaj uh, zgleda da obvladat. Uh, lahko spremenimo uh, spomin celice, to se pravi, ga lahko pre, pre, premaknemo naprej ali pa nazaj. Uh, in uh, so neki eksperimentalni dokazi, kdaj pa bomo to lahko uporabili, da bomo na, sa, sebe uh, pomlajevali, to pa mislim, da je to kar ena prihodnost, ker je še veliko, veliko nerešenih vprašanj. Ampak bistveno kaj tukaj je, da epigenetski uh, procesi, ki se tlele uh, obravnavajo, so reverzibilni. To se pravi, 
jih lahko premikamo. In to je spoznanje, ki je zelo pomembno in na tem se potem naprej gradi. Zdaj pa, če grem na tole vprašanje, kar se tiče, da bo nas preveč na planetu, jaz menim, da se je človek vedno znal na nek način spopas s tem, že takrat, ko je Maltus napovedal, da bo pretirana populacija in da bomo propadli zaradi tega, to je bilo pred dve stoleti, se ni zgodilo. To se ni zgodilo, da bi propadli. Zaradi tega, ker je, mislim, da v glavnem tehnologija pripomogla k temu, da smo se rešili propada planeta. In podobno mislim, da bo zdaj v prehodne, da bo znanost in tehnologija prispevala k temu, Če bomo imeli seveda koliko toliko pameti in manj pohlepa, da bomo lahko živeli koliko toliko zdržno. To je ena zadeva. Druga zadeva pa je, ki se kaže, že zdaj je pa ta, da z povišeno pričakovano želensko dobo je tudi značilno v teh družbah, da se manjša rodnost rodnost se krepko manjša in zdaj smo v nekem ravnotežju, to se pravi, imamo nižjo rodnost in pa višjo pričakovano življensko dobo. Tako da družba je, če bi rekli, neki homeostazi. Ok, hvala. Ne bom razvijala misli naprej, ker je že pozno. Hvala lepa. Jaz se dejansko ne bojim tega, da bi zdaj zaradi dolgoživosti, mislim, tudi to mi gre zelo o memoti, ko govorijo pa dolgoživa družba, stari so, nič ne prespevajo. Ravno zanjem sem poslušala po televiziji Singapur, ne, je zdaj postal, mislim, da sedma modra cona. Zaradi tega, ker, mislim, imajo zelo staro populacijo, ampak niso to neaktivni ljudje. Tudi se jim prilagaja, mislim, ker si pač malo bolj okorn, ko se stari, ne moraš ravno skakati, tako kot mladinci, se jim prilagaja, to se pravi, stanovansko okolje, delovno okolje in so zelo aktivno vključeni v mesto, v to družbo singapursko. In si, kot sem rekla, se je ravno proglasili zdaj za sedmo modro tomo. Hvala. Hvala. Mogoče sem glede tega neaktivnost. To v bistvu je že kar nekaj časa presežen koncept, da so starejši neproduktivni, neaktivni, neproduktivni. Oni še kako prispevajo k družbi. Prvič kot recimo neformalni oskrbovalci, to Neformalni oskrbavci, po domače rečeno, držijo gor sistem dolgotrajne oskrbe, ker dolgotrajna oskrba je formalna, ampak to je nekoži del, ogromno tega se podogaja po družinah. Zase gol to. Po drugi strani pa že sploh obstoj starejših pomeni veliko za kohezijo družbe. In če dovoljte dvi minuti, pa pa jaz danes na omoč govoril. Za eno anegdoto iz živalskega sveta. V 80-ih letih se je v Ugandi začelo dogajati, da so se sloni začeli obnašati neobičajno. Napadali so vasi, ubijali so vaščane. Skratka, bila so neka dejanja, ki jih dotedaj te ljudje tam niso poznali, niti strokovnjaki v Ugandi. In so predvsej časa porabili pri razmišljanju, kaj je temu vzrok in kaj narediti. In do pravega vzroka so prišli še leko, so potegnili, povabili tudi strokovnjake iz stojine in so ugotovili kaj. Nekaj let predtem je v Ugandi divjala državljanska vojna, kjer se je strelalo levo-desno in v bistvu v tej državljanski vojni so pobili večino slonov, zgolj mladiče so nekako pustili pri življenju. In ko so te mladiči odrasli, ko so dobili, a tudi sloni dobijo testosteron. No, ok. Ko so dobili, so začeli počenati stvari, ki jih sicer ne bi. In kakšna je bila rešitev v tem primeru? Iz sosednjih držav so uvozili nekaj odraslih samcev in samic, ki so potem nekako vzpostavili to ravnovesje homeostazo v družbi. Zdaj, malo nečije, da se skupaj. 
kontrolirajo. Starejše pač rabimo. Družba, ki bi na enkrat starejših, ne bi bilo recimo COVID, če bi kako drugače se lotil, ne vem, če bi sploh lahko obstajala. Ja, hvala. Se pa še eno vprašanje, gospa Dušica Konavor. Ja, hvala lepa. Smo tudi zelo pozni, no, jaz bi samo na vso to visoko znanost kot ena stara učiteljca, tako, kar ste vzeli rekli, mladih, starih, slonih in vse, da je vsa prihodnost v šoli. To, tako mislim, v misli, da stojim na katedru toliko let, Tukaj pa naša družba res nič ne naredi. Mislim, da je današnja šola samo izobraževalna, nič več vzgojna in da odnos do starih ljudi lahko samo začnemo spet v šoli. Stari gr, ki so recimo na olimpijadah z zmagovalcem upili, naj živi oče tega junaka. Kaj pa danes? Ničesar niso mladi krivi, ničesar otrok ima, kar mu daš in nima, česar mu ne daš. Danes šola ne daje vzgoje, ne tako, ko zdaj omenjamo in humanistične, in socializacije, ne vem, kaj vse to. Če se bo kdaj kaj dalo karkoli, od odspode gor z učitelji izgleda, da jih nišče ne posluša ali nas ne posluša, od odzgore dol, če vse bo kdaj kaj, prihodnost je v šoli. In srečna domovina, ki ima srečno mladino, nač ne gre drugače. Se vproščam, kaj se podeš. Hvala lepa. A lahko še jaz nima? A je še minut, kar zdaj? Ja, še. Še ima posamljeno. Se bom nakratko. Par stvari mi tako šlo po glav, poleg tega, da sem malo fotografiral. Ena stvar, bi rekel tako, ki je bilo dan že rečen, da tole dolgo živost in to, da v družbi ni nekog nima vloge ni sprejede, politika, pač to ne sprejeme in tako naprej. Tako bi rekel, to je dost nova zadeva. V zadnjih, ne vem, mogoče pet let, deset že ne. Tako da je dost nova stvar, da se je začelo o tem govoriti, društvo je bilo ustanovljeno in tako. V bistvu je prva taka konferenca, pa še mednarodna, pa bi rekel, taki top udeleženci, predavatelji, ki jih poznamo po imenih. Tako da se mi zdi dost pomembna ta konferenca tudi za naprej, kar se bo verjetno kasneje videl. Tako da ko se bo to gledal. Druga stvar, me veseli, da je ta strategija pripravljena, tako da bom z veselem prebral. Upam pa, da je strategija, vemo, da je to bolj teoretično, bolj širše in tako naprej, da ima tudi dober akcijski načrt, da so aktivnosti, da je že kje razdelen ali pa še bono, tako da je to tudi zelo dobra zadeva. Tretja stvar, sem pa tako malo mi na pamet prišlo, tole, ko smo poslušali, Pa je bilo več predavateljev, ki so to omenjali, te firme, podjetja, start-upa, pa mi je tako prišlo, zakaj tle ni ali pa se nekog ne povabi, ne pozove. Te farmaceutske firme, zdaj mogoče buta s to razmišljanje, vprašanje, ampak oni imajo kapital ogromen, vpliv ogromen po svetu in vemo, reko, kuk so pomembne, vplivne in tako naprej, reko, kake multinacionalke so, ampak tle ali kot da nimajo zaenkrat interesa, Zdaj, čist drugo področje spet to ni, ker tle gre tudi za razne, ne vem, prehranjevalne te dodatke in tako naprej, ampak v bistvu so to start-upi neki nov področje. Zdaj, mogoče sam to nakratko en tak odgovor še na to. Se pravi, mogoče ima čudno vprašanje, razmišljanje, ampak tako. A ja, zakaj se jih ni? Mislim, mogoče bi jih... Ja, v bistvu jih ni, tle so start-upi, je to nova stvar, nova tehnologija, ampak je pa povezano z medicino, z tudi zdravili, vse kakšne zdravila so, ko jih tudi lahko uporabiš, pa rečeš, da pomaga pri dolgo živosti. Ampak dejansko pa ni, saj jaz ne vem, da bi bili kje bolj vključen. Mislim, najprej sem narobe razumela, zakaj nismo start-upov povabili, ker je tukaj v bistvu svadba, ampak za večje podjetje. In mogoče, da imajo kaj v planu, pa da čakajo na ta prav trenutek, ampak... Mislim, to ni področje, ki je za farmaceutsko industrijo trenutno aktualno. Se tudi, če gledaš, kdo so trenutno financeri svetovno znanih, recimo, imen v start-upih na longevity-ju, 
Финансира и Джеф Безос, и до 3 милиарда финансирата и хрецима фаундари от Гугла, стадала добро милиардова калико. Сам Алтман от OpenAI и Глихър поставил свои лонжевити. Събрал, то са убийство Силикън Вели, милиардери, ки тренутно финансира и оствари ки со Tech of the Future. Заради тези, кър тренутна фармацевтска индустрия, je motivirana strani trenutne regulative, ki rabi bolezenska stanja, ki rabi Alzheimer, Parkinson in podobne zadeve in se potem razvijajo zdravila za to. Pri nas pa sploh ni področje za razvoj zdravil. Se pravi, to, da mi mislimo, da bomo mi farmacevtsko industrijo, to pač pri nas še generična industrija. Tako da krka ne razvija novih zdravil in podobno. Ampak tudi recimo Pfizer, Novartis in podobni v bistvu v longevity trenutno ne vlagajo. Oni bojo potem gledali, kjer je biotech firme bojo razvila zanimive produkte in bojo potem probavali kupvati. Hvala. Zdaj pa zadnjo vprašanje. Zdaj bi se zahvalil ekipi za odlično organizacijo današnje konference. Zdaj mi je bilo všeč, ko ste prej omenil, da se Združni Arabski Emirati želijo postati Longevity Nation, da tekmuje, da bodo prvi na svetu in da bodo sekvenirali genom vseh prebivalcev. Pa me zanima, kakšni so pa njihovi cilji, kaj namerajo oni s tem genomom potem narediti? A že obstaja nekaj smernice, katera zdravila prepisati nekomu, ki ima tak in tak genom? Kaj lahko s temi informacijami narediš? Jaz se zato se zdaj z njimi pogovarjamo. Ne mislim, da je dejansko na temu, veliko se na temu dela, ni pa še zelo zdefinirano področje. Se pravi, oni so rekli, pač vrži v vodo in plavaj. Vejo, da osnova je vsak njihov prebivalec, vsak človek ima svoj unikaten genom. Se pravi, oni so rekli, nač, če ne druzga, dajmo zdaj lahko posekvencirati vse genome in začeti videti, kaj se iz tega lahko naučimo in hkrati začeti delati na temu, kako lahko precision medicine začenjamo uporabljati v našem ekosistemu. Velik vemo, tako da ni čist trivialno. Farmakogenomika je recimo že zelo uvelavljena veja medicine, kjer vemo, da recimo določeni statini so lahko izjemno nevarni za določen genotip, se pravi lahko v nekaj letih vodijo v resne srčne težave, kardiomiopatijo in tako naprej, medtem, ker recimo drugi tipi statinov so za to isto genetiko precej neškodljivi in po vsej verjetnosti učinkoviti, tako da samo kot en primer. Velik je znanje na področju tega, katere recimo, pre še posebej te velike, velika zdravila, ki so toliko splošne uporabi, da je bilo ogromno že naprej odkritega, da pri nekaterih subpopulacijah dost dobro delujejo, pri nekaterih so pa lahko celo škodljiva. Temu rečemo podomač farmakogenomika. Zdaj se prihaja v vedno večje osveščenje potem vpliv mikrobioma. Se pravi, kako črevesne bakterije lahko posamezne zdravila, posamezne molekule razgradijo ali pa spremenijo in s tem lahko spremenijo v bistvu funkcijo oziroma lastno zdravila. Določene zdravila lahko postanejo neučinkovita, ker jih razgradijo, določena pa celo toksična. Se pravi, v bistvu vedno bolj se zavedamo tega, da s poznavanjem mikrobioma in genoma bomo lahko še bolj precizno rekli, aha, za tega posameznika bo to zdravilo po vsej verjetnosti najbolj učinkovito z najmanj stranskih učinkov. Na tem področju je medicina veliko že naredila, ne pa še stoprocentno. Recimo pač tudi, recimo nu na temu dost veliko razvija, oziroma pač delamo, to je pač nekak področje, ki zdaj prihaja z, temu se reče precision medicine, oziroma personalized medicine. To je zdaj pač the next big thing. In to inevitably, se pravi, tako kot se delamo, neizbežno, prihaja. Zdaj pa, koliko bo pa seveda tudi podpora potem strani vlad in to ne cilja niti na eno posamezno, ampak to bo verjetno bolj paneuropska potem, ker za enkrat je pa spet kom, če smo zelo direktni, je problem trenutno, da personaliziranost je super ideja in absolutno se bo zgodila, 
je pa problem, kako to pravilo implementirati, ker treba pa vse en je pazat, da je pa potem nekak enako tretiran v slihrni prebivalec in da ne prahaja do diskriminacij in tako naprej. Se pravi, zaenkrat, če vedno regulativa reče, če se razvija zdravilo za neko bolezen, mora to zdravilo nekako veljati oziroma biti ok za vse etničnosti, spole in tako naprej. Zdaj, male, recimo, lukne v temu že obstajajo, se pravi, določene stvari so bolj očekovite za moške kot za ženske itd. itd. in potem se lahko dovolijo določene uporabe, ampak to se počas tudi na vladnem ali političnem nivoju skušal ugotavljati, kaj je prav. In gre v pravo smer, ampak ta del gre še počasneje. Se pravi, znanost gre malo hitreje, kaj deluje, pa kaj ne. Politika pa tudi skuša najdeti prav način. Je pa problem, ker imamo v Evropi sploh tok različnih potem nacij, pogledov, mišljenj itd., da bo traja še nekaj časa. Hvala. Hvala lepa. Jaz bi počas zaključil, koliko glavno so. Imamo še eno dvigneno roko na Zoom, a je slučajno čas za še eno vprašanje. No, na hiter. Evo, Krištof. Ja, lepo zdrav. Lepo zdrav z Toronto in za univerze v Toronto. Moram čistiti od organizatorjem za tole konferenco. Nažalost sem večino zamudil, ker sem mislil, da jih napisam v našem času, da je to v domačko. Prej sem hotel sam dodati, zakaj tudi velike firme ne polagajo v to, ker pač velike firme je to riskantno posel, tako kot so redke bolezi. Dogre je samo v navezi ali z tem, kot so orphan drugs, ali pa pač vse velike firme, tako kot smo v primeru Avexisa videli, na Varti se pač kupo tehnologijo gensko terapijo, nekega malega startupa in pač večino tega researcha se dela v akademskih klebih in pač ne vidim, da bi se to tudi za neko sprostitvijo nekih regulacij, da bi se dojemal, da je pač staro se ne dojema kot bolezen in da bi se na tem področju, ki jih malo kje tazga spremejili, mislim, da ne. Ampak ja, čestitke za organizacijo, mogoče ne je bilo slabo razmislil, da bi bil ta dogodek mogoče v angliščini v prihodnje, da bi mogoče dobil malo večji publicitet. Hvala lepa. Ok, tako da se govorci strinjamo. Ja, ja, hvala lepa vsem. No in s tem smo zaključili današnjo konferenco. Hvala vsem v živo in hvala vsem na zumo. Lep večer.